section twenty one of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the puritan age sixteen twenty sixteen sixty part one historical summary the puritan movement in its broadest sense the puritan movement may be regarded as a second and greater renaissance a rebirth of the moral nature of man following the intellectual awakening of europe in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries in italy whose influence had been uppermost in elizabethan literature the renaissance had been essentially pagan and sensuous it had hardly touched the moral nature of man and it brought little relief from the despotism of rulers one can hardly read the horrible records of the medici or the borgias or the political observations of machiavelli without marvelling at the moral and political degradation of a cultured nation in the north especially among the german and english peoples the renaissance was accompanied by a moral awakening and it is precisely that awakening in england that greatest moral and political reform which ever swept over a nation in the short space of half a century which is meant by the puritan movement we shall understand it better if we remember that it had two chief objects the first was personal righteousness the second was civil and religious liberty in other words it aimed to make men honest and to make them free wrong ideas of the puritans such a movement should be cleared of all the misconceptions which have clung to it since the restoration when the very name of puritan was made ridiculous by the jeers of the gay courtiers of charles the second though the spirit of the movement was profoundly religious the puritans were not a religious sect neither was the puritan a narrow-minded and gloomy dogmatist as he is still pictured even in the histories pym and hamden and eliot and milton were puritans and in the long struggle for human liberty there are few names more honored by freemen everywhere cromwell and thomas hooker were puritans yet cromwell stood like a rock for religious tolerance and thomas hooker in connecticut gave to the world the first written constitution in which free men before electing their officers laid down the strict limits of the offices to which they were elected that is a puritan document and it marks one of the greatest achievements in the history of government from a religious viewpoint puritanism included all shades of belief the name was first given to those who advocated certain changes in the form of worship of the reformed english church under elizabeth but as the ideal of liberty rose in men's minds and opposed to it were the king and his evil counsellors and the band of intolerant churchmen of whom laud is the great example then puritanism became a great national movement it included english churchmen as well as extreme separatists calvinists covenanters catholic noblemen all bound together in resistance to despotism in church and state and with a passion for liberty and righteousness such as the world has never since seen naturally such a movement had its extremes and excesses and it is from a few zealots and fanatics that most of our misconceptions about the puritans arise life was stern in those days too stern perhaps and the intensity of the struggle against despotism made men narrow and hard in the triumph of puritanism under cromwell severe laws were passed many simple pleasures were forbidden and an austere standard of living was forced upon an unwilling people so the criticism is made that the wild outbreak of immorality which followed the restoration of charles was partly due to the unnatural restrictions of the puritan era the criticism is just but we must not forget the whole spirit of the movement 
that the puritan prohibited maypole dancing and horse racing is of small consequence beside the fact that he fought for liberty and justice that he overthrew despotism and made a man's life and property safe from the tyranny of rulers a great river is not judged by the foam on its surface and certain austere laws and doctrines which we have ridiculed are but froth on the surface of the mighty puritan current that has flowed steadily like a river of life through english and american history since the age of elizabeth changing ideals the political upheaval of the period is summed up in the terrible struggle between the king and parliament which resulted in the death of charles at the block and the establishment of the commonwealth under cromwell for centuries the english people had been wonderfully loyal to their sovereigns but deeper than their loyalty to kings was the old saxon love for personal liberty at times as in the days of alfred and elizabeth the two ideals went hand in hand but more often they were in open strife and a final struggle for supremacy was inevitable the crisis came when james i who had received the right of royalty from an act of parliament began by the assumption of divine right to ignore the parliament which had created him of the civil war which followed in the reign of charles i and of the triumph of english freedom it is unnecessary to write here the blasphemy of a man's divine right to rule his fellow-men was ended modern england began with the charge of cromwell's brigade of puritans at naseby religious ideals religiously the age was one of even greater ferment than that which marked the beginning of the reformation a great ideal the ideal of a national church was pounding to pieces like a ship in the breakers and in the confusion of such an hour the action of the various sects was like that of frantic passengers each striving to save his possessions from the wreck the catholic church as its name implies has always held true to the ideal of a united church a church which like the great roman government of the early centuries can bring the splendor and authority of rome to bear upon the humblest village church to the farthest ends of the earth for a time that mighty ideal dazzled the german and english reformers but the possibility of a united protestant church perished with elizabeth then instead of the world-wide church which was the ideal of catholicism came the ideal of a purely national protestantism this was the ideal of laud and the reactionary bishops no less than of the scholarly richard hooker of the rugged scotch covenanters and of the puritans of massachusetts bay it is intensely interesting to note that charles called irish rebels and scotch highlanders to his aid by promising to restore their national religions and that the english puritans turning to scotland for help entered into the solemn covenant of sixteen forty three establishing a national presbyterianism whose object was to bring the churches of god in the three kingdoms to uniformity in religion and government to preserve the rights of parliament and the liberties of the kingdom that we and our posterity may as brethren live in faith and love and the lord may delight to live in the midst of us in this famous covenant we see the national the ecclesiastical and the personal dream of puritanism side by side in all their grandeur and simplicity years passed years of bitter struggle and heartache before the impossibility of uniting the various protestant sects was generally recognized the ideal of a national church died hard and to its death is due all the religious unrest of the period only as we remember the national ideal 
and the struggle which it caused can we understand the amazing life and work of bunyan or appreciate the heroic spirit of the american colonists who left home for a wilderness in order to give the new ideal of a free church in a free state its practical demonstration literary characteristics in literature also the puritan age was one of confusion due to the breaking up of old ideals medieval standards of chivalry the impossible loves and romances of which spencer furnished the types perished no less surely than the ideal of a national church and in the absence of any fixed standard of literary criticism there was nothing to prevent the exaggeration of the metaphysical poets who are the literary parallels to religious sects like the anabaptists poetry took new and startling forms in dunn and herbert and prose became as sombre as burton's anatomy of melancholy the spiritual gloom which sooner or later fastens upon all writers of this age and which is unjustly attributed to puritan influence is due to the breaking up of accepted standards in government and religion no people from the greeks to those of our own day have suffered the loss of old ideals without causing its writers to cry ichabod the glory has departed that is the unconscious tendency of literary men in all times who look backward for their golden age and it need not concern the student of literature who even in the break-up of cherished institutions looks for some foregleams of a better light which is to break upon the world this so-called gloomy age produced some minor poems of exquisite workmanship and one great master of verse whose work would glorify any age or people john milton in whom the indomitable puritan spirit finds its noblest expression puritan and elizabethan literature there are three main characteristics in which puritan literature differs from that of the preceding age one elizabethan literature with all its diversity had a marked unity in spirit resulting from the patriotism of all classes and their devotion to a queen who with all her faults sought first the nation's welfare under the stuarts all this was changed the kings were the open enemies of the people the country was divided by the struggle for political and religious liberty and the literature was as divided in spirit as were the struggling parties two elizabethan literature is generally inspiring it throbs with youth and hope and vitality that which follows speaks of age and sadness even its brightest hours are followed by gloom and by the pessimism inseparable from the passing of old standards three elizabethan literature is intensely romantic the romance springs from the heart of youth and believes all things even the impossible the great schoolman's credo i believe because it is impossible is a better expression of elizabethan literature than of medieval theology in the literature of the puritan period one looks in vain for romantic ardor even in the lyrics and love poems a critical intellectual spirit takes its place and whatever romance asserts itself is in form rather than in feeling a fantastic and artificial adornment of speech rather than the natural utterance of a heart in which sentiment is so strong and true that poetry is its only expression part two literature of the puritan period the transition poets when one attempts to classify the literature of the first half of the seventeenth century from the death of elizabeth sixteen o three to the restoration sixteen sixty he realizes the impossibility of grouping poets by any accurate standard the classifications attempted here have small dependence upon dates or sovereigns and are suggestive rather than accurate 
thus shakespeare and bacon wrote largely in the reign of james the first but their work is elizabethan in spirit and bunyan is no less a puritan because he happened to write after the restoration the name metaphysical poets given by dr johnson is somewhat suggestive but not descriptive of the followers of donne the name caroline or cavalier poets brings to mind the careless temper of the royalists who followed king charles with a devotion of which he was unworthy and the name spenserian poets recalls the little band of dreamers who clung to spenser's ideal even while his romantic medieval castle was battered down by science at the one gate and puritanism at the other at the beginning of this bewildering confusion of ideals expressed in literature we note a few writers who are generally known as jacobean poets but whom we have called the transition poets because with the later dramatists they show clearly the changing standards of the age samuel daniel fifteen sixty two sixteen nineteen daniel who is often classed with the first metaphysical poets is interesting to us for two reasons for his use of the artificial sonnet and for his literary desertion of spenser as a model for poets his delia a cycle of sonnets modeled perhaps after sidney's astrophel and stella helped to fix the custom of celebrating love or friendship by a series of sonnets to which some pastoral pseudonym was affixed in his sonnets many of which rank with shakespeare's and in his later poetry especially the beautiful complaint of rosamond and his civil wars he aimed solely at grace of expression and became influential in giving to english poetry a greater individuality and independence than it had ever known in matter he set himself squarely against the medieval tendency let others sing of kings and paladins in aged accents and untimely words paint shadows in imaginary lines this fling at spencer and his followers marks the beginning of the modern and realistic school which sees in life as it is enough poetic material without the invention of allegories and impossible heroines daniel's poetry which was forgotten soon after his death has received probably more homage than it deserves in the praises of wordsworth southey lamb and coleridge the latter says read daniel the admirable daniel the style and language are just as any pure and manly writer of the present day would use it seems quite modern in comparison with the style of shakespeare the songwriters in strong contrast with the above are two distinct groups the songwriters and the spenserian poets the close of the reign of elizabeth was marked by an outburst of english songs as remarkable in its sudden development as the rise of the drama two causes contributed to this result the increasing influence of french instead of italian verse and the rapid development of music as an art at the close of the sixteenth century the two songwriters best worth studying are thomas campion fifteen sixty seven question mark sixteen nineteen and nicholas breton fifteen forty five question mark sixteen twenty six question mark like all the lyric poets of the age they are a curious mixture of the elizabethan and the puritan standards they sing of sacred and profane love with the same zest and a careless love song is often found on the same page with a plea for divine grace the spenserian poets of the spenserian poets giles fletcher and wither are best worth studying giles fletcher fifteen eighty eight question mark sixteen twenty three 
has at times a strong suggestion of milton who was also a follower of spenser in his early years in the noble simplicity and majesty of his lines his best known work christ's victory and triumph sixteen ten was the greatest religious poem that had appeared in england since piers plowman and is not an unworthy predecessor of paradise lost the life of george wither fifteen eighty eight sixteen sixty seven covers the whole period of english history from elizabeth to the restoration and the enormous volume of his work covers every phase of the literature of two great ages his life was a varied one now as a royalist leader against the covenanters and again announcing his puritan convictions and suffering in prison for his faith at his best wither is a lyric poet of great originality rising at times to positive genius but the bulk of his poetry is intolerably dull students of this period find him interesting as an epitome of the whole age in which he lived but the average reader is more inclined to note with interest that he published in sixteen twenty three hymns and songs of the church the first hymn book that ever appeared in the english language the metaphysical poets this name which was given by dr johnson in derision because of the fantastic form of dunn's poetry is often applied to all minor poets of the puritan age we use the term here in a narrower sense excluding the followers of daniel and that later group known as the cavalier poets it includes dunn herbert waller denham cowley vaughan davenant marvel and crashaw the advanced student finds them all worthy of study not only for their occasional excellent poetry but because of their influence on later literature thus richard crashaw sixteen thirteen question mark sixteen forty nine the catholic mystic is interesting because his troubled life is singularly like dunn's and his poetry is at time like herbert's set on fire Note, see for instance the hymn to saint teresa and the flaming heart abraham cowley sixteen eighteen sixteen sixty seven who blossomed young and who at twenty-five was proclaimed the greatest poet in england is now scarcely known even by name but his pindaric odes note so called from pindar the greatest lyric poet of greece end of note set an example which influenced english poetry throughout the eighteenth century henry vaughan sixteen twenty two sixteen ninety five is worthy of study because he is in some respects the forerunner of wordsworth note see for instance childhood the retreat corruption the bird the hidden flower for vaughan's mystic interpretation of childhood and nature End of note. and andrew marvel sixteen twenty one sixteen seventy eight because of his loyal friendship with milton and because his poetry shows the conflict between the two schools of spencer and dunn edmund waller sixteen o six sixteen eighty seven stands between the puritan age and the restoration he was the first to use consistently the closed couplet which dominated our poetry for the next century by this and especially by his influence over dryden the greatest figure of the restoration he occupies a larger place in our literature than a reading of his rather tiresome poetry would seem to warrant of all these poets each of whom has his special claim we can consider here only dunn and herbert who in different ways are the types of revolt against earlier forms and standards of poetry in feeling and imagery both are poets of a high order but in style and expression they are the leaders of the fantastic school whose influence largely dominated poetry during the half century of the puritan period john dunn fifteen seventy three sixteen thirty one life 
the briefest outline of donne's life shows its intense human interest he was born in london the son of a rich iron merchant at the time when the merchants of england were creating a new and higher kind of princes on his father's side he came from an old welsh family and on his mother's side from the haywoods and sir thomas more's family both families were catholic and in his early life persecution was brought near for his brother died in prison for harboring a proscribed priest and his own education could not be continued in oxford and cambridge because of his religion such an experience generally sets a man's religious standards for life but presently donne as he studied law at lincoln's inn was investigating the philosophic grounds of all faith gradually he left the church in which he was born renounced all denominations and called himself simply christian meanwhile he wrote poetry and shared his wealth with the needy catholic relatives he joined the expedition of essex for cadiz in fifteen ninety six and for the azores in fifteen ninety seven and on sea and in camp found time to write poetry two of his best poems the storm and the calm belong to this period next he traveled in europe for three years but occupied himself with study and poetry returning home he became secretary to lord egerton fell in love with the latter's young niece anne moore and married her for which cause donne was cast into prison strangely enough his poetical work at this time is not a song of youthful romance but the progress of the soul a study of transmigration years of wandering and poverty followed until sir george moore forgave the young lovers and made an allowance to his daughter instead of enjoying his new comforts donne grew more ascetic and intellectual in his tastes he refused also the nattering offer of entering the church of england and receiving a comfortable living by his pseudo martyr he attracted the favor of james I who persuaded him to be ordained yet left him without any place or employment when his wife died her allowance ceased and donne was left with seven children in extreme poverty then he became a preacher rose rapidly by sheer intellectual force and genius and in four years was the greatest of english preachers and dean of st paul's cathedral in london there he carried some to heaven in holy raptures and led others to amend their lives and as he leans over the pulpit with intense earnestness is likened by isaac walton to an angel leaning from a cloud here is variety enough to epitomize his age and yet in all his life stronger than any impression of outward weal or woe is the sense of mystery that surrounds donne in all his work one finds a mystery a hiding of some deep thing which the world would gladly know and share and which is suggested in his haunting little poem the undertaking i have done one braver thing than all the worthies did and yet a braver thence doth spring which is to keep that hid donne's poetry donne's poetry is so uneven at times so startling and fantastic that few critics would care to recommend it to others only a few will read his works and they must be left to their own browsing to find what pleases them like deer which in the midst of plenty take a bite here and there and wander on tasting twenty varieties of food in an hour's feeding one who reads much will probably bewail donne's lack of any consistent style or literary standard for instance chaucer and milton are as different as two poets could well be yet the work of each is marked by a distinct and consistent style and it is the style as much as the matter which makes the tales or the paradise lost 
a work for all time done through style and all literary standards to the winds and precisely for this reason he is forgotten though his great intellect and his genius had marked him as one of those who should do things worthy to be remembered while the tendency of literature is to exalt style at the expense of thought the world has many men and women who exalt feeling and thought above expression and to these donne is good reading browning is of the same school and compels attention while donne played havoc with elizabethan style he nevertheless influenced our literature in the way of boldness and originality and the present tendency is to give him a larger place nearer to the few great poets than he has occupied since ben jonson declared that he was the first poet of the world in some things but likely to perish for not being understood for to much of his poetry we must apply his own satiric verses on another's crudities infinite work which doth so far extend that none can study it to any end george herbert fifteen ninety three sixteen thirty three o day most calm most bright sang george herbert and we may safely take that single line as expressive of the whole spirit of his writings professor palmer whose scholarly edition of this poet's works is a model for critics and editors calls herbert the first in english poetry who spoke face to face with god that may be true but it is interesting to note that not a poet of the first half of the seventeenth century not even the gayest of the cavaliers but has written some noble verse of prayer or aspiration which expresses the underlying puritan spirit of his age herbert is the greatest the most consistent of them all in all the others the puritan struggles against the cavalier or the cavalier breaks loose from the restraining puritan but in herbert the struggle is past and peace has come that his life was not all calm that the puritan in him had struggled desperately before it subdued the pride and idleness of the cavalier is evident to one who reads between his lines i struck the board and cried no more i will abroad what shall i ever sigh and pine my lines and life are free free as the road loose as the wind there speaks the cavalier of the university and the court and as one reads to the end of the little poem which he calls by the suggestive name of the collar he may know that he is reading condensed biography those who seek for faults for strained imagery and fantastic verse forms in herbert's poetry will find them in abundance but it will better repay the reader to look for the deep thought and fine feeling that are hidden in these wonderful religious lyrics even in those that appear most artificial the fact that herbert's reputation was greater at times than milton's and that his poems when published after his death had a large sale and influence shows certainly that he appealed to the men of his age and his poems will probably be read and appreciated if only by the few just so long as men are strong enough to understand the puritan's spiritual convictions life herbert's life is so quiet and uneventful that to relate a few biographical facts can be of little advantage only as one reads the whole story by isaac walton can he share the gentle spirit of herbert's poetry he was born at montgomery castle Note, there is some doubt as to whether he was born at the castle or at black hall recent opinion inclines to the latter view End of note wales fifteen ninety three of a noble welsh family his university course was brilliant and after graduation he waited long years in the vain hope of preferment at court all his life he had to battle against disease and this is undoubtedly the cause of the long delay before each new step in his course 
not till he was thirty-seven was he ordained and placed over the little church of bemerton how he lived here among plain people in this happy corner of the lord's field hoping all things and blessing all people asking his own way to zion and showing others the way should be read in walton it is a brief life less than three years of work before being cut off by consumption but remarkable for the single great purpose and the glorious spiritual strength that shine through physical weakness just before his death he gave some manuscripts to a friend and his message is worthy of john bunyan deliver this little book to my dear brother ferrar and tell him he shall find in it a picture of the many spiritual conflicts that have passed betwixt god and my soul before i could subject mine to the will of jesus my master in whose service i have now found perfect freedom desire him to read it and then if he can think it may turn to the advantage of any dejected poor soul let it be made public if not let him burn it for i and it are less than the least of god's mercies herbert's poems herbert's chief work the temple consists of over one hundred and fifty short poems suggested by the church her holidays and ceremonials and the experiences of the christian life the first poem the church porch is the longest and though polished with a care that foreshadows the classic school the least poetical it is a wonderful collection of condensed sermons wise precepts and moral lessons suggesting chaucer's good counsel pope's essay on man and polonius's advice to laertes in hamlet only it is more packed with thought than any of these of truth speaking he says dare to be true nothing can need a lie a fault which needs it most grows too thereby and of calmness in argument calmness is great advantage he that lets another chafe may warm him at his fire among the remaining poems of the temple one of the most suggestive is the pilgrimage here in six short stanzas every line close packed with thought we have the whole of bunyan's pilgrim's progress the poem was written probably before bunyan was born but remembering the wide influence of herbert's poetry it is an interesting question whether bunyan received the idea of his immortal work from this pilgrimage probably the best known of all his poems is the one called the pulley which generally appears however under the name rest or the gifts of god when god at first made man having a glass of blessings standing by let us said he pour on him all we can let the world's riches which dispersed lie contract into a span so strength first made a way then beauty flowed then wisdom honor pleasure when almost all was out god made a stay perceiving that alone of all his treasure rest in the bottom lay for if i should said he bestow this jewel also on my creature he would adore my gifts instead of me and rest in nature not the god of nature so both should losers be yet let him keep the rest but keep them with repining restlessness let him be rich and weary that at least if goodness lead him not yet weariness may toss him to my breast among the poems which may be read as curiosities of versification and which arouse the wrath of the critics against the whole metaphysical school are those like easter wings and the altar which suggest in the printed form of the poem the thing of which the poet sings more ingenious is the poem in which rhyme is made by cutting off the first letter of a preceding word as in the five stanzas of paradise i bless thee lord because i grow among thy trees which in a row to thee both fruit and order owe 
and more ingenious still are odd conceits like the poem heaven in which echo by repeating the last syllable of each line gives an answer to the poet's questions the cavalier poets in the literature of any age there are generally found two distinct tendencies the first expresses the dominant spirit of the times the second a secret or an open rebellion so in this age side by side with the serious and rational puritan lives the gallant and trivial cavalier the puritan finds expression in the best poetry of the period from donne to milton and in the prose of baxter and bunyan the cavalier in a small group of poets herrick lovelace suckling and carew who writes songs generally in lighter vein gay trivial often licentious but who cannot altogether escape the tremendous seriousness of puritanism thomas carew fifteen ninety eight question mark sixteen thirty nine question mark carew may be called the inventor of cavalier love poetry and to him more than any other is due the peculiar combination of the sensual and the religious which marked most of the minor poets of the seventeenth century his poetry is the spenserian pastoral stripped of its refinement of feeling and made direct coarse vigorous his poems published in sixteen forty are generally like his life trivial or sensual but here and there is found one like the following which indicates that with the metaphysical and cavalier poets a new and stimulating force had entered english literature ask me no more where jove bestows when june is past the fading rose for in your beauty's orient deep these flowers as in their causes sleep ask me no more where those stars light that downwards fall in dead of night for in your eyes they sit and there fixed become as in their sphere ask me no more if east or west the phoenix builds her spicy nest for unto you at last she flies and in your fragrant bosom dies robert herrick fifteen ninety one sixteen seventy four herrick is the true cavalier gay devil-may-care in disposition but by some freak of fate a clergyman of dean prior in south devon a country made famous by him and blackmore here in a country parish he lived discontentedly longing for the joys of london and the mermaid tavern his bachelor establishment consisting of an old housekeeper a cat a dog a goose a tame lamb one hen for which he thanked god in poetry because she laid an egg every day and a pet pig that drank beer with herrick out of a tankard with admirable good nature herrick made the best of these uncongenial surroundings he watched with sympathy the country life about him and caught its spirit in many lyrics a few of which like corinna's maying gather ye rosebuds while ye may and to daffodils are among the best known in our language his poems cover a wide range from trivial love songs pagan in spirit to hymns of deep religious feeling only the best of his poems should be read and these are remarkable for their exquisite sentiment and their graceful melodious expression the rest since they reflect something of the coarseness of his audience may be passed over in silence late in life herrick published his one book hesperides and noble numbers sixteen forty eight the latter half contains his religious poems and one has only to read there the remarkable litany to see how the religious terror that finds expression in bunyan's grace abounding could master even the most careless of cavalier singers suckling and loveless sir john suckling sixteen o nine sixteen forty two was one of the most brilliant wits of the court of charles the first 
who wrote poetry as he exercised a horse or fought a duel because it was considered a gentleman's accomplishment in those days his poems struck from his wild life like sparks from his rapier are utterly trivial and even in his best-known ballad upon a wedding rarely rise above mere doggerel it is only the romance of his life his rich brilliant careless youth and his poverty and suicide in paris whither he fled because of his devotion to the stuarts that keeps his name alive in our literature in his life and poetry sir richard lovelace sixteen eighteen sixteen fifty eight offers a remarkable parallel to suckling and the two are often classed together as perfect representatives of the followers of king charles lovelace's lucasta a volume of love lyrics is generally on a higher plane than suckling's work and a few of the poems like to lucasta and to althea from prison deserve the secure place they have won in the latter occur the oft-quoted lines stone walls do not a prison make nor iron bars a cage minds innocent and quiet take that for an hermitage if i have freedom in my love and in my soul am free angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty end of section twenty one section twenty two of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven continued john milton sixteen o eight sixteen seventy four thy soul was like a star and dwelt apart thou hadst a voice whose sound was like the sea pure as the naked heavens majestic free so didst thou travel on life's common way in cheerful godliness and yet thy heart the lowliest duties on herself did lay from wordsworth's sonnet on milton shakespeare and milton are the two figures that tower conspicuously above the goodly fellowship of men who have made our literature famous each is a representation of the age that produced him and together they form a suggestive commentary upon the two forces that rule our humanity the forces of impulse and the force of a fixed purpose shakespeare is the poet of impulse of the loves hates fears jealousies and ambitions that swayed men of his age milton is the poet of steadfast will and purpose who moves like a god amid the fears and hopes and changing impulses of the world regarding them as trivial and momentary things that can never swerve a great soul from its course it is well to have some such comparison in mind while studying the literature of the elizabethan and the puritan age while shakespeare and ben jonson and their unequal company of wits make merry at the mermaid tavern there is already growing up on the same london street a poet who shall bring a new force into literature who shall add to the renaissance culture and love of beauty the tremendous moral earnestness of the puritan such a poet must begin as the puritan always began with his own soul to discipline and enlighten it before expressing its beauty in literature he that would hope to write well hereafter in laudable things says milton ought himself to be a true poem that is a composition and pattern of the best and most honorable things here is a new proposition in art which suggests the lofty ideal of fra angelico that before one can write literature which is the expression of the ideal he must first develop in himself the ideal man because milton is human he must know the best in humanity therefore he studies giving his days to music art and literature his nights to profound research and meditation 
but because he knows that man is more than mortal he also prays depending as he tells us on devout prayer to that eternal spirit who can enrich with all utterance and knowledge such a poet is already in spirit far beyond the renaissance though he lives in the autumn of its glory and associates with its literary masters there is a spirit in man says the old hebrew poet and the inspiration of the almighty giveth him understanding here in a word is the secret of milton's life and writing hence his long silences years passing without a word and when he speaks it is like the voice of a prophet who begins with the sublime announcement the spirit of the lord is upon me hence his style producing an impression of sublimity which has been marked for wonder by every historian of our literature his style was unconsciously sublime because he lived and thought consciously in a sublime atmosphere life of milton milton is like an ideal in the soul like a lofty mountain on the horizon we never attain the ideal we never climb the mountain but life would be inexpressibly poorer were either to be taken away from childhood milton's parents set him apart for the attainment of noble ends and so left nothing to chance in the matter of training his father john milton is said to have turned puritan while a student at oxford and to have been disinherited by his family whereupon he settled in london and prospered greatly as a scrivener that is a kind of notary in character the elder milton was a rare combination of scholar and business man a radical puritan in politics and religion yet a musician whose hymn tunes are still sung and a lover of art and literature the poet's mother was a woman of refinement and social grace with a deep interest in religion and in local charities so the boy grew up in a home which combined the culture of the renaissance with the piety and moral strength of early puritanism he begins therefore as the heir of one great age and the prophet of another apparently the elder milton shared bacon's dislike for the educational methods of the time and so took charge of his son's training encouraging his natural tastes teaching him music and seeking out a tutor who helped the boy to what he sought most eagerly not the grammar and mechanism of greek and latin but rather the stories the ideals the poetry that hide in their incomparable literatures at twelve years we find the boy already a scholar in spirit unable to rest till after midnight because of the joy with which his study was rewarded from boyhood two great principles seem to govern milton's career one the love of beauty of music art literature and indeed of every form of human culture the other a steadfast devotion to duty as the highest object in human life a brief course at the famous st paul's school in london was the prelude to milton's entrance to christ's college cambridge here again he followed his natural bent and like bacon found himself often in opposition to the authorities aside from some latin poems the most noteworthy song of this period of milton's life is his splendid ode on the morning of christ's nativity which was begun on christmas day sixteen twenty nine milton while deep in the classics had yet a greater love for his native literature spencer was for years his master in his verse we find every evidence of his loving study of shakespeare and his last great poems show clearly how he had been influenced by fletcher's christ's victory and triumph but it is significant that this first ode rises higher than anything of the kind produced in the famous age of elizabeth while at cambridge it was the desire of his parents that milton should take orders in the church of england but the intense love of mental liberty which stamped the puritan was too strong within him and he refused to consider the oath of servitude as he called it which would mark his ordination throughout his life milton though profoundly religious held aloof from the strife of sects 
in belief he belonged to the extreme puritans called separatists independents congregationalists of which our pilgrim fathers are the great examples but he refused to be bound by any creed or church discipline as ever in my great taskmaster's eye in this last line of one of his sonnets note on his being arrived to the age of twenty-three end of note is found milton's rejection of every form of outward religious authority in face of the supreme puritan principle the liberty of the individual soul before god a long period of retirement followed milton's withdrawal from the university in sixteen thirty two at his father's country home in horton he gave himself up for six years to solitary reading and study roaming over the wide fields of greek latin hebrew spanish french italian and english literatures and studying hard at mathematics science theology and music a curious combination to his love of music we owe the melody of all his poetry and we note it in the rhythm and balance which makes even his mighty prose arguments harmonious in lycidas l'allegro il penseroso arcades comus and a few sonnets we have the poetic results of this retirement at horton few indeed but the most perfect of their kind that our literature has recorded out of solitude where his talent was perfected milton entered the busy world where his character was to be proved to the utmost from horton he traveled abroad through france switzerland and italy everywhere received with admiration for his learning and courtesy winning the friendship of the exiled dutch scholar grotius in paris and of galileo in his sad imprisonment in florence note it is remarkable says lamartine how often in the libraries of italian princes and in the correspondence of great italian writers of this period you find mention of the name and fame of this young englishman End of note he was on his way to greece when news reached him of the break between king and parliament with the practical insight which never deserted him milton saw clearly the meaning of the news his cordial reception in italy so chary of praise to anything not italian had reawakened in milton the old desire to write an epic which england would not willingly let die but at thought of the conflict for human freedom all his dreams were flung to the winds he gave up his travels and literary ambitions and hurried to england for i thought it base he says to be travelling at my ease for intellectual culture while my fellow-countrymen at home were fighting for liberty then for nearly twenty years the poet of great achievement and still greater promise disappears we hear no more songs but only the prose denunciations and arguments which are as remarkable as his poetry in all our literature there is nothing more worthy of the puritan spirit than this laying aside of personal ambitions in order to join in the struggle for human liberty in his best-known sonnet on his blindness which reflects his grief not at darkness but at his abandoned dreams we catch the sublime spirit of this renunciation milton's opportunity to serve came in the crisis of sixteen forty nine the king had been sent to the scaffold paying the penalty of his own treachery and england sat shivering at its own deed like a child or a russian peasant who in sudden passion resists unbearable brutality and is then afraid of the consequences two weeks of anxiety of terror and silence followed then appeared milton's tenure of kings and magistrates to england it was like the coming of a strong man not only to protect the child but to justify his blow for liberty kings no less than people are subject to the eternal principle of law the divine right of a people to defend and to protect themselves 
that was the mighty argument which calmed a people's dread and proclaimed that a new man and a new principle had arisen in england milton was called to be secretary for foreign tongues in the new government and for the next few years until the end of the commonwealth there were two leaders in england cromwell the man of action milton the man of thought it is doubtful to which of the two humanity owes most for its emancipation from the tyranny of kings and prelates two things of personal interest deserve mention in this period of milton's life his marriage and his blindness in sixteen forty three he married mary powell a shallow pleasure-loving girl the daughter of a royalist and that was the beginning of sorrows after a month tiring of the austere life of a puritan household she abandoned her husband who with the same radical reasoning with which he dealt with affairs of state promptly repudiated the marriage his doctrine and discipline of divorce and his tetracordon are the arguments to justify his position but they aroused a storm of protest in england and they suggest to a modern reader that milton was perhaps as much to blame as his wife and that he had scant understanding of a woman's nature when his wife fearing for her position appeared before him in tears all his ponderous arguments were swept aside by a generous impulse and though the marriage was never a happy one milton never again mentioned his wife's desertion the scene in paradise lost where eve comes weeping to adam seeking peace and pardon is probably a reflection of a scene in milton's own household his wife died in sixteen fifty three and a few years later he married another whom we remember for the sonnet methought i saw my late espoused saint in which she is celebrated she died after fifteen months and in sixteen sixty three he married a third wife who helped the blind old man to manage his poor household from boyhood the strain on the poet's eyes had grown more and more severe but even when his sight was threatened he held steadily to his purpose of using his pen in the service of his country during the king's imprisonment a book appeared called eikon basilike royal image giving a rosy picture of the king's piety and condemning the puritans the book speedily became famous and was the source of all royalist arguments against the commonwealth in sixteen forty nine appeared milton's eikonoclastes image breaker which demolished the flimsy arguments of the eikon basilike as a charge of cromwell's ironsides had overwhelmed the king's followers after the execution of the king appeared another famous attack upon the puritans defensio regia pro carlo primus instigated by charles the second who was then living in exile it was written in latin by salmasius a dutch professor at leyden and was hailed by the royalists as an invincible argument by order of the council of state milton prepared a reply his eyesight had sadly failed and he was warned that any further strain would be disastrous his reply was characteristic of the man and the puritan as he had once sacrificed his poetry so he was now ready he said to sacrifice his eyes also on the altar of english liberty his magnificent defensio pro populo anglicano is one of the most masterly controversial works in literature the power of the press was already strongly felt in england and the new commonwealth owed its standing partly to milton's prose and partly to cromwell's policy the defensio was the last work that milton saw blindness fell upon him ere it was finished and from sixteen fifty two until his death he labored in total darkness the last part of milton's life is a picture of solitary grandeur unequaled in literary history with the restoration all his labors and sacrifices for humanity were apparently wasted from his retirement he could hear the bells and the shouts that welcomed back a vicious monarch whose first act was to set his foot upon his people's neck milton was immediately marked for persecution he remained for months in hiding he was reduced to poverty and his books were burned by the public hangman 
his daughters upon whom he depended in his blindness rebelled at the task of reading to him and recording his thoughts in the midst of all these sorrows we understand in samson the cry of the blind champion of israel now blind disheartened shamed dishonored quelled to what can i be useful wherein serve my nation and the work from heaven imposed but to sit idle on the household hearth a burdenous drone to visitants a gaze or pitied object milton's answer is worthy of his own great life without envy or bitterness he goes back to the early dream of an immortal poem and begins with superb consciousness of power to dictate his great epic paradise lost was finished in sixteen sixty five after seven years labor in darkness with great difficulty he found a publisher and for the great work now the most honored poem in our literature he received less than certain verse-makers of our day receive for a little song in one of our popular magazines its success was immediate though like all his work it met with venomous criticism dryden summed up the impression made on thoughtful minds of his time when he said this man cuts us all out and the ancients too thereafter a bit of sunshine came into his darkened home for the work stamped him as one of the world's great writers and from england and the continent pilgrims came in increasing numbers to speak their gratitude the next year milton began his paradise regained in sixteen seventy one appeared his last important work samson agonistes the most powerful dramatic poem on the greek model which our language possesses the picture of israel's mighty champion blind alone afflicted by thoughtless enemies but preserving a noble ideal to the end is a fitting close to the life work of the poet himself for years he was silent dreaming who shall say what dreams in his darkness and saying cheerfully to his friends still guides the heavenly vision he died peacefully in 1674, the most sublime and the most lonely figure in our literature. End of section 22. Section 23 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7. Continued. Milton's Early Poetry. Note in milton's work we see plainly the progressive influence of the puritan age thus his horton poems are joyous almost elizabethan in character his prose is stern militant unyielding like the puritan in his struggle for liberty his later poetry following the apparent failure of puritanism in the restoration has a note of sadness yet proclaims the eternal principles of liberty and justice for which he had lived End of note. in his early work milton appears as the inheritor of all that was best in elizabethan literature and his first work the ode on the morning of christ's nativity approaches the high water-mark of lyric poetry in england in the next six years from sixteen thirty one to sixteen thirty seven he wrote but little scarcely more than two thousand lines but these are among the most exquisite and the most perfectly finished in our language l'allegro l'allegro and il penseroso are twin poems containing many lines and short descriptive passages which linger in the mind like strains of music and which are known and loved wherever english is spoken l'allegro the joyous or happy man is like an excursion into the english fields at sunrise the air is sweet birds are singing a multitude of sights sounds fragrances fill all the senses and to this appeal of nature the soul of man responds by being happy seeing in every flower and hearing in every harmony some exquisite symbol of human life il penseroso takes us over the same ground at twilight and at moonrise the air is still fresh and fragrant the symbolism is if possible more tenderly beautiful than before but the gay mood is gone 
though its memory lingers in the afterglow of the sunset a quiet thoughtfulness takes the place of the pure joyous sensation of the morning a thoughtfulness which is not sad though like all quiet moods it is akin to sadness and which sounds the deeps of human emotion in the presence of nature to quote scattered lines of either poem is to do injustice to both they should be read in their entirety the same day one at morning the other at eventide if one is to appreciate their beauty and suggestiveness comus the mask of comus is in many respects the most perfect of milton's poems it was written in sixteen thirty four to be performed at ludlow castle before the earl of bridgewater and his friends there is a tradition that the earl's three children had been lost in the woods and whether true or not milton takes the simple theme of a person lost calls in an attendant spirit to protect the wanderer and out of this with its natural action and melodious songs makes the most exquisite pastoral drama that we possess in form it is a mask like those gorgeous products of the elizabethan age of which ben jonson was the master england had borrowed the idea of the mask from italy and had used it as the chief entertainment of all festivals until it had become to the nobles of england what the miracle play had been to the common people of a previous generation milton with his strong puritan spirit could not be content with the mere entertainment of an idle hour comus has the gorgeous scenic effects the music and dancing of other masks but its moral purpose and its ideal teachings are unmistakable the triumph of virtue would be a better name for this perfect little mask for its theme is that virtue and innocence can walk through any peril of this world without permanent harm this eternal triumph of good over evil is proclaimed by the attendant spirit who has protected the innocent in this life and who now disappears from mortal sight to resume its life of joy mortals that would follow me love virtue she alone is free she can teach ye how to climb higher than the sphery chime or if virtue feeble were heaven itself would stoop to her while there are undoubted traces of johnson and john fletcher in milton's comus the poem far surpasses its predecessors in the airy beauty and melody of its verses lycidas in the next poem lycidas a pastoral elegy written in sixteen thirty seven and the last of his horton poems milton is no longer the inheritor of the old age but the prophet of a new a college friend edward king had been drowned in the irish sea and milton follows the poetic custom of his age by representing both his friend and himself in the guise of shepherds leading the pastoral life milton also uses all the symbolism of his predecessors introducing fauns satyrs and sea nymphs but again the puritan is not content with heathen symbolism and so introduces a new symbol of the christian shepherd responsible for the souls of men whom he likens to hungry sheep that look up and are not fed the puritans and royalists at this time were drifting rapidly apart and milton uses his new symbolism to denounce the abuses that had crept into the church in any other poet this moral teaching would hinder the free use of the imagination but milton seems equal to the task of combining high moral purpose with the noblest poetry in its exquisite finish and exhaustless imagery lycidas surpasses most of the poetry of what is often called the pagan renaissance sonnets besides these well-known poems milton wrote in this early period a fragmentary mask called arcades several latin poems which like his english are exquisitely finished 
and his famous sonnets which brought this italian form of verse nearly to the point of perfection in them he seldom wrote of love the usual subject with his predecessors but of patriotism duty music and subjects of political interest suggested by the struggle into which england was drifting among these sonnets each reader must find his own favorites those best known and most frequently quoted are on his deceased wife to the nightingale on reaching the age of twenty-three the massacre in piedmont and the two on his blindness milton's prose of milton's prose works there are many divergent opinions ranging from macaulay's unbounded praise to the condemnation of some of our modern critics from a literary viewpoint milton's prose would be stronger if less violent and a modern writer would hardly be excused for using his language or his methods but we must remember the times and the methods of his opponents in his fiery zeal against injustice the poet is suddenly dominated by the soldier's spirit he first musters his facts in battalions and charges upon the enemy to crush and overpower without mercy for milton hates injustice and because it is an enemy of his people he cannot and will not spare it when the victory is won he exults in a paean of victory as soul-stirring as the song of deborah he is the poet again spite of himself and his mind fills with magnificent images even with a subject so dull so barren of the bare possibilities of poetry as his animadversions upon the remonstrance defense he breaks out into an invocation o thou that sittest in light and glory unapproachable parent of angels and men which is like a chapter from the apocalypse in such passages milton's prose is as taine suggests an outpouring of splendors which suggests the noblest poetry Areopagitica on account of their controversial character these prose works are seldom read and it is probable that milton never thought of them as worthy of a place in literature of them all areopagitica has perhaps the most permanent interest and is best worth reading in milton's time there was a law forbidding the publication of books until they were endorsed by the official censor needless to say the censor holding his office and salary by favor was naturally more concerned with the divine right of kings and bishops than with the delights of literature and many books were suppressed for no better reason than that they were displeasing to the authorities milton protested against this as against every other form of tyranny and his areopagitica so called from the areopagus or forum of athens the place of public appeal and the mars hill of st paul's address is the most famous plea in english for the freedom of the press End of section twenty three section twenty four of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven continued milton's later poetry undoubtedly the noblest of milton's works written when he was blind and suffering are paradise lost paradise regained and samson agonistes the first is the greatest indeed the only generally acknowledged epic in our literature since beowulf the last is the most perfect specimen of a drama after the greek method in our language paradise lost of the history of the great epic we have some interesting glimpses in cambridge there is preserved a notebook of milton's containing a list of nearly one hundred subjects note of these sixty were taken from the bible thirty-three from english and five from scotch history End of note. for a great poem selected while he was a boy at the university king arthur attracted him at first but his choice finally settled upon the fall of man 
and we have four separate outlines showing milton's proposed treatment of the subject these outlines indicate that he contemplated a mighty drama or miracle play but whether because of puritan antipathy to plays and players or because of the wretched dramatic treatment of religious subjects which milton had witnessed in italy he abandoned the idea of a play and settled on the form of an epic poem most fortunately it must be conceded for milton had not the knowledge of men necessary for a drama as a study of character paradise lost would be a grievous failure adam the central character is something of a prig while satan looms up a magnificent figure entirely different from the devil of the miracle plays and completely overshadowing the hero both in interest and in manliness the other characters the almighty the sun raphael michael the angels and fallen spirits are merely mouthpieces for milton's declamations without any personal or human interest regarded as a drama therefore paradise lost could never have been a success but as poetry with its sublime imagery its harmonious verse its titanic background of heaven hell and the illimitable void that lies between it is unsurpassed in any literature in sixteen fifty eight milton in his darkness sat down to dictate the work which he had planned thirty years before in order to understand the mighty sweep of the poem it is necessary to sum up the argument of the twelve books as follows argument of paradise lost book one opens with a statement of the subject the fall of man and a noble invocation for light and divine guidance then begins the account of satan and the rebel angels their banishment from heaven and their plot to oppose the design of the almighty by dragging down his children our first parents from their state of innocence the book closes with a description of the land of fire and endless pain where the fallen spirits abide and the erection of pandemonium the palace of satan book two is a description of the council of evil spirits of satan's consent to undertake the temptation of adam and eve and his journey to the gates of hell which are guarded by sin and death book three transports us to heaven again god foreseeing the fall sends raphael to warn adam and eve so that their disobedience shall be upon their own heads then the son offers himself a sacrifice to take away the sin of the coming disobedience of man at the end of this book satan appears in a different scene meets uriel the angel of the sun inquires from him the way to earth and takes his journey thither disguised as an angel of light book four shows us paradise and the innocent state of man an angel guard is set over eden and satan is arrested while tempting eve in a dream but is curiously allowed to go free again book five shows us eve relating her dream to adam and then the morning prayer and the daily employment of our first parents raphael visits them is entertained by a banquet which eve proposes in order to show him that all god's gifts are not kept in heaven and tells them of the revolt of the fallen spirits his story is continued in book six in book seven we read the story of the creation of the world as raphael tells it to adam and eve in book eight adam tells raphael the story of his own life and of his meeting with eve book nine is the story of the temptation by satan following the account in genesis book ten records the divine judgment upon adam and eve shows the construction of sin and death of a highway through chaos to the earth and satan's return to pandemonium adam and eve repent of their disobedience and satan and his angels are turned into serpents 
in book eleven the almighty accepts adam's repentance but condemns him to be banished from paradise and the archangel michael is sent to execute the sentence at the end of the book after eve's feminine grief at the loss of paradise michael begins a prophetic vision of the destiny of man book twelve continues michael's vision adam and eve are comforted by hearing of the future redemption of their race the poem ends as they wander forth out of paradise and the door closes behind them it will be seen that this is a colossal epic not of a man or a hero but of the whole race of men and that milton's characters are such as no human hand could adequately portray but the scenes the splendors of heaven the horrors of hell the serene beauty of paradise the sun and planets suspended between celestial light and gross darkness are pictured with an imagination that is almost superhuman the abiding interest of the poem is in these colossal pictures and in the lofty thought and the marvelous melody with which they are impressed on our minds the poem is in blank verse and not until milton used it did we learn the infinite variety and harmony of which it is capable he played with it changing its melody and movement on every page as an organist out of a single theme develops an unending variety of harmony lamartine has described paradise lost as the dream of a puritan fallen asleep over his bible and this suggestive description leads us to the curious fact that it is the dream not the theology or the descriptions of bible scenes that chiefly interests us thus milton describes the separation of earth and water and there is little or nothing added to the simplicity and strength of genesis but the sunset which follows is milton's own dream and instantly we are transported to a land of beauty and poetry now came still evening on and twilight gray had in her sober livery all things clad silence accompanied for beast and bird they to their grassy couch these to their nests were slunk all but the wakeful nightingale she all night long her amorous descant sung silence was pleased now glowed the firmament with living sapphires hesperus that led the starry host rode brightest till the moon rising in clouded majesty at length apparent queen unveiled her peerless light and o'er the dark her silver mantle threw so also milton's almighty considered purely as a literary character is unfortunately tinged with the narrow and literal theology of the time he is a being enormously egotistic the despot rather than the servant of the universe seated upon a throne with a chorus of angels about him eternally singing his praises and ministering to a kind of divine vanity it is not necessary to search heaven for such a character the type is too common upon the earth but in satan milton breaks away from crude medieval conceptions he follows the dream again and gives us a character to admire and understand is this the region this the soil the clime said then the lost archangel this the seat that we must change for heaven this mournful gloom for that celestial light be it so since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right farthest from him is best whom reason hath equalled force hath made supreme above his equals farewell happy fields where joy for ever dwells hail horrors hail infernal world and thou profoundest hell receive thy new possessor one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven what matter where 
if i be still the same and what i should be all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater here at least we shall be free the almighty hath not built here for his envy will not drive us hence here we may reign secure and in my choice to reign is worth ambition though in hell better to reign in hell than serve in heaven in this magnificent heroism milton has unconsciously immortalized the puritan spirit the same unconquerable spirit that set men to writing poems and allegories when in prison for the faith and that sent them over the stormy sea in a cockle-shell to found a free commonwealth in the wilds of america for a modern reader the understanding of paradise lost presupposes two things a knowledge of the first chapters of the scriptures and of the general principles of calvinistic theology but it is a pity to use the poem as has so often been done to teach a literal acceptance of one or the other of the theology of paradise lost the least said the better but to the splendor of the puritan dream and the glorious melody of its expression no words can do justice even a slight acquaintance will make the reader understand why it ranks with the divina commedia of dante and why it is generally accepted by critics as the greatest single poem in our literature paradise regained soon after the completion of paradise lost thomas elwood a friend of milton asked one day after reading the paradise manuscript but what hast thou to say of paradise found it was in response to this suggestion that milton wrote the second part of the great epic known to us as paradise regained the first tells how mankind in the person of adam fell at the first temptation by satan and became an outcast from paradise and from divine grace the second shows how mankind in the person of christ withstands the tempter and is established once more in the divine favor christ's temptation in the wilderness is the theme and milton follows the account in the fourth chapter of matthew's gospel though paradise regained was milton's favorite and though it has many passages of noble thought and splendid imagery equal to the best of paradise lost the poem as a whole falls below the level of the first and is less interesting to read samson in samson agonistes milton turns to a more vital and personal theme and his genius transfigures the story of samson the mighty champion of israel now blind and scorned working as a slave among the philistines the poet's aim was to present in english a pure tragedy with all the passion and restraint which marked the old greek dramas that he succeeded where others failed is due to two causes first milton himself suggests the hero of one of the greek tragedies his sorrow and affliction give to his noble nature that touch of melancholy and calm dignity which is in perfect keeping with his subject second milton is telling his own story like samson he had struggled mightily against the enemies of his race he had taken a wife from the philistines and had paid the penalty he was blind alone scorned by his vain and thoughtless masters to the essential action of the tragedy milton could add therefore that touch of intense yet restrained personal feeling which carries more conviction than any argument samson is in many respects the most convincing of his works entirely apart from the interest of its subject and treatment one may obtain from it a better idea of what great tragedy was among the greeks than from any other work in our language nothing is here for tears nothing to wail or knock the breast no weakness no contempt dispraise or blame nothing but well and fair 
and what may quiet us in a death so noble end of section twenty four section twenty five of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven continued part three prose writers of the puritan period john bunyan sixteen twenty eight sixteen eighty eight as there is but one poet great enough to express the puritan spirit so there is but one commanding prose writer john bunyan milton was the child of the renaissance inheritor of all its culture and the most profoundly educated man of his age bunyan was a poor uneducated tinker from the renaissance he inherited nothing but from the reformation he received an excess of that spiritual independence which had caused the puritan struggle for liberty these two men representing the extremes of english life in the seventeenth century wrote two works that stand to-day for the mighty puritan spirit one gave us the only epic since beowulf the other gave us our only great allegory which has been read more than any other book in our language save the bible life of bunyan bunyan is an extraordinary figure we must study him as well as his books fortunately we have his life story in his own words written with the same lovable modesty and sincerity that marked all his work reading that story now in grace abounding we see two great influences at work in his life one from within was his own vivid imagination which saw visions allegories parables revelations in every common event the other from without was the spiritual ferment of the age the multiplication of strange sects quakers freewillers ranters anabaptists millenarians and the untempered zeal of all classes like an engine without a balance wheel when men were breaking away from authority and setting up their own religious standards bunyan's life is an epitome of that astonishing religious individualism which marked the close of the english reformation he was born in the little village of elstow near bedford in sixteen twenty eight the son of a poor tinker for a little while the boy was sent to school where he learned to read and write after a fashion but he was soon busy in his father's shop where amid the glowing pots and the fire and smoke of his little forge he saw vivid pictures of hell and the devils which haunted him all his life when he was sixteen years old his father married the second time whereupon bunyan ran away and became a soldier in the parliamentary army the religious ferment of the age made a tremendous impression on bunyan's sensitive imagination he went to church occasionally only to find himself wrapped in terrors and torments by some fiery itinerant preacher and then he would rush violently away from church to forget his fears by joining in sunday sports on the village green as night came on the sports were forgotten but the terrors returned multiplied like the evil spirits of the parable visions of hell and the demons swarmed in his brain he would groan aloud in his remorse and even years afterwards he bemoans the sins of his early life when we look for them fearfully expecting some shocking crimes and misdemeanors we find that they consisted of playing ball on sunday and swearing the latter sin sad to say was begun by listening to his father cursing some obstinate kettle which refused to be tinkered and it was perfected in the parliamentary army one day his terrible swearing scared a woman a very loose and ungodly wretch as he tells us who reprimanded him for his profanity the reproach of the poor woman went straight home like the voice of a prophet 
all his profanity left him he hung down his head with shame i wished with all my heart he says that i might be a little child again that my father might learn me to speak without this wicked way of swearing with characteristic vehemence bunyan hurls himself upon a promise of scripture and instantly the reformation begins to work in his soul he casts out the habit root and branch and finds to his astonishment that he can speak more freely and vigorously than before nothing is more characteristic of the man than this sudden seizing upon a text which he had doubtless heard many times before and being suddenly raised up or cast down by its influence with bunyan's marriage to a good woman the real reformation in his life began while still in his teens he married a girl as poor as himself we came together he says as poor as might be having not so much household stuff as a dish or spoon between us both the only dowry which the girl brought to her new home was two old threadbare books the plain man's pathway to heaven and the practice of piety note the latter was by lewis bailey bishop of bangor it is interesting to note that this book whose very title is unfamiliar to us was speedily translated into five different languages it had an enormous sale and ran through fifty editions soon after publication End of note bunyan read these books which instantly gave fire to his imagination he saw new visions and dreamed terrible new dreams of lost souls his attendance at church grew exemplary he began slowly and painfully to read the bible for himself but because of his own ignorance on the contradictory interpretations of scripture which he heard on every side he was tossed about like a feather by all the winds of doctrine the record of the next few years is like a nightmare so terrible is bunyan's spiritual struggle one day he feels himself an outcast the next the companion of angels the third he tries experiments with the almighty in order to put his salvation to the proof as he goes along the road to bedford he thinks he will work a miracle like gideon with his fleece he will say to the little puddles of water in the horse's tracks be ye dry and to all the dry tracks he will say be ye puddles as he is about to perform the miracle a thought occurs to him but go first under yonder hedge and pray that the lord will make you able to perform a miracle he goes promptly and prays then he is afraid of the test and goes on his way more troubled than before after years of such struggle chased about between heaven and hell bunyan at last emerges into a saner atmosphere even as pilgrim came out of the horrible valley of the shadow soon led by his intense feelings he becomes an open-air preacher and crowds of laborers gather about him on the village green they listen in silence to his words they end in groans and tears scores of them amend their sinful lives for the anglo-saxon people are remarkable for this that however deeply they are engaged in business or pleasure they are still sensitive as barometers to any true spiritual influence whether of priest or peasant they recognize what emerson calls the accent of the holy ghost and in this recognition of spiritual leadership lies the secret of their democracy so this village tinker with his strength and sincerity is presently the acknowledged leader of an immense congregation and his influence is felt throughout england it is a tribute to his power that after the return of charles the second bunyan was the first to be prohibited from holding public meetings concerning bunyan's imprisonment in bedford jail which followed his refusal to obey the law prohibiting religious meetings without the authority of the established church there is a difference of opinion that the law was unjust goes without saying but there was no religious persecution as we understand the term bunyan was allowed to worship when and how he pleased he was simply forbidden to hold public meetings which frequently became fierce denunciations of the established church and government his judges pleaded with bunyan to conform with the law 
he refused saying that when the spirit was upon him he must go up and down the land calling on men everywhere to repent in his refusal we see much heroism a little obstinacy and perhaps something of that desire for martyrdom which tempts every spiritual leader that his final sentence to indefinite imprisonment was a hard blow to bunyan is beyond question he groaned aloud at the thought of his poor family and especially at the thought of leaving his little blind daughter i found myself a man encompassed with infirmities the parting was like pulling the flesh from my bones oh the thoughts of the hardship i thought my poor blind one might go under would break my heart to pieces poor child thought i what sorrow thou art like to have for thy portion in this world thou must be beaten must beg suffer hunger cold nakedness and a thousand calamities though i cannot now endure that the wind should blow upon thee and then because he thinks always in parables and seeks out most curious texts of scripture he speaks of the two milk kine that were to carry the ark of god into another country and leave their calves behind them poor cows poor bunyan such is the mind of this extraordinary man with characteristic diligence bunyan set to work in prison making shoelaces and so earned a living for his family his imprisonment lasted for nearly twelve years but he saw his family frequently and was for some time a regular preacher in the baptist church in bedford occasionally he even went about late at night holding the proscribed meetings and increasing his hold upon the common people the best result of this imprisonment was that it gave bunyan long hours for the working of his peculiar mind and for study of his two only books the king james bible and fox's book of martyrs the result of his study and meditation was pilgrim's progress which was probably written in prison but which for some reason he did not publish till long after his release the years which followed are the most interesting part of bunyan's strange career the publication of pilgrim's progress in sixteen seventy eight made him the most popular writer as he was already the most popular preacher in england books tracts sermons nearly sixty works in all came from his pen and when one remembers his ignorance his painfully slow writing and his activity as an itinerant preacher one can only marvel his evangelistic journeys carried him often as far as london and wherever he went crowds thronged to hear him scholars bishops statesmen went in secret to listen among the laborers and came away wondering and silent at southwark the largest building could not contain the multitude of his hearers and when he preached in london thousands would gather in the cold dusk of the winter morning before work began and listen until he had made an end of speaking bishop bunyan he was soon called on account of his missionary journeys and his enormous influence what we most admire in the midst of all this activity is his perfect mental balance his charity and humor in the strife of many sects he was badgered for years by petty enemies and he arouses our enthusiasm by his tolerance his self-control and especially by his sincerity to the very end he retained that simple modesty which no success could spoil once when he had preached with unusual power some of his friends waited after the service to congratulate him telling him what a sweet sermon he had delivered ay said bunyan you need not remind me the devil told me that before i was out of the pulpit for sixteen years this wonderful activity continued without interruption then one day when riding through a cold storm on a labor of love to reconcile a stubborn man with his own stubborn son he caught a severe cold and appeared ill and suffering but rejoicing in his success at the house of a friend in reading 
he died there a few days later and was laid away in bun hill fields burial ground london which has been ever since a campo santo to the faithful works of bunyan the world's literature has three great allegories spencer's fairy queen dante's divina commedia and bunyan's pilgrim's progress the first appeals to poets the second to scholars the third to people of every age and condition here is a brief outline of the famous work argument of pilgrim's progress as i walked through the wilderness of this world i lighted on a certain place where there was a den bedford jail and laid me down in that place to sleep and as i slept i dreamed a dream so the story begins he sees a man called christian setting out with a book in his hand and a great load on his back from the city of destruction christian has two objects to get rid of his burden which holds the sins and fears of his life and to make his way to the holy city at the outset evangelist finds him weeping because he knows not where to go and points him to a wicket gate on a hill far away as christian goes forward his neighbors friends wife and children call to him to come back but he puts his fingers in his ears crying out life life eternal life and so rushes across the plain then begins a journey in ten stages which is a vivid picture of the difficulties and triumphs of the christian life every trial every difficulty every experience of joy or sorrow of peace or temptation is put into the form and discourse of a living character other allegorists write in poetry and their characters are shadowy and unreal but bunyan speaks in terse idiomatic prose and his characters are living men and women there are mr worldly wise man a self-satisfied and dogmatic kind of man youthful ignorance sweet piety courteous demas garrulous talkative honest faithful and a score of others who are not at all the bloodless creatures of the romance of the rose but men real enough to stop you on the road and to hold your attention scene after scene follows in which are pictured many of our own spiritual experiences there is the slough of despond into which we all have fallen out of which pliable scrambles on the hither side and goes back grumbling but through which christian struggles mightily till helpful stretches him a hand and drags him out on solid ground and bids him go on his way then come interpreter's house the palace beautiful the lions in the way the valley of humiliation the hard fight with the demon apollyon the more terrible valley of the shadow vanity fair and the trial of faithful the latter is condemned to death by a jury made up of mr blind man mr no good mr heady mr live loose mr hate light and others of their kind to whom questions of justice are committed by the jury system most famous is doubting castle where christian and hopeful are thrown into a dungeon by giant despair and then at last the delectable mountains of youth the deep river that christian must cross and the city of all delight and the glorious company of angels that come singing down the streets at the very end when in sight of the city and while he can hear the welcome with which christian is greeted ignorance is snatched away to go to his own place and bunyan quaintly observes then i saw that there was a way to hell even from the gates of heaven as well as from the city of destruction so i awoke and behold it was a dream such in brief is the story the great epic of a puritan's individual experience in a rough world just as paradise lost was the epic of mankind as dreamed by the great puritan who had fallen asleep over his bible success of pilgrim's progress 
the chief fact which confronts the student of literature as he pauses before this great allegory is that it has been translated into seventy-five languages and dialects and has been read more than any other book save one in the english language as for the secret of its popularity taine says next to the bible the book most widely read in england is the pilgrim's progress protestantism is the doctrine of salvation by grace and no writer has equaled bunyan in making this doctrine understood and this opinion is echoed by the majority of our literary historians it is perhaps sufficient answer to quote the simple fact that pilgrim's progress is not exclusively a protestant study it appeals to christians of every name and to mohammedans and buddhists in precisely the same way that it appeals to christians when it was translated into the languages of catholic countries like france and portugal only one or two incidents were omitted and the story was almost as popular there as with english readers the secret of its success is probably simple it is first of all not a procession of shadows repeating the author's declamations but a real story the first extended story in our language our puritan fathers may have read the story for religious instruction but all classes of men have read it because they found in it a true personal experience told with strength interest humor in a word with all the qualities that such a story should possess young people have read it first for its intrinsic worth because the dramatic interest of the story lured them on to the very end and second because it was their introduction to true allegory the child with his imaginative mind the man also who has preserved his simplicity naturally personifies objects and takes pleasure in giving them powers of thinking and speaking like himself bunyan was the first writer to appeal to this pleasant and natural inclination in a way that all could understand add to this the fact that pilgrim's progress was the only book having any story interest in the great majority of english and american homes for a full century and we have found the real reason for its wide reading other works of bunyan the holy war published in sixteen sixty five is the first important work of bunyan it is a prose paradise lost and would undoubtedly be known as a remarkable allegory were it not overshadowed by its great rival grace abounding to the chief of sinners published in sixteen sixty six twelve years before pilgrim's progress is the work from which we obtain the clearest insight into bunyan's remarkable life and to a man with historical or antiquarian tastes it is still excellent reading in sixteen eighty two appeared the life and death of mr badman a realistic character study which is a precursor of the modern novel and in sixteen eighty four the second part of pilgrim's progress showing the journey of christiana and her children to the city of all delight besides these bunyan published a multitude of treatises and sermons all in the same style direct simple convincing expressing every thought and emotion perfectly in words that even a child can understand many of these are masterpieces admired by working men and scholars alike for their thought and expression take for instance the heavenly footman put it side by side with the best work of latimer and uh, the resemblance in style is startling it is difficult to realize that one work came from an ignorant tinker and the other from a great scholar both engaged in the same general work as bunyan's one book was the bible we have here a suggestion of its influence in all our prose literature end of section twenty five section twenty six of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven continued minor prose writers 
the puritan period is generally regarded as one destitute of literary interest but that was certainly not the result of any lack of books or writers says burton in his anatomy of melancholy i have new books every day pamphlets currantos stories whole catalogues of volumes of all sorts new paradoxes opinions schisms heresies controversies in philosophy and religion now come tidings of weddings maskings entertainments jubilees embassies sports plays then again as in a new ship scene treasons cheatings tricks robberies enormous villainies in all kinds funerals deaths new discoveries expeditions now comical then tragical matters so the record continues till one rubs his eyes and thinks he must have picked up by mistake the last literary magazine and for all these kaleidoscopic events there were waiting a multitude of writers ready to seize the abundant material and turn it to literary account for a tract an article a volume or an encyclopedia three good books if one were to recommend certain of these books as expressive of this age of outward storm and inward calm there are three that deserve more than a passing notice namely the religio medici holy living and the complete angler the first was written by a busy physician a supposedly scientific man at that time the second by the most learned of english churchmen and the third by a simple merchant and fisherman strangely enough these three great books the reflections of nature science and revelation all interpret human life alike and tell the same story of gentleness charity and noble living if the age had produced only these three books we could still be profoundly grateful to it for its inspiring message robert burton fifteen seventy seven sixteen forty burton is famous chiefly as the author of the anatomy of melancholy one of the most astonishing books in all literature which appeared in sixteen twenty one burton was a clergyman of the established church an incomprehensible genius given to broodings and melancholy and to reading every conceivable kind of literature thanks to his wonderful memory everything he read was stored up for use or ornament till his mind resembled a huge curiosity shop all his life he suffered from hypochondria but curiously traced his malady to the stars rather than to his own liver it is related of him that he used to suffer so from despondency that no help was to be found in medicine or theology his only relief was to go down to the river and hear the bargemen swear at one another burton's anatomy was begun as a medical treatise on morbidness arranged and divided with all the exactness of the schoolmen's demonstration of doctrines but it turned out to be an enormous hodgepodge of quotations and references to authors known and unknown living and dead which seemed to prove chiefly that much study is a weariness to the flesh by some freak of taste it became instantly popular and was proclaimed one of the greatest books in literature a few scholars still explore it with delight as a mine of classic wealth but the style is hopelessly involved and to the ordinary reader most of his numerous references are now as unmeaning as a hyper jacobian surface sir thomas brown sixteen o five sixteen eighty two brown was a physician who after much study and travel settled down to his profession in norwich but even then he gave far more time to the investigation of natural phenomena than to the barbarous practices which largely constituted the art of medicine in his day he was known far and wide as a learned doctor and an honest man whose scientific studies had placed him in advance of his age and whose religious views were liberal to the point of heresy 
with this in mind it is interesting to note as a sign of the times that this most scientific doctor was once called to give expert testimony in the case of two old women who were being tried for the capital crime of witchcraft he testified under oath that the fits were natural but heightened by the devils cooperating with the witches at whose instance he the alleged devil did the villainies religio medici brown's great work is the religio medici i e the religion of a physician sixteen forty two which met with most unusual success hardly ever was a book published in britain says oldys a chronicler who wrote nearly a century later that made more noise than the religio medici its success may be due largely to the fact that among thousands of religious works it was one of the few which saw in nature a profound revelation and which treated purely religious subjects in a reverent kindly tolerant way without ecclesiastical bias it is still therefore excellent reading but it is not so much the matter as the manner the charm the gentleness the remarkable prose style which has established the book as one of the classics of our literature two other works of brown are vulgar errors sixteen forty six a curious combination of scientific and credulous research in the matter of popular superstition and urn burial a treatise suggested by the discovery of roman burial urns at walsingham it began as an inquiry into the various methods of burial but ended in a dissertation on the vanity of earthly hope and ambitions from a literary point of view it is brown's best work but is less read than the religio medici thomas fuller sixteen o eight sixteen sixty one fuller was a clergyman and royalist whose lively style and witty observations would naturally place him with the gay caroline poets his best-known works are the holy war the holy state and the profane state church history of britain and the history of the worthies of england the holy and profane state is chiefly a biographical record the first part consisting of numerous historical examples to be imitated the second of examples to be avoided the church history is not a scholarly work notwithstanding its author's undoubted learning but is a lively and gossipy account which has at least one virtue that it entertains the reader the worthies the most widely read of his works is a racy account of the important men of england fuller traveled constantly for years collecting information from out-of-the-way sources and gaining a minute knowledge of his own country this with his overflowing humor and numerous anecdotes and illustrations makes lively and interesting reading indeed we hardly find a dull page in any of his numerous books jeremy taylor sixteen thirteen sixteen sixty seven taylor was the greatest of the clergymen who made this period famous a man who like milton upheld a noble ideal in storm and calm and himself lived it nobly he has been called the shakespeare of divines and a kind of spencer in a cassock and both descriptions apply to him very well his writings with their exuberant fancy and their noble diction belong rather to the elizabethan than to the puritan age from the large number of his works to stand out as representative of the man himself the liberty of prophesying sixteen forty six which hallam calls the first plea for tolerance in religion on a comprehensive basis and on deep-seated foundations and the rules and exercises of holy living sixteen fifty to the latter might be added its companion volume holy dying published in the following year the holy living and dying as a single volume was for many years read in almost every english cottage 
with baxter's saint's rest pilgrim's progress and the king james bible it often constituted the entire library of multitudes of puritan homes and as we read its noble words and breathe its gentle spirit we cannot help wishing that our modern libraries were gathered together on the same thoughtful foundations richard baxter sixteen fifteen sixteen ninety one this busiest man of his age strongly suggests bunyan in his life and writings like bunyan he was poor and uneducated a nonconformist minister exposed continually to insult and persecution and like bunyan he threw himself heart and soul into the conflicts of his age and became by his public speech a mighty power among the common people unlike jeremy taylor who wrote for the learned and whose involved sentences and classical allusions are sometimes hard to follow baxter went straight to his mark appealing directly to the judgment and feeling of his readers the number of his works is almost incredible when one thinks of his busy life as a preacher and the slowness of manual writing in all he left nearly one hundred and seventy different works which if collected would make fifty or sixty volumes as he wrote chiefly to influence men on the immediate questions of the day most of his work has fallen into oblivion his two most famous books are the saint's everlasting rest and a call to the unconverted both of which were exceedingly popular running through scores of successive editions and have been widely read in our own generation itzhak walton walton was a small tradesman of london who preferred trout brooks and good reading to the profits of business and the doubtful joys of a city life so at fifty years when he had saved a little money he left the city and followed his heart out into the country he began his literary work or rather his recreation by writing his famous lives kindly and readable appreciations of dunn wotton hooker herbert and sanderson which stand at the beginning of modern biographical writing the complete angler in sixteen fifty three appeared the complete angler which has grown steadily in appreciation and which is probably more widely read than any other book on the subject of fishing it begins with a conversation between a falconer a hunter and an angler but the angler soon does most of the talking as fishermen sometimes do the hunter becomes a disciple and learns by the easy method of hearing the fisherman discourse about his art the conversations it must be confessed are often diffuse and pedantic but they only make us feel more comfortably sleepy as one invariably feels after a good day's fishing so kindly is the spirit of the angler so exquisite his appreciation of the beauty of the earth and sky that one returns to the book as to a favorite trout stream with the undying expectation of catching something among a thousand books on angling it stands almost alone in possessing a charming style and so it will probably be read as long as men go fishing best of all it leads to a better appreciation of nature and it drops little moral lessons into the reader's mind as gently as one casts a fly to a wary trout so that one never suspects his better nature is being angled for though we have sometimes seen anglers catch more than they need or sneak ahead of brother fishermen to the best pools we are glad for walton's sake to overlook such unaccountable exceptions and agree with the milkmaid that we love all anglers they be such honest civil quiet men summary of the puritan period 
the half century between sixteen twenty five and sixteen seventy five is called the puritan period for two reasons first because puritan standards prevailed for a time in england and second because the greatest literary figure during all these years was the puritan john milton historically the age was one of tremendous conflict the puritan struggled for righteousness and liberty and because he prevailed the age is one of moral and political revolution in his struggle for liberty the puritan overthrew the corrupt monarchy beheaded charles i and established the commonwealth under cromwell the commonwealth lasted but a few years and the restoration of charles the second in sixteen sixty is often put as the end of the puritan period the age has no distinct limits but overlaps the elizabethan period on one side and the restoration period on the other the age produced many writers a few immortal books and one of the world's great literary leaders the literature of the age is extremely diverse in character and the diversity is due to the breaking up of the ideals of political and religious unity this literature differs from that of the preceding age in three marked ways one it has no unity of spirit as in the days of elizabeth resulting from the patriotic enthusiasm of all classes two in contrast with the hopefulness and vigor of elizabethan writings much of the literature of this period is somber in character it saddens rather than inspires us three it has lost the romantic impulse of youth and become critical and intellectual it makes us think rather than feel deeply in our study we have noted one the transition poets of whom daniel is chief two the songwriters campion and breton three the spenserian poets wither and giles fletcher four the metaphysical poets donne and herbert five the cavalier poets herrick carew lovelace and suckling six john milton his life his early or horton poems his militant prose and his last great poetical works seven john bunyan his extraordinary life and his chief work the pilgrim's progress eight the minor prose writers burton brown fuller taylor baxter and walton three books selected from this group are brown's religio medici taylor's holy living and dying and walton's complete angler suggestive questions one what is meant by the puritan period what were the objects and the results of the puritan movement in english history two what are the main characteristics of the literature of this period compare it with elizabethan literature how did religion and politics affect puritan literature can you quote any passages or name any works which justify your opinion three what is meant by the terms cavalier poets spenserian poets metaphysical poets name the chief writers of each group to whom are we indebted for our first english hymn-book would you call this a work of literature why for what are the qualities of herrick's poetry what marked contrasts are found in herrick and in nearly all the poets of this period five who was george herbert for what purpose did he write what qualities are found in his poetry six tell briefly the story of milton's life what are the three periods of his literary work what is meant by the horton poems compare l'allegro and il penseroso are there any puritan ideals in comus why is lycidas often put at the summit of english lyrical poetry give the main idea or argument of paradise lost what are the chief qualities of the poem describe in outline paradise regained and samson agonistes what personal element entered into the latter what quality strikes you most forcibly in milton's poetry 
what occasioned milton's prose works do they properly belong to literature why compare milton and shakespeare with regard to one knowledge of men two ideals of life three purpose in writing seven tell the story of bunyan's life what unusual elements are found in his life and writings give the main argument of the pilgrim's progress if you read the story before studying literature tell why you liked or disliked it why is it a work for all ages and for all races what are the chief qualities of bunyan's style eight who are the minor prose writers of this age name the chief works of jeremy taylor thomas brown and isaac walton can you describe from your own reading any of these works how does the prose of this age compare in interest with the poetry milton is of course accepted in this comparison chronology seventeenth century history sixteen twenty five charles the first parliament dissolved sixteen twenty eight petition of right sixteen thirty sixteen forty king rules without parliament puritan migration to new england sixteen forty long parliament sixteen forty two civil war begins sixteen forty three scotch covenant sixteen forty three press censorship sixteen forty five battle of naseby triumph of puritans sixteen forty nine execution of charles the first cavalier migration to virginia sixteen forty nine sixteen sixty commonwealth sixteen fifty three sixteen fifty eight cromwell protector sixteen fifty eight sixteen sixty richard cromwell sixteen sixty restoration of charles the second literature sixteen twenty one burton's anatomy of melancholy sixteen twenty three withers hymn book sixteen twenty nine milton's ode on the nativity sixteen thirty sixteen thirty three herbert's poems sixteen thirty two sixteen thirty seven milton's horton poems sixteen forty two brown's religio medici sixteen forty four milton's areopagitica sixteen forty nine milton's tenure of kings sixteen fifty baxter's saint's rest jeremy taylor's holy living sixteen fifty one hobbes leviathan sixteen fifty three walton's complete angler sixteen sixty three sixteen ninety four dryden's dramas in parentheses next chapter sixteen sixty six bunyan's grace abounding sixteen sixty seven paradise lost sixteen seventy four death of milton sixteen seventy eight pilgrim's progress published parentheses written earlier end of section twenty six end of chapter seven section twenty seven of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight period of the restoration sixteen sixty seventeen hundred the age of french influence history of the period it seems a curious contradiction at first glance to place the return of charles the second at the beginning of modern england as our historians are wont to do for there was never a time when the progress of liberty which history records was more plainly turned backwards the puritan regime had been too severe it had repressed too many natural pleasures now released from restraint society abandoned the decencies of life and the reverence for law itself and plunged into excesses more unnatural than had been the restraints of puritanism 
the inevitable effect of excess is disease and for almost an entire generation following the restoration in sixteen sixty england lay sick of a fever socially politically morally london suggests an italian city in the days of the medici and its literature especially its drama often seems more like the delirium of illness than the expression of a healthy mind but even a fever has its advantages whatever impurity is in the blood is burnt and purged away and a man rises from fever with a new strength and a new idea of the value of life like king hezekiah who after his sickness and fear of death resolved to go softly all his days the restoration was the great crisis in english history and that england lived through it was due solely to the strength and excellence of that puritanism which she thought she had flung to the winds when she welcomed back a vicious monarch at dover the chief lesson of the restoration was this that it showed by awful contrast the necessity of truth and honesty and of a strong government of free men for which the puritan had stood like a rock in every hour of his rugged history through fever england came slowly back to health through gross corruption in society and in the state england learned that her people were at heart sober sincere religious folk and that their character was naturally too strong to follow after pleasure and be satisfied so puritanism suddenly gained all that it had struggled for and gained it even in the hour when all seemed lost when milton in his sorrow unconsciously portrayed the government of charles and his cabal in that tremendous scene of the council of the infernal peers in pandemonium plotting the ruin of the world the king and his followers of the king and his followers it is difficult to write temperately most of the dramatic literature of the time is atrocious and we can understand it only as we remember the character of the court and society for which it was written unspeakably vile in his private life the king had no redeeming patriotism no sense of responsibility to his country for even his public acts he gave high offices to blackguards stole from the exchequer like a common thief played off catholics and protestants against each other disregarding his pledges to both alike broke his solemn treaty with the dutch and with his own ministers and betrayed his country for french money to spend on his own pleasures it is useless to paint the dishonor of a court which followed gaily after such a leader the first parliament while it contained some noble and patriotic members was dominated by young men who remembered the excess of puritan zeal but forgot the despotism and injustice which had compelled puritanism to stand up and assert the manhood of england these young politicians vied with the king in passing laws for the subjugation of church and state and in their thirst for revenge upon all who had been connected with cromwell's iron government once more a wretched formalism that perpetual danger to the english church came to the front and exercised authority over the free churches the house of lords was largely increased by the creation of hereditary titles and estates for ignoble men and shameless women who had flattered the king's vanity even the bench that last strong refuge of english justice was corrupted by the appointment of judges like the brutal jeffreys whose aim like that of their royal master was to get money and to exercise power without personal responsibility amid all this dishonor the foreign influence and authority of cromwell's strong government vanished like smoke the valiant little dutch navy swept the english fleet from the sea and only the thunder of dutch guns in the thames under the very windows of london awoke the nation to the realization of how low it had fallen revolution of sixteen eighty eight 
two considerations must modify our judgment of this disheartening spectacle first the king and his court are not england though our histories are largely filled with the records of kings and soldiers of intrigues and fightings these no more express the real life of a people than fever and delirium express a normal manhood though king and court and high society arouse our disgust or pity records are not wanting to show that private life in england remained honest and pure even in the worst days of the restoration while london society might be entertained by the degenerate poetry of rochester and the dramas of dryden and Wycherley, english scholars hailed milton with delight and the common people followed bunyan and baxter with their tremendous appeal to righteousness and liberty second the king with all his pretensions to divine right remained only a figurehead and the anglo-saxon people when they tire of one figurehead have always the will and the power to throw it overboard and choose a better one the country was divided into two political parties the whigs who sought to limit the royal power in the interests of parliament and the people and the tories who strove to check the growing power of the people in the interests of their hereditary rulers both parties however were largely devoted to the anglican church and when james the second after four years of misrule attempted to establish a national catholicism by intrigues which aroused the protest of the pope note guizot's history of the revolution in england end of note as well as of parliament then whigs and tories catholics and protestants united in england's last great revolution the complete and bloodless revolution of sixteen eighty eight which called william of orange to the throne was simply the indication of england's restored health and sanity it proclaimed that she had not long forgotten and could never again forget the lessons taught her by puritanism in its hundred years of struggle and sacrifice modern england was firmly established by the revolution which was brought about by the excesses of the restoration french influence literary characteristics in the literature of the restoration we note a sudden breaking away from old standards just as society broke away from the restraints of puritanism many of the literary men had been driven out of england with charles and his court or else had followed their patrons into exile in the days of the commonwealth on their return they renounced old ideals and demanded that english poetry and drama should follow the style to which they had become accustomed in the gaiety of paris we read with astonishment in pepys diary sixteen sixty sixteen sixty nine that he has been to see a play called midsummer night's dream but that he will never go again to hear shakespeare for it is the most insipid ridiculous play that ever i saw in my life and again we read in the diary of evelyn another writer who reflects with wonderful accuracy the life and spirit of the restoration i saw hamlet played but now the old plays begin to discuss this refined age since his majesty's being so long abroad since shakespeare and the elizabethans were no longer interesting literary men began to imitate the french writers with whose works they had just grown familiar and here begins the so-called period of french influence which shows itself in english literature for the next century instead of the italian influence which had been dominant since spencer and the elizabethans one has only to consider for a moment the french writers of this period pascal bossuet fenelon malherbe corneille racine moliere all that brilliant company which makes the reign of louis the fourteenth the elizabethan age of french literature to see how far astray the early writers of the restoration went in their wretched imitation 
when a man takes another for his model he should copy virtues not vices but unfortunately many english writers reverse the rule copying the vices of french comedy without any of its wit or delicacy or abundant ideas the poems of rochester the plays of dryden wycherley congreve vanbrugg farquhar all popular in their day are mostly unreadable milton's sons of belial flown with insolence and wine is a good expression of the vile character of the court writers and of the london theatres for thirty years following the restoration such work can never satisfy a people and when jeremy collier note jeremy collier sixteen fifty seventeen twenty six a clergyman and author noted for his scholarly ecclesiastical history of great britain seventeen o eight seventeen fourteen and his short view of the immorality and profaneness of the english stage sixteen ninety eight the latter was largely instrumental in correcting the low tendency of the restoration drama End of note. in sixteen ninety eight published a vigorous attack upon the evil plays and playwrights of the day all london tired of the coarseness and excesses of the restoration joined the literary revolution and the corrupt drama was driven from the stage new tendencies with the final rejection of the restoration drama we reach a crisis in the history of our literature the old elizabethan spirit with its patriotism its creative vigor its love of romance and the puritan spirit with its moral earnestness and individualism were both things of the past and at first there was nothing to take their places dryden the greatest writer of the age voiced a general complaint when he said that in his prose and poetry he was drawing the outlines of a new art but had no teacher to instruct him but literature is a progressive art and soon the writers of the age developed two marked tendencies of their own the tendency to realism and the tendency to that preciseness and elegance of expression which marks our literature for the next hundred years realism in realism that is the representation of men exactly as they are the expression of the plain unvarnished truth without regard to ideals or romance the tendency was at first thoroughly bad the early restoration writers sought to paint realistic pictures of a corrupt court and society and as we have suggested they emphasized the vices rather than virtues and gave us coarse low plays without interest or moral significance like hobbes they saw only the externals of man his body and appetites not his soul and its ideals and so like most realists they resemble a man lost in the woods who wanders aimlessly around in circles seeing the confusing trees but never the whole forest and who seldom thinks of climbing the nearest high hill to get his bearings later however this tendency to realism became more wholesome while it neglected romantic poetry in which youth is eternally interested it led to a keener study of the practical motives which govern human action formalism the second tendency of the age was toward directness and simplicity of expression and to this excellent tendency our literature is greatly indebted in both the elizabethan and the puritan ages the general tendency of writers was towards extravagance of thought and language sentences were often involved and loaded with latin quotations and classical allusions the restoration writers opposed this vigorously from france they brought back the tendency to regard established rules for writing to emphasize close reasoning rather than romantic fancy and to use short clean-cut sentences without an unnecessary word we see this french influence in the royal society note 
the royal society for the investigation and discussion of scientific questions was founded in sixteen sixty two and soon included practically all the literary and scientific men of the age it encouraged the work of isaac newton who was one of its members and its influence for truth at a time when men were still trying to compound the philosopher's stone calculating men's action from the stars and hanging harmless old women for witches can hardly be overestimated End of note which had for one of its objects the reform of english prose by getting rid of its swellings of style and which bound all its members to use a close naked natural way of speaking as near to mathematical plainness as they can dryden accepted this excellent rule for his prose and adopted the heroic couplet as the next best thing for the greater part of his poetry as he tells us himself and this unpolished rugged verse i chose as fittest for discourse and nearest prose it is largely due to him that writers developed that formalism of style that precise almost mathematical elegance miscalled classicism which ruled english literature for the next century note if the reader would see this in concrete form let him read a paragraph of milton's prose or a stanza of his poetry and compare its exuberant melodious diction with dryden's concise method of writing End of note the couplet another thing which the reader will note with interest in restoration literature is the adoption of the heroic couplet that is two iambic pentameter lines which rhyme together as the most suitable form of poetry waller note edmund waller sixteen o six sixteen eighty seven the most noted poet of the restoration period until his pupil dryden appeared his works are now seldom read End of note. who began to use it in sixteen twenty three is generally regarded as the father of the couplet for he is the first poet to use it consistently in the bulk of his poetry chaucer had used the rhymed couplet wonderfully well in his canterbury tales but in chaucer it is the poetical thought more than the expression which delights us with the restoration writers form counts for everything waller and dryden made the couplet the prevailing literary fashion and in their hands the couplet becomes closed that is each pair of lines must contain a complete thought stated as precisely as possible thus waller writes the soul's dark cottage battered and decayed lets in new light through chinks that time has made that is a kind of aphorism such as pope made in large quantities in the following age it contains a thought is catchy quotable easy to remember and the restoration writers delighted in it soon this mechanical closed couplet in which the second line was often made first note following the advice of boileau sixteen seventy six seventeen eleven a noted french critic whom voltaire called the lawgiver of parnassus End of note, almost excluded all other forms of poetry it was dominant in england for a full century and we have grown familiar with it and somewhat weary of its monotony in such famous poems as pope's essay on man and goldsmith's deserted village these however are essays rather than poems that even the couplet is capable of melody and variety is shown in chaucer's tales and in keats's exquisite endymion these four things the tendency to vulgar realism in the drama a general formalism which came from following set rules the development of a simpler and more direct prose style and the prevalence of the heroic couplet in poetry are the main characteristics of restoration literature they are all exemplified in the work of one man john dryden john dryden sixteen thirty one seventeen hundred dryden is the greatest literary figure of the restoration 
and in his work we have an excellent reflection of both the good and the evil tendencies of the age in which he lived if we can think for a moment of literature as a canal of water we may appreciate the figure that dryden is the lot by which the waters of english poetry were let down from the mountains of shakespeare and milton to the plain of pope that is he stands between two very different ages and serves as a transition from one to the other life dryden's life contains so many conflicting elements of greatness and littleness that the biographer is continually taken away from the facts which are his chief concern to judge motives which are manifestly outside his knowledge and business judged by his own opinion of himself as expressed in the numerous prefaces to his works dryden was the soul of candor writing with no other master than literature and with no other object than to advance the welfare of his age and nation judged by his acts he was apparently a time-server catering to a depraved audience in his dramas and dedicating his work with much flattery to those who were easily cajoled by their vanity into sharing their purse and patronage in this however he only followed the general custom of the time and is above many of his contemporaries dryden was born in the village of aldwinkle northamptonshire in sixteen thirty one his family were prosperous people who brought him up in the strict puritan faith and sent him first to the famous westminster school and then to cambridge he made excellent use of his opportunities and studied eagerly becoming one of the best educated men of his age especially in the classics though of remarkable literary taste he showed little evidence of literary ability up to the age of thirty by his training and family connections he was allied to the puritan party and his only well-known work of this period the heroic stanzas was written on the death of cromwell his grandeur he derived from heaven alone for he was great ere fortune made him so and wars like mists that rise against the sun made him but greater seem not greater grow in these four lines taken almost at random from the heroic stanzas we have an epitome of the thought the preciseness and the polish that mark all his literary work this poem made dryden well known and he was in a fair way to become the new poet of puritanism when the restoration made a complete change in his methods he had come to london for a literary life and when the royalists were again in power he placed himself promptly on the winning side his astrea redux a poem of welcome to charles the second and his panegyric to his sacred majesty breathe more devotion to the old goat as the king was known to his courtiers than had his earlier poems to puritanism in sixteen sixty seven he became more widely known and popular by his anus mirabilis a narrative poem describing the terrors of the great fire in london and some events of the disgraceful war with holland but with the theatres reopened and nightly filled the drama offered the most attractive field to one who made his living by literature so dryden turned to the stage and agreed to furnish three plays yearly for the actors of the king's theatre for nearly twenty years the best of his life dryden gave himself up to this unfortunate work both by nature and habit he seems to have been clean in his personal life but the stage demanded unclean plays and dryden followed his audience that he deplored this is evident from some of his later work and we have his statement that he wrote only one play his best to please himself this was all for love which was written in blank verse most of the others being in rhymed couplets during this time dryden had become the best-known literary man of london and was almost as much a dictator to the literary set which gathered in the taverns and coffee-houses 
as ben jonson had been before him his work meanwhile was rewarded by large financial returns and by his being appointed poet laureate and collector of the port of london the latter office it may be remembered had once been held by chaucer at fifty years of age and before jeremy collier had driven his dramas from the stage dryden turned from dramatic work to throw himself into the strife of religion and politics writing at this period his numerous prose and poetical treatises in sixteen eighty two appeared his religio laici religion of a layman defending the anglican church against all other sects especially the catholics and presbyterians but three years later when james the second came to the throne with schemes to establish the roman faith dryden turned catholic and wrote his most famous religious poem the hind and the panther beginning a milk white hind immortal and unchanged fed on the lawns and in the forest ranged without unspotted innocent within she feared no danger for she knew no sin this hind is a symbol for the roman church and the anglicans as a panther are represented as persecuting the faithful numerous other sects calvinists anabaptists quakers were represented by the wolf boar hare and other animals which gave the poet an excellent chance for exercising his satire dryden's enemies made the accusation often since repeated of hypocrisy in thus changing his church but that he was sincere in the matter can now hardly be questioned for he knew how to suffer for the faith and to be true to his religion even when it meant misjudgment and loss of fortune at the revolution of sixteen eighty eight he refused allegiance to william of orange he was deprived of all his offices and pensions and as an old man was again thrown back on literature as his only means of livelihood he went to work with extraordinary courage and energy writing plays poems prefaces for other men eulogies for funeral occasions every kind of literary work that men would pay for his most successful work at this time was his translations which resulted in the complete aeneid and many selections from homer ovid and juvenal appearing in english rhymed couplets his most enduring poem the splendid ode called alexander's feast was written in sixteen ninety seven three years later he published his last work fables containing poetical paraphrases of the tales of boccaccio and chaucer and the miscellaneous poems of his last years long prefaces were the fashion in dryden's day and his best critical work is found in his introductions the preface to the fables is generally admired as an example of the new prose style developed by dryden and his followers from the literary viewpoint these last troubled years were the best of dryden's life though they were made bitter by obscurity and by the criticism of his numerous enemies he died in seventeen hundred and was buried near chaucer in westminster abbey works of dryden the numerous dramatic works of dryden are best left in that obscurity into which they have fallen now and then they contain a bit of excellent lyric poetry and in all for love another version of antony and cleopatra where he leaves his cherished heroic couplet for the blank verse of marlowe and shakespeare he shows what he might have done had he not sold his talents to a depraved audience on the whole reading his plays is like nibbling at a rotting apple even the good spots are affected by the decay and one ends by throwing the whole thing into the garbage can where most of the dramatic works of this period belong poems the controversial and satirical poems are on a higher plane though it must be confessed dryden's satire often strikes us as cutting and revengeful rather than witty the best known of these and a masterpiece of its kind is absalom and achitophel which is undoubtedly the most powerful political satire in our language 
taking the bible story of david and absalom he uses it to ridicule the whig party and also to revenge himself upon his enemies charles the second appeared as king david his natural son the duke of monmouth who was mixed up in the rye house plot paraded as absalom shaftesbury was achitophel the evil counsellor and the duke of buckingham was satirized as zimri the poem had enormous political influence and raised dryden in the opinion of his contemporaries to the front rank of english poets two extracts from the powerful characterizations of achitophel and zimri are given here to show the style and spirit of the whole work shaftesbury of these the false achitophel was first a name to all succeeding ages cursed for close designs and crooked counsels fit sagacious bold and turbulent of wit restless unfixed in principles and place in power unpleased impatient of disgrace a fiery soul which working out its way fretted the pygmy body to decay a daring pilot in extremity pleased with the danger when the waves went high he sought the storms but for a calm unfit would steer too nigh the sands to boast his wit great wits are sure to madness near allied and thin partitions do their bounds divide else why should he with wealth and honor blessed refuse his age the needful hours of rest punish a body which he could not please bankrupt of life yet prodigal of ease and all to leave what with his toil he won to that unfeathered two-legged thing a son in friendship false implacable in hate resolved to ruin or to rule the state then seized with fear yet still affecting fame usurped a patriot's all atoning name so easy still it proves in factious times with public zeal to cancel private crimes the duke of buckingham some of their chiefs were princes of the land in the first rank of these did zimri stand a man so various that he seemed to be not one but all mankind's epitome stiff in opinions always in the wrong was everything by starts and nothing long but in the course of one revolving moon was chemist fiddler statesman and buffoon then all for women painting rhyming drinking besides ten thousand freaks that died in thinking blessed madman who could every hour employ with something new to wish or to enjoy railing and praising were his usual themes and both to show his judgment in extremes so over violent or over civil that every man with him was god or devil of the many miscellaneous poems of dryden the curious reader will get an idea of his sustained narrative power from the anus mirabilis the best expression of dryden's literary genius however is found in alexander's feast which is his most enduring ode and one of the best in our language prose and criticism as a prose writer dryden had a very marked influence on our literature in shortening his sentences and especially in writing naturally without depending on literary ornamentation to give effect to what he is saying if we compare his prose with that of milton or brown or jeremy taylor we note that dryden cares less for style than any of the others but takes more pains to state his thought clearly and concisely as men speak when they wish to be understood the classical school which followed the restoration looked to dryden as a leader and to him we owe largely that tendency to exactness of expression which marks our subsequent prose writing with his prose dryden rapidly developed his critical ability and became the foremost critic note by a critic we mean simply one who examines the literary work of various ages 
separates the good from the bad and gives the reasons for his classification it is noticeable that critical writings increase in an age like that of the restoration when great creative works are wanting End of, note. of his age his criticisms instead of being published as independent works were generally used as prefaces or introductions to his poetry the best known of these criticisms are the preface to the fables of heroic plays discourse on satire and especially the essay of dramatic poesy sixteen sixty eight which attempts to lay a foundation for all literary criticism dryden's influence on literature dryden's place among authors is due partly to his great influence on the succeeding age of classicism briefly this influence may be summed up by noting the three new elements which he brought into our literature these are one the establishment of the heroic couplet as the fashion for satiric didactic and descriptive poetry two his development of a direct serviceable prose style such as we still cultivate and three his development of the art of literary criticism in his essays and in the numerous prefaces to his poems this is certainly a large work for one man to accomplish and dryden is worthy of honor though comparatively little of what he wrote is now found on our bookshelves end of section twenty seven Section 28 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 continued. Samuel Butler, 1612-1680. In marked contrast with Dryden, who devoted his life to literature and won his success by hard work, is Samuel Butler, who jumped into fame by a single careless work which represents not any serious intent or effort but the pastime of an idle hour we are to remember that though the royalists had triumphed in the restoration the puritan spirit was not dead nor even sleeping and that the puritan held steadfastly to his own principles against these principles of justice truth and liberty there was no argument since they expressed the manhood of england but many of the puritan practices were open to ridicule and the royalists in revenge for their defeat began to use ridicule without mercy during the early years of the restoration doggerel verses ridiculing puritanism and burlesque that is a ridiculous representation of serious subjects or a serious representation of ridiculous subjects were the most popular form of literature with london society of all this burlesque and doggerel the most famous is butler's hudibras a work to which we can trace many of the prejudices that still prevail against puritanism of butler himself we know little he is one of the most obscure figures in our literature during the days of cromwell's protectorate he was in the employ of sir samuel luke a crabbed and extreme type of puritan nobleman and here he collected his material and probably wrote the first part of his burlesque which of course he did not dare to publish until after the restoration hudibras hudibras is plainly modeled upon the don quixote of cervantes it describes the adventures of a fanatical justice of the peace sir hudibras and of his squire ralpho in their endeavor to put down all innocent pleasures in hudibras and ralpho the two extreme types of the puritan party presbyterians and independents are mercilessly ridiculed when the poem first appeared in public in sixteen sixty three after circulating secretly for years in manuscript it became at once enormously popular the king carried a copy in his pocket and courtiers vied with each other in quoting its most scurrilous passages a second and third part continuing the adventures of hudibras were published in sixteen sixty four and sixteen sixty eight 
at best the work is a wretched doggerel but it was clever enough and strikingly original and since it expressed the royalist spirit towards the puritans it speedily found its place in a literature which reflects every phase of human life a few odd lines are given here to show the character of the work and to introduce the reader to the best-known burlesque in our language he was in logic a great critic profoundly skilled in analytic he could distinguish and divide a hair twixt south and southwest side on either which he would dispute confute change hands and still confute he'd undertake to prove by force of argument a man's no horse he'd run in debt by disputation and pay with ratiocination for he was of that stubborn crew of errant saints whom all men grant to be the true church militant such as do build their faith upon the holy text of pike and gun decide all controversies by infallible artillery and prove their doctrine orthodox by apostolic blows and knocks compound for sins they are inclined to by damning those they have no mind to hobbs and locke thomas hobbes fifteen eighty eight sixteen seventy nine is one of the writers that puzzle the historian with a doubt as to whether or not he should be included in the story of literature the one book for which he is famous is called leviathan or the matter form and power of a commonwealth sixteen fifty one it is partly political partly a philosophical book combining two central ideas which challenge and startle the attention namely that self-interest is the only guiding power of humanity and that blind submission to rulers is the only true basis of government Note two other principles of this book should be noted one that all power originates in the people and two that the object of all government is the common good here evidently is a democratic doctrine which abolishes the divine right of kings but hobbes immediately destroys democracy by another doctrine that the power given by the people to the ruler could not be taken away hence the royalists could use the book to justify the despotism of the stuarts on the ground that the people had chosen them this part of the book is in direct opposition to milton's defense of the english people End of note in a word hobbes reduced human nature to its purely animal aspects and then asserted confidently that there was nothing more to study certainly therefore as a reflection of the underlying spirit of charles and his followers it has no equal in any purely literary work of the time john locke sixteen thirty two seventeen o four is famous as the author of a single great philosophical work the essay concerning human understanding sixteen ninety this is a study of the nature of the human mind and of the origin of ideas which far more than the work of bacon and hobbes is the basis upon which english philosophy has since been built aside from their subjects both works are models of the new prose direct simple convincing for which dryden and the royal society labored they are known to every student of philosophy but are seldom included in a work of literature note locke's treatises on government should also be mentioned for they are of profound interest to american students of history and political science it was from locke that the framers of the declaration of independence and of the constitution drew many of their ideas and even some of their most striking phrases all men are endowed with certain inalienable rights life liberty and the pursuit of happiness the origin and basis of government is in the consent of the governed these and many more familiar and striking expressions are from locke it is interesting to note that he was appointed to draft a constitution for the new province of carolina but his work was rejected probably because it was too democratic for the age in which he lived evelyn and pepys these two men john evelyn sixteen twenty seventeen o six and samuel pepys sixteen thirty three seventeen o three 
are famous as the writers of diaries in which they jotted down the daily occurrences of their own lives without any thought that the world would ever see or be interested in what they had written evelyn was the author of silva the first book on trees and forestry in english and terra which is the first attempt at a scientific study of agriculture but the world has lost sight of these two good books while it cherishes his diary which extends over the greater part of his life and gives us vivid pictures of society in his time and especially of the frightful corruption of the royal court pepys diary pepys began life in a small way as a clerk in a government office but soon rose by his diligence and industry to be secretary of the admiralty here he was brought into contact with every grade of society from the king's ministers to the poor sailors of the fleet being inquisitive as a blue jay he investigated the rumors and gossip of the court as well as the small affairs of his neighbors and wrote them all down in his diary with evident interest but because he chattered most freely and told his little book a great many secrets which were not well for the world to know he concealed everything in shorthand and here again he was like the blue jay which carries off and hides every bright trinket it discovers the diary covers the years from sixteen sixty to sixteen sixty nine and gossips about everything from his own position and duties at the office his dress the kitchen and cook and children to the great political intrigues of office and the scandals of high society no other such minute picture of the daily life of an age has been written yet for a century and a half it remained entirely unknown and not until eighteen twenty five was pepys shorthand deciphered and published since then it has been widely read and is still one of the most interesting examples of diary writing that we possess following are a few extracts note a few slight changes and omissions from the original text as given in wheatley's edition of pepys london eighteen ninety two nine volumes are not indicated in these brief quotations End of note covering only a few days in april sixteen sixty three from which one may infer the minute and interesting character of the work that this clerk politician president of the royal society and general busybody wrote to please himself april first i went to the temple to my cousin roger pepys to see and talk with him a little who tells me that with much ado the parliament do agree to throw down popery but he says it is with so much spite and passion and an endeavor of bringing all nonconformists into the same condition that he is afeard matters will not go so well as he could wish to my office all the afternoon lord how sir j minns like a mad coxcomb did swear and stamp swearing that commissioner pett hath still the old heart against the king that ever he had and all the damnable reproaches in the world at which i was ashamed but said little but upon the whole i find him still a fool led by the nose with stories told by sir w batten whether with or without reason so vexed in my mind to see things ordered so unlike gentlemen or men of reason i went home and to bed third to white hall and to chapel which being most monstrous full i could not go into my pew but sat among the choir dr creton the scotchman preached a most admirable good learned honest and most severe sermon yet comical he railed bitterly ever and anon against john calvin and his brood the presbyterians and against the present term now in use of tender consciences he ripped up hugh peters calling him an execrable skellum his preaching and stirring up the maids of the city to bring in their bodkins and thimbles thence going out of white hall i met captain grove who did give me a letter directed to myself from himself 
i discerned money to be in it and took it knowing as i found it to be the proceed of the place i have got him the taking up of vessels for tangier but i did not open it till i came home to my office and there i broke it open not looking into it till all the money was out that i might say i saw no money in the paper if ever i should be questioned about it there was a piece of gold and four pounds in silver fourth to my office home to dinner whither by and by comes roger pepys etc very merry at uh, before and after dinner and the more for that my dinner was great and most neatly dressed by our own only maid we had fricassee of rabbits and chickens a leg of mutton boiled three carps in a dish a great dish of a side of lamb a dish of roasted pigeons a dish of four lobsters three tarts a lamprey pie a most rare pie a dish of anchovies good wine of several sorts and all things mighty noble and to my great content fifth lord's day up and spent the morning till the barber came in reading in my chamber part of osborne's advice to his son which i shall not ever enough admire for sense and language and being by and by trimmed to church myself wife ashwell etc home and while dinner was prepared to my office to read over my vows with great affection and to very good purpose then to church again where a simple bawling young scot preached nineteenth easter day up and this day put on my clothes need colored suit which with new stockings of the color with belt and new gilt handled sword is very handsome to church alone and after dinner to church again where the young scotchman preaching i slept all the while after supper fell in discourse of dancing and i find that ashwell hath a very fine carriage which makes my wife almost ashamed of herself to see herself so outdone but to-morrow she begins to learn to dance for a month or two so to prayers and to bed will being gone with my leave to his father's this day for a day or two to take physique these holy days twenty third st george's day and coronation the king and court being at windsor at the installing of the king of denmark by proxy and the duke of monmouth spent the evening with my father at cards till late and being at supper my boy being sent for some mustard to a neat's tongue the rogue stayed half an hour in the streets it seems at a bonfire at which i was very angry and resolved to beat him to-morrow twenty-fourth up betimes and with my salt eel went down into the parlour and there got my boy and did beat him till i was fain to take breath two or three times yet for all i am afeard it will make the boy never the better he is grown so hardened in his tricks which i am sorry for he being capable of making a brave man and is a boy that i and my wife love very well summary of the restoration period the chief thing to note in england during the restoration is the tremendous social reaction from the restraints of puritanism which suggests the wide swing of a pendulum from one extreme to the other for a generation many natural pleasures had been suppressed now the theatres were reopened bull and bear baiting revived and sports music dancing a wild delight in the pleasures and vanities of this world replaced that absorption in otherworldliness which characterized the extreme of puritanism in literature the change is no less marked from the elizabethan drama playwrights turned to coarse evil scenes which presently disgusted the people and were driven from the stage from romance writers turned to realism from italian influence with its exuberance of imagination they turned to france and learned to repress the emotions to follow the head rather than the heart and to write in a clear concise formal style according to set rules poets turned from the noble blank verse of shakespeare and milton from the variety and melody which had characterized english poetry since chaucer's day to the monotonous heroic couplet with its mechanical perfection the greatest writer of the age is john dryden 
who established the heroic couplet as the prevailing verse form in english poetry and who developed a new and serviceable prose style suited to the practical needs of the age the popular ridicule of puritanism in burlesque and doggerel is best exemplified in butler's hudibras the realistic tendency the study of facts and of men as they are is shown in the work of the royal society in the philosophy of hobbes and locke and in the diaries of evelyn and pepys with their minute pictures of social life the age was one of transition from the exuberance and vigor of renaissance literature to the formality and polish of the augustan age in strong contrast with the preceding ages comparatively little of restoration literature is familiar to modern readers suggestive questions one what marked change in social conditions followed the restoration how are these changes reflected in literature two what are the chief characteristics of restoration literature why is this period called the age of french influence what new tendencies were introduced what effect did the royal society and the study of science have upon english prose what is meant by realism by formalism three what is meant by the heroic couplet explain why it became the prevailing form of english poetry what are its good qualities and its defects name some well-known poems which are written in couplets how do dryden's couplets compare with chaucer's can you explain the difference four give a brief account of dryden's life what are his chief poetical works for what new object did he use poetry is satire a poetical subject why is a poetical satire more effective than a satire in prose what was dryden's contribution to english prose what influence did he exert on our literature five what is butler's hudibras explain its popularity read a passage and comment upon it first as satire second as a description of the puritans is hudibras poetry why six name the philosophers and political economists of this period can you explain why hobbes should call his work leviathan what important american documents show the influence of locke seven tell briefly the story of pepys and his diary what light does the latter throw on the life of the age is the diary a work of literature why chronology last half of the seventeenth century history sixteen forty nine execution of charles the first sixteen forty nine to sixteen sixty commonwealth sixteen sixty restoration of charles the second sixteen sixty five sixteen sixty six plague and fire of london war with holland sixteen sixty seven dutch fleet in the thames sixteen eighty rise of whigs and tories sixteen eighty five james the second monmouth's rebellion sixteen eighty eight english revolution william of orange called to throne sixteen eighty nine bill of rights toleration act literature sixteen fifty one hobbes leviathan sixteen sixty sixteen sixty nine pepys diary sixteen sixty two royal society founded sixteen sixty three butler's hudibras sixteen sixty seven milton's paradise lost dryden's anus mirabilis sixteen sixty three sixteen ninety four dryden's dramas sixteen seventy one paradise regained sixteen seventy eight pilgrim's progress published sixteen eighty one dryden's absalom and achitophel sixteen eighty seven newton's principia proves the law of gravitation sixteen ninety locke's human understanding sixteen ninety eight jeremy collier attacks stage seventeen hundred death of dryden end of section twenty eight end of chapter eight
section twenty nine of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine eighteenth century literature seventeen hundred eighteen hundred part one augustan or classic age history of the period the revolution of sixteen eighty eight which banished the last of the stuart kings and called william of orange to the throne marks the end of the long struggle for political freedom in england thereafter the englishman spent his tremendous energy which his forebears had largely spent in fighting for freedom in endless political discussions and in efforts to improve his government in order to bring about reforms votes were now necessary and to get votes the people of england must be approached with ideas facts arguments information so the newspaper was born note the first daily newspaper the daily current appeared in london in seventeen o two end of note and literature in its widest sense including the book the newspaper and the magazine became the chief instrument of a nation's progress social development the first half of the eighteenth century is remarkable for the rapid social development in england hitherto men had been more or less governed by the narrow isolated standards of the middle ages and when they differed they fell speedily to blows now for the first time they set themselves to the task of learning the art of living together while still holding different opinions in a single generation nearly two thousand public coffee-houses each a centre of sociability sprang up in london alone and the number of private clubs is quite as astonishing note see lakey's england the eighteenth century End of note this new social life had a marked effect in polishing men's words and manners the typical londoner of queen anne's day was still rude and a little vulgar in his tastes the city was still very filthy the streets unlighted and infested at night by bands of rowdies and mohawks but outwardly men sought to refine their manners according to prevailing standards and to be elegant to have good form was a man's first duty whether he entered society or wrote literature one can hardly read a book or poem of the age without feeling this superficial elegance government still had its opposing tory and whig parties and the church was divided into catholics anglicans and dissenters but the growing social life offset many antagonisms producing at least the outward impression of peace and unity nearly every writer of the age busied himself with religion as well as with party politics the scientist newton as sincerely as the churchman barrow the philosophical locke no less earnestly than the evangelical wesley but nearly all tempered their zeal with moderation and argued from reason and scripture or used delicate satire upon their opponents instead of denouncing them as followers of satan there were exceptions of course but the general tendency of the age was toward toleration man had found himself in the long struggle for personal liberty now he turned to the task of discovering his neighbor of finding in whig and tory in catholic and protestant in anglican and dissenter the same general human characteristics that he found in himself this good work was helped moreover by the spread of education and by the growth of the national spirit following the victories of marlborough on the continent in the midst of heated argument it needed only a word gibraltar blenheim ramilly malplaquet or a poem of victory written in a garret note addison's campaign seventeen o four written to celebrate the battle of blenheim End of note to tell a patriotic people that under their many differences they were all alike englishmen 
in the latter half of the century the political and social progress is almost bewildering the modern form of cabinet government responsible to parliament and the people had been established under george the first and in seventeen fifty seven the cynical and corrupt practices of walpole premier of the first tory cabinet were replaced by the more enlightened policies of pitt schools were established clubs and coffee-houses increased books and magazines multiplied until the press was the greatest visible power in england the modern great dailies the chronicle post and times began their career of public education religiously all the churches of england felt the quickening power of that tremendous spiritual revival known as methodism under the preaching of wesley and whitefield outside her own borders three great men clive in india wolfe on the plains of abraham cook in australia and the islands of the pacific were unfurling the banner of st george over the untold wealth of new lands and spreading the world-wide empire of the anglo-saxons an age of prose literary characteristics in every preceding age we have noted especially the poetical works which constitute according to matthew arnold the glory of english literature now for the first time we must chronicle the triumph of english prose a multitude of practical interests arising from the new social and political conditions demanded expression not simply in books but more especially in pamphlets magazines and newspapers poetry was inadequate for such a task hence the development of prose of the unfettered word as dante calls it a development which astonishes us by its rapidity and excellence the graceful elegance of addison's essays the terse vigor of swift's satires the artistic finish of fielding's novels the sonorous eloquence of gibbon's history and of burke's orations these have no parallel in the poetry of the age indeed poetry itself became prosaic in this respect that it was used not for creative works of imagination but for essays for satire for criticism for exactly the same practical ends as was prose the poetry of the first half of the century as typified in the work of pope is polished and witty enough but artificial it lacks fire fine feeling enthusiasm the glow of the elizabethan age and the moral earnestness of puritanism in a word it interests us as a study of life rather than delights or inspires us by its appeal to the imagination the variety and excellence of prose works and the development of a serviceable prose style which had been begun by dryden until it served to express clearly every human interest and emotion these are the chief literary glories of the eighteenth century satire in the literature of the preceding age we noted two marked tendencies the tendency to realism in subject matter and the tendency to polish and refinement of expression both these tendencies were continued in the augustan age and are seen clearly in the poetry of pope who brought the couplet to perfection and in the prose of addison the third tendency is shown in the prevalence of satire resulting from the unfortunate union of politics with literature we have already noted the power of the press in this age and the perpetual strife of political parties nearly every writer of the first half of the century was used and rewarded by whigs or tories for satirizing their enemies and for advancing their special political interests pope was a marked exception but he nevertheless followed the prose writers in using satire too largely in his poetry now satire that is a literary work which searches out the faults of men or institutions in order to hold them up to ridicule is at best a destructive kind of criticism a satirist is like a laborer who clears away the ruins and rubbish of an old house before the architect and builders begin on a new and beautiful structure the work may sometimes be necessary but it rarely arouses our enthusiasm 
while the satires of pope swift and addison are doubtless the best in our language we hardly place them with our great literature which is always constructive in spirit and we have the feeling that all these men were capable of better things than they ever wrote the classic age the period we are studying is known to us by various names it is often called the age of queen anne but unlike elizabeth this meekly stupid queen had practically no influence upon our literature the name classic age is more often heard but in using it we should remember clearly these three different ways in which the word classic is applied to literature one the term classic refers in general to writers of the highest rank in any nation as used in our literature it was first applied to the works of the great greek and roman writers like homer and virgil and any english book which followed the simple and noble method of these writers was said to have a classic style later the term was enlarged to cover the great literary works of other ancient nations so that the bible and the avestas as well as the iliad and the aeneid are called classics two every national literature has at least one period in which an unusual number of great writers are producing books and this is called the classic period of a nation's literature thus the reign of augustus is the classic or golden age of rome the generation of dante is the classic age of italian literature the age of louis the fourteenth is the french classic age and the age of queen anne is often called the classic age of england three the word classic acquired an entirely different meaning in the period we are studying and we shall better understand this by reference to the preceding ages the elizabethan writers were led by patriotism by enthusiasm and in general by romantic emotions they wrote in a natural style without regard to rules and though they exaggerated and used too many words their works are delightful because of their vigor and freshness and fine feeling in the following age patriotism had largely disappeared from politics and enthusiasm from literature poets no longer wrote naturally but artificially with strange and fantastic verse forms to give effect since fine feeling was wanting and this is the general character of the poetry of the puritan age note great writers in every age men like shakespeare and milton make their own style they are therefore not included in this summary among the minor writers also there are exceptions to the rule and fine feeling is often manifest in the poetry of dunn herbert vaughan and herrick End of note gradually our writers rebelled against the exaggerations of both the natural and the fantastic style they demanded that poetry should follow exact rules and in this they were influenced by french writers especially by boileau and rapin who insisted on precise methods of writing poetry and who professed to have discovered their rules in the classics of horace and aristotle in our study of the elizabethan drama we noted the good influence of the classic movement in insisting upon that beauty of form and definiteness of expression which characterized the dramas of greece and rome and in the work of dryden and his followers we see a revival of classicism in the effort to make english literature conform to rules established by the great writers of other nations at first the results were excellent especially in prose but as the creative vigor of the elizabethans was lacking in this age writing by rule soon developed a kind of elegant formalism which suggests the elaborate social code of the time just as a gentleman might not act naturally but must follow exact rules in doffing his hat or addressing a lady or entering a room or wearing a wig or offering his snuff-box to a friend so our writers lost individuality and became formal and artificial the general tendency of literature was to look at life critically to emphasize intellect rather than imagination the form rather than the content of a sentence 
writers strove to repress all emotion and enthusiasm and to use only precise and elegant methods of expression this is what is often meant by the classicism of the ages of pope and johnson it refers to the critical intellectual spirit of many writers to the fine polish of their heroic couplets or the elegance of their prose and not to any resemblance which their work bears to true classic literature in a word the classic movement had become pseudo-classic i e a false or sham classicism and the latter term is now often used to designate a considerable part of eighteenth-century literature note we have endeavored here simply to show the meaning of terms in general use in our literature but it must be remembered that it is impossible to classify or to give a descriptive name to the writers of any period or century while classic or pseudo-classic may apply to a part of eighteenth-century literature every age has both its romantic and its classic movements in this period the revolt against classicism is shown in the revival of romantic poetry under gray collins burns and thompson and in the beginning of the english novel under defoe richardson and fielding these poets and novelists who have little or no connection with classicism belong chronologically to the period we are studying they are reserved for special treatment in the sections following End of note to avoid this critical difficulty we have adopted the term augustan age a name chosen by the writers themselves who saw in pope addison swift johnson and burke the modern parallels to horace virgil cicero and all that brilliant company who made roman literature famous in the days of augustus alexander pope sixteen eighty eight seventeen forty four pope is in many respects a unique figure in the first place he was for a generation the poet of a great nation to be sure poetry was limited in the early eighteenth century there were few lyrics little or no love poetry no epics no dramas or songs of nature worth considering but in the narrow field of satiric and didactic verse pope was the undisputed master his influence completely dominated the poetry of his age and many foreign writers as well as the majority of english poets looked to him as their model second he was a remarkably clear and adequate reflection of the spirit of the age in which he lived there is hardly an ideal a belief a doubt a fashion a whim of queen anne's time that is not neatly expressed in his poetry third he was the only important writer of that age who gave his whole life to letters swift was a clergyman and politician addison was secretary of state other writers depended on patrons or politics or pensions for fame and a livelihood but pope was independent and had no profession but literature and fourth by the sheer force of his ambition he won his place and held it in spite of religious prejudice and in the face of physical and temperamental obstacles that would have discouraged a stronger man for pope was deformed and sickly dwarfish in soul and body he knew little of the world of nature or of the world of the human heart he was lacking apparently in noble feeling and instinctively chose a lie when the truth had manifestly more advantages yet this jealous peevish waspish little man became the most famous poet of his age and the acknowledged leader of english literature we record the fact with wonder and admiration but we do not attempt to explain it life pope was born in london in sixteen eighty eight the year of the revolution his parents were both catholics who presently removed from london and settled in binfield near windsor where the poet's childhood was passed partly because of an unfortunate prejudice against catholics in the public schools partly because of his own weakness and deformity pope received very little school education but browsed for himself among english books and picked up a smattering of the classics very early he began to write poetry and records the fact with his usual vanity 
as yet a child nor yet a fool to fame i lisped in numbers for the numbers came being debarred by his religion from many desirable employments he resolved to make literature his life work and in this he resembled dryden who he tells us was his only master though much of his work seems to depend on boileau the french poet and critic note pope's satires for instance are strongly suggested in boileau his rape of the lock is much like the mock heroic le lutrin and the essay on criticism which made him famous is an english edition and improvement of l'art poétique the last was in turn a combination of the ars poetica of horace and of many well-known rules of the classicists End of note when only sixteen years old he had written his pastorals a few years later appeared his essay on criticism which made him famous with the publication of the rape of the lock in seventeen twelve pope's name was known and honored all over england and this dwarf of twenty-four years by the sheer force of his own ambition had jumped to the foremost place in english letters it was soon after this that voltaire called him the best poet of england and at present of all the world which is about as near the truth as voltaire generally gets in his numerous universal judgments for the next twelve years pope was busy with poetry especially with his translations of homer and his work was so successful financially that he bought a villa at twickenham on the thames and remained happily independent of wealthy patrons for a livelihood led by his success pope returned to london and for a time endeavored to live the gay and dissolute life which was supposed to be suitable for a literary genius but he was utterly unfitted for it mentally and physically and soon retired to twickenham there he gave himself up to poetry manufactured a little garden more artificial than his verses and cultivated his friendship with martha blount with whom for many years he spent a good part of each day and who remained faithful to him to the end of his life at twickenham he wrote his moral epistles poetical satires modeled after horace and revenged himself upon all his critics in the bitter abuse of the dunciad he died in seventeen forty four and was buried at twickenham his religion preventing him from the honor which was certainly his due of a resting place in westminster abbey works of pope for convenience we may separate pope's work into three groups corresponding to the early middle and later period of his life in the first he wrote his pastorals windsor forest messiah essay on criticism eloise to abelard and the rape of the lock in the second his translations of homer in the third the dunciad and the epistles the latter containing the famous essay on man and the epistle to dr arbuthnot which is in truth his apologia and in which alone we see pope's life from his own viewpoint essay on criticism the essay on criticism sums up the art of poetry as taught first by horace then by boileau and the eighteenth century classicists though written in heroic couplets we hardly consider this as a poem but rather as a storehouse of critical maxims for fools rush in where angels fear to tread to err is human to forgive divine a little learning is a dangerous thing these lines and many more like them from the same source have found their way into our common speech and are used without thinking of the author whenever we need an apt quotation rape of the lock the rape of the lock is a masterpiece of its kind and comes nearer to being a creation than anything else that pope has written the occasion of the famous poem was trivial enough a fop at the court of queen anne one lord petra snipped a lock of hair from the abundant curls of a pretty maid of honor named arabella fermor the young lady resented it and the two families were plunged into a quarrel which was the talk of london 
pope being appealed to seized the occasion to construct not a ballad as the cavaliers would have done nor an epigram as french poets love to do but a long poem in which all the mannerisms of society are pictured in minutest detail and satirized with the most delicate wit the first edition consisting of two cantos was published in seventeen twelve and it is amazing now to read of the trivial character of london court life at the time when english soldiers were battling for a great continent in the french and indian wars its instant success caused pope to lengthen the poem by three more cantos and in order to make a more perfect burlesque of an epic poem he introduces gnomes sprites sylphs and salamanders Note, these are the four kinds of spirits inhabiting the four elements according to the rosicrucians a fantastic sect of spiritualists of that age in the dedication of the poem pope says he took the idea from a french book called le comte de gabali End of note instead of the gods of the great epics with which his readers were familiar the poem is modeled after two foreign satires boileau's le lutrin reading desk a satire on the french clergy who raised a huge quarrel over the location of a lectern and la secchia rapita stolen bucket a famous italian satire on the petty causes of the endless italian wars pope however went far ahead of his masters in style and in delicacy of handling a mock heroic theme and during his lifetime the rape of the lock was considered as the greatest poem of its kind in all literature the poem is still well worth reading for as an expression of the artificial life of the age of its cards parties toilettes lapdogs tea-drinking snuff-taking and idle vanities it is as perfect in its way as tamburlaine which reflects the boundless ambition of the elizabethans pope's translations the fame of pope's iliad which was financially the most successful of his books was due to the fact that he interpreted homer in the elegant artificial language of his own age not only do his words follow literary fashions but even the homeric characters lose their strength and become fashionable men of the court so the criticism of the scholar bentley was most appropriate when he said it is a pretty poem mr pope but you must not call it homer pope translated the entire iliad and half of the odyssey and the latter work was finished by two cambridge scholars elijah fenton and william broom who imitated the mechanical couplet so perfectly that it is difficult to distinguish their work from that of the great poet of the age a single selection is given to show how in the nobler passages even pope may faintly suggest the elemental grandeur of homer the troops exulting set in order round and beaming fires illumined all the ground as when the moon refulgent lamp of night o'er heaven's clear azure spreads her sacred light when not a breath disturbs the deep serene and not a cloud o'ercasts the solemn scene around her throne the vivid planets roll and stars unnumbered gild the glowing pole o'er the dark trees a yellower verdure shed and tip with silver every mountain's head essay on man the essay is the best known and the most quoted of all pope's works except in form it is not poetry and when one considers it as an essay and reduces it to plain prose it is found to consist of numerous literary ornaments without any very solid structure of thought to rest upon the purpose of the essay is in pope's words to vindicate the ways of god to man and as there are no unanswered problems in pope's philosophy the vindication is perfectly accomplished in four poetical epistles concerning man's relations to the universe to himself to society and to happiness the final result is summed up in a few well-known lines all nature is but art unknown to thee 
all chance direction which thou canst not see all discord harmony not understood all partial evil universal good and spite of pride in erring reason's spite one truth is clear whatever is is right like the essay on criticism the poem abounds in quotable lines such as the following which make the entire work well worth reading hope springs eternal in the human breast man never is but always to be blessed know then thyself presume not god to scan the proper study of mankind is man the same ambition can destroy or save and makes a patriot as it makes a knave honor and shame from no condition rise act well your part there all the honor lies vice is a monster of so frightful mien as to be hated needs but to be seen yet seen too oft familiar with her face we first endure then pity then embrace behold the child by nature's kindly law pleased with a rattle tickled with a straw some livelier plaything gives his youth delight a little louder but as empty quite scarfs garters gold amuse his riper stage and beads and prayer-books are the toys of age pleased with this bauble still as that before till tired he sleeps and life's poor play is o'er note compare this with shakespeare's all the world's a stage in as you like it act two scene seven end of note miscellaneous works the dunciad i e the iliad of the dunces began originally as a controversy concerning shakespeare but turned out to be a coarse and revengeful satire upon all the literary men of the age who had aroused pope's anger by their criticism or lack of appreciation of his genius though brilliantly written and immensely popular at one time its present effect on the reader is to arouse a sense of pity that a man of such acknowledged power and position should abuse both by devoting his talents to personal spite and petty quarrels among the rest of his numerous works the reader will find pope's estimate of himself best set forth in his epistle to dr arbuthnot and it will be well to close our study of this strange mixture of vanity and greatness with the universal prayer which shows at least that pope had considered and judged himself and that all further judgment is consequently superfluous End of section twenty nine Section thirty of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine continued. Jonathan Swift, sixteen sixty seven, seventeen forty five. In each of Marlowe's tragedies, we have the picture of a man dominated by a single passion, the lust of power for its own sake. In each, we see that a powerful man without self control is like a dangerous instrument in the hands of a child, and the tragedy ends in the destruction of the man by the ungoverned power which he possesses the life of swift is just such a living tragedy he had the power of gaining wealth like the hero of the jew of malta yet he used it scornfully and in sad irony left what remained to him of a large property to found a hospital for lunatics by hard work he won enormous literary power and used it to satirize our common humanity he wrested political power from the hands of the tories and used it to insult the very men who had helped him and who held his fate in their hands by his dominant personality he exercised a curious power over women and used it brutally to make them feel their inferiority being loved supremely by two good women he brought sorrow and death to both and endless misery to himself 
so his power brought always tragedy in its wake it is only when we remember his life of struggle and disappointment and bitterness that we can appreciate the personal quality in his satire and perhaps find some sympathy for this greatest genius of all the augustan writers life swift was born in dublin of english parents in sixteen sixty seven his father died before he was born his mother was poor and swift though proud as lucifer was compelled to accept aid from relatives who gave it grudgingly at the kilkenny school and especially at dublin university he detested the curriculum reading only what appealed to his own nature but since a degree was necessary to his success he was compelled to accept it as a favor from the examiners whom he despised in his heart after graduation the only position open to him was with a distant relative sir william temple who gave him the position of private secretary largely on account of the unwelcome relationship temple was a statesman and an excellent diplomatist but he thought himself to be a great writer as well and he entered into a literary controversy concerning the relative merits of the classics and modern literature swift's first notable work the battle of the books written at this time but not published is a keen satire upon both parties in the controversy the first touch of bitterness shows itself here for swift was in a galling position for a man of his pride knowing his intellectual superiority to the man who employed him and yet being looked upon as a servant and eating at the servant's table thus he spent ten of the best years of his life in the pretty moor park surrey growing more bitter each year and steadily cursing his fate nevertheless he read and studied widely and after his position with temple grew unbearable quarrelled with his patron took orders and entered the church of england some years later we find him settled in the little church of laracor ireland a country which he disliked intensely but whither he went because no other living was open to him in ireland faithful to his church duties swift labored to better the condition of the unhappy people around him never before had the poor of his parishes been so well cared for but swift chafed under his yoke growing more and more irritated as he saw small men advance to large positions while he remained unnoticed in a little country church largely because he was too proud and too blunt with those who might have advanced him while at laracor he finished his tale of a tub a satire on the various churches of the day which was published in london with the battle of the books in seventeen o four the work brought him into notice as the most powerful satirist of the age and he soon gave up his church to enter the strife of political politics the cheap pamphlet was then the most powerful political weapon known and as swift had no equal at pamphlet writing he soon became a veritable dictator for several years especially from seventeen ten to seventeen thirteen swift was one of the most important figures in london the whigs feared the lash of his satire the tories feared to lose his support he was courted flattered cajoled on every side but the use he made of his new power is sad to contemplate an unbearable arrogance took possession of him lords statesmen even ladies were compelled to sue for his favor and to apologize for every fancied slight to his egoism it is at this time that he writes in his journal to stella mr secretary told me the duke of buckingham had been talking much about me and desired my acquaintance i answered it could not be for he had not yet made sufficient advances then shrewsbury said he thought the duke was not used to making advances i said i could not help that for i always expected advances in proportion to men's quality and more from a duke than any other man writing to the duchess of queensbury he says i am glad you know your duty 
for it has been a known and established rule above twenty years in england that the first advances have been constantly made me by all ladies who aspire to my acquaintance and the greater their quality the greater were their advances when the tories went out of power swift's position became uncertain he expected and had probably been promised a bishopric in england with a seat among the peers of the realm but the tories offered him instead the place of dean of st patrick's cathedral in dublin it was galling to a man of his proud spirit but after his merciless satire on religion in the tale of a tub any ecclesiastical position in england was rendered impossible dublin was the best he could get and he accepted it bitterly once more cursing the fate which he had brought upon himself with his return to ireland begins the last act in the tragedy of his life his best-known literary work gulliver's travels was done here but the bitterness of life grew slowly to insanity and a frightful personal sorrow of which he never spoke reached its climax in the death of esther johnson a beautiful young woman who had loved swift ever since the two had met in temple's household and to whom he had written his journal to stella during the last years of his life a brain disease of which he had shown frequent symptoms fastened its terrible hold upon swift and he became by turns an idiot and a madman he died in seventeen forty five and when his will was opened it was found that he had left all his property to found st patrick's asylum for lunatics and incurables it stands to-day as the most suggestive monument of his peculiar genius the works of swift from swift's life one can readily foresee the kind of literature he will produce taken together his works are a monstrous satire on humanity and the spirit of that satire is shown clearly in a little incident of his first days in london there was in the city at that time a certain astrologer named partridge who duped the public by calculating nativities from the stars and selling a yearly almanac predicting future events swift who hated all shams wrote with a great show of learning his famous bickerstaff almanac containing predictions for the year seventeen o eight as determined by the unerring stars as swift rarely signed his name to any literary work letting it stand or fall on its own merits his burlesque appeared over the pseudonym of isaac bickerstaff a name afterwards made famous by steele in the tatler among the predictions was the following my first prediction is but a trifle yet i will mention it to show how ignorant these sottish pretenders to astrology are in their own concerns it relates to partridge the almanac maker i have consulted the star of his nativity by my own rules and find he will infallibly die upon the twenty ninth of march next about eleven at night of a raging fever therefore i advise him to consider of it and settle his affairs in time on march thirtieth the day after the prediction was to be fulfilled there appeared in the newspapers a letter from a revenue officer giving the details of partridge's death with the doings of the bailiff and the coffin maker and on the following morning appeared an elaborate elegy of mr partridge when poor partridge who suddenly found himself without customers published a denial of the burial swift answered with an elaborate vindication of isaac bickerstaff in which he proved by astrological rules that partridge was dead and that the man now in his place was an impostor trying to cheat the heirs out of their inheritance character of swift's satire this ferocious joke is suggestive of all swift's satires against any case of hypocrisy or injustice he sets up a remedy of precisely the same kind only more atrocious and defends his plan with such seriousness that the satire overwhelms the reader with a sense of monstrous falsity 
thus his solemn argument to prove that the abolishing of christianity may be attended with some inconveniences is such a frightful satire upon the abuses of christianity by its professed followers that it is impossible for us to say whether swift intended to point out needed reforms or to satisfy his conscience note it is only fair to point out that swift wrote this and two other pamphlets on religion at a time when he knew that they would damage if not destroy his own prospects of political advancement End of note or to perpetrate a joke on the church as he had done on poor partridge so also with his modest proposal concerning the children of ireland which sets up the proposition that poor irish farmers ought to raise children as dainties to be eaten like roast pigs on the tables of prosperous englishmen in this most characteristic work it is impossible to find swift or his motive the injustice under which ireland suffered her perversity in raising large families to certain poverty and the indifference of english politicians to her suffering and protests are all mercilessly portrayed but why that is still the unanswered problem of swift's life and writings tale of a tub swift's two greatest satires are his tale of a tub and gulliver's travels the tale began as a grim exposure of the alleged weaknesses of three principal forms of religious belief catholic lutheran and calvinist as opposed to the anglican but it ended in a satire upon all science and philosophy swift explains his whimsical title by the custom of mariners in throwing out a tub to a whale in order to occupy the monster's attention and divert it from an attack upon the ship which only proves how little swift knew of whales or sailors but let that pass his book is a tub thrown out to the enemies of church and state to keep them occupied from further attacks or criticism and the substance of the argument is that all churches and indeed all religion and science and statesmanship are errant hypocrisy the best known part of the book is the allegory of the old man who died and left a coat which is christian truth to each of his three sons peter martin and jack with minute directions for its care and use these three names stand for catholics lutherans and calvinists and the way in which the sons evade their father's will and change the fashion of their garment is part of the bitter satire upon all religious sects though it professes to defend the anglican church that institution fares perhaps worse than the others for nothing is left to her but a thin cloak of custom under which to hide her alleged hypocrisy gulliver's travels in gulliver's travels the satire grows more unbearable strangely enough this book upon which swift's literary fame generally rests was not written from any literary motive but rather as an outlet for the author's own bitterness against fate and human society it is still read with pleasure as robinson crusoe is read for the interesting adventures of the hero and fortunately those who read it generally overlook its degrading influence and motive gulliver's travels records the pretended four voyages of one lemuel gulliver and his adventures in four astounding countries the first book tells of his voyage and shipwreck in lilliput where the inhabitants are about as tall as one's thumb and all their acts and motives are on the same dwarfish scale in the petty quarrels of these dwarfs we are supposed to see the littleness of humanity the statesmen who obtain place and favor by cutting monkey capers on the tight-rope before their sovereign and the two great parties the little indians and big indians who plunge the country into civil war over the momentous question of whether an egg should be broken on its big or its little end are satires on the politics of swift's own day and generation 
the style is simple and convincing the surprising situations and adventures are as absorbing as those of defoe's masterpiece and altogether it is the most interesting of swift's satires on the second voyage gulliver is abandoned in brobdingnag where the inhabitants are giants and everything is done upon an enormous scale the meanness of humanity seems all the more detestable in view of the greatness of these superior beings when gulliver tells about his own people their ambitions and wars and conquests the giants can only wonder that such great venom could exist in such little insects in the third voyage gulliver continues his adventures in laputa and this is a satire upon all the scientists and philosophers laputa is a flying island held up in the air by a lodestone and all the professors of the famous academy at lagado are of the same airy constitution the philosopher who worked eight years to extract sunshine from cucumbers is typical of swift's satiric treatment of all scientific problems it is in this voyage that we hear of the struhlbrugs a ghastly race of men who are doomed to live upon earth after losing hope and desire for life the picture is all the more terrible in view of the last years of swift's own life in which he was compelled to live on a burden to himself and his friends in these three voyages the evident purpose is to strip off the veil of habit and custom with which men deceive themselves and show the crude vices of humanity as swift fancies he sees them in the fourth voyage the merciless satire is carried out to its logical conclusion this brings us to the land of the huinums in which horses superior and intelligent creatures are the ruling animals all our interest however is centred on the yahoos a frightful race having the form and appearance of men but living in unspeakable degradation miscellaneous works the journal to stella written chiefly in the years seventeen ten seventeen thirteen for the benefit of esther johnson is interesting to us for two reasons it is first an excellent commentary on contemporary characters and political events by one of the most powerful and original minds of the age and second in its love passages and purely personal descriptions it gives us the best picture we possess of swift himself at the summit of his power and influence as we read now its words of tenderness for the woman who loved him and who brought almost the only ray of sunlight into his life we can only wonder and be silent entirely different are his drapier's letters a model of political harangue and of popular argument which roused an unthinking english public and did much benefit to ireland by preventing the politician's plan of debasing the irish coinage swift's poems though vigorous and original like defoe's of the same period are generally satirical often coarse and seldom rise above doggerel unlike his friend addison swift saw in the growing polish and decency of society only a mask for hypocrisy and he often used his verse to shock the newborn modesty by pointing out some native ugliness which his diseased mind discovered under every beautiful exterior character of swift's prose that swift is the most original writer of his time and one of the greatest masters of english prose is undeniable directness vigor simplicity mark every page among writers of that age he stands almost alone in his disdain of literary effects keeping his objects steadily before him he drives straight on to the end with a convincing power that has never been surpassed in our language even in his most grotesque creations the reader never loses the sense of reality of being present as an eye-witness of the most impossible events so powerful and convincing is swift's prose defoe had the same power but in writing robinson crusoe for instance his task was comparatively easy since his hero and his adventures were both natural 
while swift gives reality to pygmies giants and the most impossible situations as easily as if he were writing of facts notwithstanding these excellent qualities the ordinary reader will do well to confine himself to gulliver's travels and a book of well-chosen selections for it must be confessed the bulk of swift's work is not wholesome reading it is too terribly satiric and destructive it emphasizes the faults and failings of humanity and so runs counter to the general course of our literature which from cunewulf to tennyson follows the ideal as merlin followed the gleam note see tennyson's merlin and the gleam end of note and is not satisfied till the hidden beauty of man's soul and the divine purpose of his struggle are manifest end of section thirty section thirty one of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued joseph addison sixteen seventy two seventeen nineteen in the pleasant art of living with one's fellows addison is easily a master it is due to his perfect expression of that art of that new social life which as we have noted was characteristic of the age of anne that addison occupies such a large place in the history of literature of less power and originality than swift he nevertheless wields and deserves to wield a more lasting influence swift is the storm roaring against the ice and frost of the late spring of english life addison is the sunshine which melts the ice and dries the mud and makes the earth thrill with light and hope like swift he despised shams but unlike him he never lost faith in humanity and in all his satires there is a gentle kindliness which makes one think better of his fellow-men even while he laughs at their little vanities addison's influence two things addison did for our literature which are of inestimable value first he overcame a certain corrupt tendency bequeathed by restoration literature it was the apparent aim of the low drama and even of much of the poetry of that age to make virtue ridiculous and vice attractive addison set himself squarely against this unworthy tendency to strip off the mask of vice to show its ugliness and deformity but to reveal virtue in its own native loveliness that was addison's purpose and he succeeded so well that never since his day has our english literature seriously followed after false gods as macaulay says so effectually did he retort on vice the mockery which had recently been directed against virtue that since his time the open violation of decency has always been considered amongst us a sure mark of a fool and second prompted and aided by the more original genius of his friend steele addison seized upon the new social life of the clubs and made it the subject of endless pleasant essays upon types of men and manners the tatler and the spectator are the beginning of the modern essay and their studies of human character as exemplified by sir roger de coverley are a preparation for the modern novel life addison's life like his writings is in marked contrast to that of swift he was born in milston wiltshire in sixteen seventy two his father was a scholarly english clergyman and all his life addison followed naturally the quiet and cultured ways to which he was early accustomed at the famous charterhouse school in london and in his university life at oxford he excelled in character and scholarship and became known as a writer of graceful verses he had some intention at one time of entering the church but was easily persuaded by his friends to take up the government service instead unlike swift who abused his political superiors addison took the more tactful way of winning the friendship of men in large places 
his lines to dryden won that literary leader's instant favor and one of his latin poems the peace of ryswick sixteen ninety seven with its kindly appreciation of king william's statesmen brought him into favorable political notice it brought him also a pension of three hundred pounds a year with a suggestion that he travel abroad and cultivate the art of diplomacy which he promptly did to his own great advantage from a literary viewpoint the most interesting work of addison's early life is his account of the greatest english poets sixteen ninety three written while he was a fellow of oxford university one rubs his eyes to find dryden lavishly praised spenser excused or patronized while shakespeare is not even mentioned but addison was writing under boileau's classic rules and the poet like the age was perhaps too artificial to appreciate natural genius while he was traveling abroad the death of william and the loss of power by the whigs suddenly stopped addison's pension necessity brought him home and for a time he lived in poverty and obscurity then occurred the battle of blenheim and in the effort to find a poet to celebrate the event addison was brought to the tories attention his poem the campaign celebrating the victory took the country by storm instead of making the hero slay his thousands and ten thousands like the old epic heroes addison had some sense of what is required in a modern general and so made marlborough direct the battle from the outside comparing him to an angel riding on the whirlwind twas then great marlborough's mighty soul was proved that in the shock of charging hosts unmoved amidst confusion horror and despair examined all the dreadful scenes of war in peaceful thought the field of death surveyed to fainting squadrons sent in timely aid inspired repulsed battalions to engage and taught the doubtful battle where to rage so when an angel by divine command with rising tempest shakes a guilty land such as of late o'er pale britannia's past calm and serene he drives the furious blast and pleased the almighty's orders to perform rides in the whirlwind and directs the storm that one doubtful simile made addison's fortune never before or since was a poet's mechanical work so well rewarded it was called the finest thing ever written and from that day addison rose steadily in political favor and office he became in turn under-secretary member of parliament secretary for ireland and finally secretary of state probably no other literary man aided by his pen alone ever rose so rapidly and so high in office the rest of addison's life was divided between political duties and literature his essays for the tatler and spectator which we still cherish were written between seventeen o nine and seventeen fourteen but he won more literary fame by his classic tragedy cato which we have almost forgotten in seventeen sixteen he married a widow the countess of warwick and went to live at her home the famous holland house his married life lasted only three years and was probably not a happy one certainly he never wrote of women except with gentle satire and he became more and more a club man spending most of his time in the clubs and coffee-houses of london up to this time his life had been singularly peaceful but his last years were shadowed by quarrels first with pope then with swift and finally with his lifelong friend steele the first quarrel was on literary grounds and was largely the result of pope's jealousy the latter's venomous caricature of addison as atticus shows how he took his petty revenge on a great and good man who had been his friend the other quarrels with swift and especially with his old friend steele were the unfortunate result of political differences and show how impossible it is to mingle literary ideals with party politics he died serenely in seventeen nineteen a brief description from thackeray's english humorous is his best epitaph 
a life prosperous and beautiful a calm death an immense fame and affection afterwards for his happy and spotless name the essays works of addison the most enduring of addison's works are his famous essays collected from the tatler and spectator we have spoken of him as a master of the art of gentle living and these essays are a perpetual inducement to others to know and to practice the same fine art to an age of fundamental coarseness and artificiality he came with a wholesome message of refinement and simplicity much as ruskin and arnold spoke to a later age of materialism only addison's success was greater than theirs because of his greater knowledge of life and his greater faith in men he attacks all the little vanities and all the big vices of his time not in swift's terrible way which makes us feel hopeless of humanity but with a kindly ridicule and gentle humor which takes speedy improvement for granted to read swift's brutal letters to a young lady and then to read addison's dissection of a beau's head and his dissection of a coquette's heart is to know at once the secret of the latter's more enduring influence three other results of these delightful essays are worthy of attention first they are the best picture we possess of the new social life of england with its many new interests second they advanced the art of literary criticism to a much higher stage than it had ever before reached and however much we differ from their judgment and their interpretation of such a man as milton they certainly led englishmen to a better knowledge and appreciation of their own literature and finally in ned softly the literary dabbler will wimble the poor relation sir andrew freeport the merchant will honeycomb the fop and sir roger the country gentleman they give us characters that live forever as part of that goodly company which extends from chaucer's country parson to kipling's mulvaney addison and steele not only introduced the modern essay but in such characters as these they herald the dawn of the modern novel of all his essays the best known and loved are those which introduce us to sir roger de coverley the genial dictator of life and manners in the quiet english country addison's style in style these essays are remarkable as showing the growing perfection of the english language johnson says whoever wishes to attain an english style familiar but not coarse and elegant but not ostentatious must give his days and nights to the volumes of addison and again he says give nights and days sir to the study of addison if you mean to be a good writer or what is more worth an honest man that was good criticism for its day and even at the present time critics are agreed that addison's essays are well worth reading once for their own sake and many times for their influence in shaping a clear and graceful style of writing poems addison's poems which were enormously popular in his day are now seldom read his cato with its classic unities and lack of dramatic power must be regarded as a failure if we study it as tragedy but it offers an excellent example of the rhetoric and fine sentiment which were then considered the essentials of good writing the best scene from this tragedy is the fifth act where cato soliloquizes with plato's immortality of the soul open in his hand and a drawn sword on the table before him it must be so plato thou reasonst well else whence this pleasing hope this fond desire this longing after immortality or whence this secret dread and inward horror of falling into naught why shrinks the soul back on herself and startles at destruction tis the divinity that stirs within us tis heaven itself that points out an hereafter and intimates eternity to man many readers make frequent use of one portion of addison's poetry without knowing to whom they are indebted 
his devout nature found expression in many hymns a few of which are still used and loved in our churches many a congregation thrills as thackeray did to the splendid sweep of his god in nature beginning the spacious firmament on high almost as well known and loved are his traveller's hymn and his continued help beginning when all thy mercies o my god the latter hymn written in a storm at sea off the italian coast when the captain and crew were demoralized by terror shows that poetry especially a good hymn that one can sing in the same spirit as one would say his prayers is sometimes the most practical and helpful thing in the world richard steele sixteen seventy two seventeen twenty nine steele was in almost every respect the antithesis of his friend and fellow worker a rollicking good-hearted emotional lovable irishman at the charterhouse school and at oxford he shared everything with addison asking nothing but love in return unlike addison he studied but little and left the university to enter the horse guards he was in turn soldier captain poet playwright essayist member of parliament manager of a theatre publisher of a newspaper and twenty other things all of which he began joyously and then abandoned sometimes against his will as when he was expelled from parliament and again because some other interest of the moment had more attraction his poems and plays are now little known but the reader who searches them out will find one or two suggestive things about steele himself for instance he loves children and he is one of the few writers of his time who show a sincere and unswerving respect for womanhood even more than addison he ridicules vice and makes virtue lovely he is the originator of the tatler and joins with addison in creating the spectator the two periodicals which in the short space of less than four years did more to influence subsequent literature than all other magazines of the century combined moreover he is the original genius of sir roger and of many other characters and essays for which addison usually receives the whole credit it is often impossible in the tatler essays to separate the work of the two men but the majority of critics hold that the more original parts the characters the thought the overflowing kindliness are largely steele's creation while to addison fell the work of polishing and perfecting the essays and of adding that touch of humor which made them the most welcome literary visitors that england had ever received the tatler and the spectator on account of his talent in writing political pamphlets steele was awarded the position of official gazetteer while in this position and writing for several small newspapers the idea occurred to steele to publish a paper which should contain not only the political news but also the gossip of the clubs and coffee-houses with some light essays on the life and manners of the age the immediate result for steele never let an idea remain idle was the famous tatler the first number of which appeared april twelfth seventeen o nine it was a small folio sheet appearing on post days three times a week and it sold for a penny a copy that it had a serious purpose is evident from this dedication to the first volume of collected tatler essays the general purpose of this paper is to expose the false arts of life to pull off the disguises of cunning vanity and affectation and to recommend a general simplicity in our dress our discourse and our behavior the success of this unheard-of combination of news gossip and essay was instantaneous not a club or a coffee-house in london could afford to be without it and over its pages began the first general interest in contemporary english life as expressed in literature steele at first wrote the entire paper and signed his essays with the name of isaac bickerstaff which had been made famous by swift a few years before addison is said to have soon recognized one of his own remarks to steele and the secret of the authorship was out 
From that time Addison was a regular contributor, and occasionally other writers added essays on the new social life of England. Note. Of the Tatler essays, Addison contributed 42. 36 others were written in collaboration with Steele, while at least 180 are the works of Steele alone. End of note steele lost his position as gazetteer and the tatler was discontinued after less than two years life but not till it won an astonishing popularity and made ready its way for its successor two months later on march the first seventeen eleven appeared the first number of the spectator in the new magazine politics and news as such were ignored it was a literary magazine pure and simple and its entire contents consisted of a single light essay it was considered a crazy venture at the time but its instant success proved that men were eager for some literary expression of the new social ideals the following whimsical letter to the editor may serve to indicate the part played by the spectator in the daily life of london mr spectator your paper is a part of my tea equipage and my servant knows my humor so well that in calling for my breakfast this morning it being past my usual hour she answered the spectator was not yet come in but the tea-kettle boiled and she expected it every moment it is in the incomparable spectator papers that addison shows himself most worthy to be remembered he contributed the majority of its essays and in its first number appears this description of the spectator by which name addison is now generally known there is no place of general resort wherein i do not often make my appearance sometimes i am seen thrusting my head into a round of politician at wills in brackets coffee-house and listening with great attention to the narratives that are made in those little circular audiences sometimes i smoke a pipe at child's and whilst i seem attentive to nothing but the postman overhear the conversation of every table in the room i appear on sunday nights at st james and sometimes join the little committee of politics in the inner room as one who comes to hear and improve my face is likewise very well known at the grecian the cocoa tree and in the theatres of both drury lane and the haymarket i have been taken for a merchant upon the exchange for above these ten years and sometimes pass for a jew in the assembly of stock jobbers at jonathan's thus i live in the world rather as a spectator of mankind than as one of the species which is the character i intend to preserve in this paper the large place which these two little magazines hold in our literature seems most disproportionate to their short span of days in the short space of four years in which addison and steele worked together the light essay was established as one of the most important forms of modern literature and the literary magazine won its place as the expression of the social life of a nation End of section thirty one Section 32 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 continued. Samuel Johnson, 1709-1784. The reader of Boswell's Johnson, after listening to endless grumblings and watching the clumsy actions of the hero, often finds himself wondering why he should end his reading with a profound respect for this old bear who is the object of boswell's grovelling attention here is a man who was certainly not the greatest writer of his age perhaps not even a great writer at all but who was nevertheless the dictator of english letters and who still looms across the centuries of a magnificent literature as its most striking and original figure 
here moreover is a huge fat awkward man of vulgar manners and appearance who monopolizes conversation argues violently abuses everybody clubs down opposition madam speaking to his cultivated hostess at table talk no more nonsense sir turning to a distinguished guest i perceive you are a vile whig while talking he makes curious animal sounds sometimes giving a half whistle sometimes clucking like a hen and when he has concluded a violent dispute and laid his opponents low by dogmatism or ridicule he leans back to blow out his breath like a whale and gulp down numberless cups of hot tea yet this curious dictator of an elegant age was a veritable lion much sought after by society and around him in his own poor house gathered the foremost artists scholars actors and literary men of london all honoring the man loving him and listening to his dogmatism as the greeks listened to the voice of their oracle what is the secret of this astounding spectacle if the reader turns naturally to johnson's works for an explanation he will be disappointed reading his verses we find nothing to delight or inspire us but rather gloom and pessimism with a few moral observations in rhymed couplets but scarce observe the knowing and the bold fall in the general massacre of gold wide wasting pest that rages unconfined and crowds with crimes the records of mankind for gold his sword the hireling ruffian draws for gold the hireling judge distorts the laws wealth heaped on wealth nor truth nor safety buys the dangers gather as the treasures rise that is excellent common sense but it is not poetry and it is not necessary to hunt through johnson's bulky volumes for the information since any moralist can give us off-hand the same doctrine as for his rambler essays once so successful though we marvel at the big words the carefully balanced sentences the classical allusions one might as well try to get interested in an old-fashioned three-hour sermon we read a few pages listlessly yawn and go to bed since the man's work fails to account for his leadership and influence we examine his personality and here everything is interesting because of a few oft-quoted passages from boswell's biography johnson appears to us as an eccentric bear who amuses us by his growlings and clumsy antics but there is another johnson a brave patient kindly religious soul who as goldsmith said had nothing of the bear but his skin a man who battled like a hero against poverty and pain and melancholy and the awful fear of death and who overcame them manfully that trouble passed away so will this sang the sorrowing deor in the first old anglo-saxon lyric and that expresses the great and suffering spirit of johnson who in the face of enormous obstacles never lost faith in god or in himself though he was a reactionary in politics upholding the arbitrary power of kings and opposing the growing liberty of the people yet his political theories like his manners were no deeper than his skin for in all london there was none more kind to the wretched and none more ready to extend an open hand to every struggling man and woman who crossed his path when he passed poor homeless arabs sleeping in the streets he would slip a coin into their hands in order that they might have a happy awakening for he himself well knew what it meant to be hungry such was johnson a mass of genuine manhood as carlyle called him and as such men loved and honored him Note, a very lovable side of johnson's nature is shown by his doing penance in the public market-place for his unfilial conduct as a boy see in hawthorne's our old home the article on lickfield and johnson 
his sterling manhood is recalled in his famous letter to lord chesterfield refusing the latter's patronage for the dictionary the student should read this incident entire in boswell's life of johnson End of note life of johnson johnson was born in lickfield stratfordshire in seventeen o nine he was the son of a small bookseller a poor man but intelligent and fond of literature as booksellers invariably were in the good days when every town had its bookshop from his childhood johnson had to struggle against physical deformity and disease and the consequent disinclination to hard work he prepared for the university partly in the schools but largely by omnivorous reading in his father's shop and when he entered oxford he had read more classical authors than had most of the graduates before finishing his course he had to leave the university on account of his poverty and at once he began his long struggle as a hack writer to earn his living at twenty-five years he married a woman old enough to be his mother a genuine love match he called it and with her dowry of eight hundred pounds they started a private school together which was a dismal failure then without money or influential friends he left his home and wife in lickfield and tramped to london accompanied only by david garrick afterwards the famous actor who had been one of his pupils here led by old associations johnson made himself known to the booksellers and now and then earned a penny by writing prefaces reviews and translations it was a dog's life indeed that he led there with his literary brethren many of the writers of the day who are ridiculed in pope's heartless dunciad having no wealthy patrons to support them lived largely in the streets and taverns sleeping on an ash heap or under a wharf like rats glad of a crust and happy over a single meal which enabled them to work for a while without the reminder of hunger a few favored ones lived in wretched lodgings in grub street which has since become a synonym for the fortunes of struggling writers note in johnson's dictionary we find this definition grub street the name of a street in london much inhabited by writers of small histories dictionaries and temporary poems whence any mean production is called grub street End of note often johnson tells us he walked the streets all night long in dreary weather when it was too cold to sleep without food or shelter but he wrote steadily for the booksellers and for the gentleman's magazine and presently he became known in london and received enough work to earn a bare living the works which occasioned this small success were his poem london and his life of the poet savage a wretched life at best which were perhaps better left without a biographer but his success was genuine though small and presently the booksellers of london are coming to him to ask him to write a dictionary of the english language it was an enormous work taking nearly eight years of his time and long before he had finished it he had eaten up the money which he received for his labor in the leisure intervals of this work he wrote the vanity of human wishes and other poems and finished his classic tragedy of irene led by the great success of the spectator johnson started two magazines the rambler seventeen fifty seventeen fifty two and the idler seventeen fifty eight seventeen sixty later the rambler essays were published in book form and ran rapidly through ten editions but the financial returns were small and johnson spent a large part of his earnings in charity when his mother died in seventeen fifty nine johnson although one of the best-known men in london had no money and hurriedly finished rasselas his only romance in order it is said to pay for his mother's burial it was not till seventeen sixty two when johnson was fifty-three years old that his literary labors were rewarded in the usual way by royalty and he received from george the third a yearly pension of three hundred pounds 
then began a little sunshine in his life with joshua reynolds the artist he founded the famous literary club of which burke pitt fox gibbon goldsmith and indeed all the great literary men and politicians of the time were members this is the period of johnson's famous conversations which were caught in minutest detail by boswell and given to the world his idea of conversation as shown in a hundred places in boswell is to overcome your adversary at any cost to knock him down by arguments or when these fail by personal ridicule to dogmatize on every possible question pronounce a few oracles and then desist with an air of victory concerning the philosopher hume's view of death he says sir if he really thinks so his perceptions are disturbed he is mad if he does not think so he lies exit opposition there is nothing more to be said curiously enough it is often the palpable blunders of these monologues that now attract us as if we were enjoying a good joke at the dictator's expense once a lady asked him dr johnson why did you define pastern as the knee of a horse ignorance madam pure ignorance thundered the great authority when seventy years of age johnson was visited by several booksellers of the city who were about to bring out a new edition of the english poets and who wanted johnson as the leading literary man of london to write the prefaces to the several volumes the result was his lives of the poets as it is now known and this is his last literary work he died in his poor fleet street house in seventeen eighty four and was buried among england's honored poets in westminster abbey the english dictionary johnson's works a book says dr johnson should help us either to enjoy life or to endure it judged by this standard one is puzzled what to recommend among johnson's numerous books the two things which belong among the things worthy to be remembered are his dictionary and his lives of the poets though both these are valuable not as literature but rather as a study of literature the dictionary as the first ambitious attempt at an english lexicon is extremely valuable notwithstanding the fact that his derivations are often faulty and that he frequently exercises his humor or prejudice in his curious definitions in defining oats for example as a grain given in england to horses and in scotland to the people he indulges his prejudice against the scotch whom he never understood just as in his definition of pension he takes occasion to rap the writers who had flattered their patrons since the days of elizabeth though he afterwards accepted a comfortable pension for himself with characteristic honesty he refused to alter his definition in subsequent editions of the dictionary lives of the poets the lives of the poets are the simplest and most readable of his literary works for ten years before beginning these biographies he had given himself up to conversation and the ponderous style of his rambler essays here gives way to lighter and more natural expression as criticisms they are often misleading giving praise to artificial poets like cowley and pope and doing scant justice or abundant injustice to nobler poets like gray and milton and they are not to be compared with those found in thomas wharton's history of english poetry which was published in the same generation as biographies however they are excellent reading and we owe to them some of our best-known pictures of the early english poets poems and essays of johnson's poems the reader will have enough if he glances over the vanity of human wishes his only story rasselas prince of abyssinia is a matter of rhetoric rather than of romance but is interesting still to the reader who wants to hear johnson's personal views on society philosophy and religion 
any one of his essays like that on reading or the pernicious effects of reverie will be enough to acquaint the reader with the johnsonese style which was once much admired and copied by orators but which happily has been replaced by a more natural way of speaking most of his works it must be confessed are rather tiresome it is not to his books but rather to the picture of the man himself as given by boswell that johnson owes his great place in our literature boswell's life of johnson in james boswell seventeen forty seventeen ninety five we have another extraordinary figure a shallow little scotch barrister who trots about like a dog at the heels of his big master frantic at a caress and grovelling at a cuff and abundantly contented if only he can be near him and record his oracles all his life long boswell's one ambition seems to have been to shine in the reflected glory of great men and his chief task to record their sayings and doings when he came to london at twenty-two years of age johnson then at the beginning of his great fame was to this insatiable little glory-seeker like a silver doctor to a hungry trout he sought an introduction as a man seeks gold haunted every place where johnson declaimed until in davies bookstore the supreme opportunity came this is his record of the great event i was much agitated says boswell and recollecting his prejudice against the scotch of which i had heard much i said to davies don't tell him where i come from from scotland cries davies roguishly mr johnson said i i do indeed come from scotland and i cannot help it that sir cried johnson i find is what a very great many of your countrymen cannot help this stroke stunned me a good deal and when we had sat down i felt myself not a little embarrassed and apprehensive of what might come next then for several years with a persistency that no rebuffs could abate and with a thick skin that no amount of ridicule could render sensitive he follows johnson forces his way into the literary club where he is not welcome in order to be near his idol carries him off on a visit to the hebrides talks with him on every possible occasion and when he is not invited to a feast waits outside the house or tavern in order to walk home with his master in the thick fog of the early morning and the moment the oracle is out of sight and in bed boswell patters home to record in detail all that he has seen and heard it is to his minute record that we owe our only perfect picture of a great man all his vanity as well as his greatness his prejudices superstitions and even the details of his personal appearance there is the gigantic body the huge face seamed with the scars of disease the brown coat the black worsted stockings the gray wig with the scorched foretop the dirty hands the nails bitten and pared to the quick we see the eyes and mouth moving with convulsive twitches we see the heavy form rolling we hear it puffing and then comes up the why sir and the what then sir and the no sir and the you don't see your way through the question sir note from macaulay's review of boswell's life of johnson end of note to boswell's record we are indebted also for our knowledge of those famous conversations those wordy knock-down battles which made johnson famous in his time and which still move us to wonder here is a specimen conversation taken almost at random from a hundred such in boswell's incomparable biography after listening to johnson's prejudice against scotland and his dogmatic utterances on voltaire robertson and twenty others an unfortunate theorist brings up a recent essay on the possible future life of brutes quoting some possible authority from the sacred scriptures johnson who did not like to hear anything concerning a future state which was not authorized by the regular canons of orthodoxy discouraged this talk 
and being offended at its continuation he watched an opportunity to give the gentleman a blow of reprehension so when the poor speculatist with a serious metaphysical pensive face addressed him but really sir when we see a very sensible dog we don't know what to think of him johnson rolling with joy at the thought which beamed in his eye turned quickly round and replied true sir and when we see a very foolish fellow we don't know what to think of him he then rose up strided to the fire and stood for some time laughing and exulting then the oracle proceeds to talk of scorpions and natural history denying facts and demanding proofs which nobody could possibly furnish he seemed pleased to talk of natural philosophy that woodcocks said he fly over the northern countries is proved because they have been observed at sea swallows certainly sleep all the winter a number of them conglobulate together by flying round and round and then all in a heap throw themselves under water and lie in the bed of a river he told us one of his first essays was a latin poem upon the glowworm i am sorry i did not ask where it was to be found then follows an astonishing array of subjects and opinions he catalogues libraries settles affairs in china pronounces judgment on men who marry women superior to themselves flouts popular liberty hammers swift unmercifully and adds a few miscellaneous oracles most of which are about as reliable as his knowledge of the hibernation of swallows when i called upon dr johnson next morning i found him highly satisfied with his colloquial prowess the preceding evening well said he we had a good talk yes sir says i you tossed and gored several persons far from resenting this curious mental dictatorship his auditors never seem to weary they hang upon his words praise him flatter him repeat his judgments all over london the next day and return in the evening hungry for more whenever the conversation begins to flag boswell is like a woman with a parrot or like a man with a dancing bear he must excite the creature make him talk or dance for the edification of the company he sidles obsequiously towards his hero and with utter irrelevancy propounds a question of theology a social theory a fashion of dress or marriage a philosophical conundrum do you think sir that natural affections are born with us or sir if you were shut up in a castle and a newborn babe with you what would you do then follow more johnsonian laws judgments oracles the insatiable audience clusters around him and applauds while boswell listens with shining face and presently goes home to write the wonder down it is an astonishing spectacle one does not know whether to laugh or grieve over it but we know the man and the audience almost as well as if we had been there and that unconsciously is the superb art of this matchless biographer when johnson died the opportunity came for which boswell had been watching and waiting some twenty years he would shine in the world now not by reflection but by his own luminosity he gathered together his endless notes and records and began to write his biography but he did not hurry several biographies of johnson appeared in the four years after his death without disturbing boswell's perfect complacency after seven years labor he gave the world his life of johnson it is an immortal work praise is superfluous it must be read to be appreciated like the greek sculptors the little slave produced a more enduring work than the great master the man who reads it will know johnson as he knows no other man who dwells across the border and he will lack sensitiveness indeed if he lay down the work without a greater love and appreciation of all good literature End of section 32section thirty three of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued later augustan writers 
with johnson who succeeded dryden and pope in the chief place of english letters the classic movement had largely spent its force and the latter half of the eighteenth century gives us an imposing array of writers who differ so widely that it is almost impossible to classify them in general three schools of writers are noticeable first the classicists who under johnson's lead insisted upon elegance and regularity of style second the romantic poets like collins gray thompson and burns who revolted from pope's artificial couplets and wrote of nature and the human heart note many of the writers show a mingling of the classic and the romantic tendencies thus goldsmith followed johnson and opposed the romanticists but his deserted village is romantic in spirit though its classic couplets are almost as mechanical as pope's so burke's orations are elegantly classic in style but are illumined by bursts of emotion and romantic feeling End of note third the early novelists like defoe and fielding who introduced a new type of literature the romantic poets and the novelists are reserved for special chapters and of the other writers berkeley and hume in philosophy robertson hume and gibbon in history chesterfield and lady montagu in letter writing adam smith in economics pitt burke fox and a score of lesser writers in politics we select only two burke and gibbon whose works are most typical of the augustan i e the elegant classic style of prose writing edmund burke seventeen twenty nine seventeen ninety seven to read all of burke's collected works and so to understand him thoroughly is something of a task few are equal to it on the other hand to read selections here and there as most of us do is to get a wrong idea of the man and to join either in fulsome praise of his brilliant oratory or in honest confession that his periods are ponderous and his ideas often buried under johnsonian verbiage such are the contrasts to be found on successive pages of burke's twelve volumes which cover the enormous range of the political and economic thought of the age and which mingle fact and fancy philosophy statistics and brilliant flights of the imagination to a degree never before seen in english literature for burke belongs in spirit to the new romantic school while in style he is a model for the formal classicists we can only glance at the life of this marvelous irishman and then consider his place in our literature life burke was born in dublin the son of an irish barrister in seventeen twenty nine after his university course in trinity college he came to london to study law but soon gave up the idea to follow literature which in turn led him to politics he had the soul the imagination of a poet and the law was only a clog to his progress his two first works a vindication of natural society and the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful brought him political as well as literary recognition and several small offices were in turn given to him when thirty-six years old he was elected to parliament as member from wendover and for the next thirty years he was the foremost figure in the house of commons and the most eloquent orator which that body has ever known pure and incorruptible in his politics as in his personal life no more learned or devoted servant of the commonwealth ever pleaded for justice and human liberty he was at the summit of his influence at the time when the colonies were struggling for independence and the fact that he championed their cause in one of his greatest speeches on conciliation with america gives him an added interest in the eyes of american readers his championship of america is all the more remarkable from the fact that in other matters burke was far from liberal he set himself squarely against the teachings of the romantic writers who were enthusiastic over the french revolution 
he denounced the principles of the revolutionists broke with the liberal whig party to join the tories and was largely instrumental in bringing on the terrible war with france which resulted in the downfall of napoleon it is good to remember that in all the strife and bitterness of party politics burke held steadily to the noblest personal ideas of truth and honesty and that in all his work whether opposing the slave trade or pleading for justice for america or protecting the poor natives of india from the greed of corporations or setting himself against the popular sympathy for france in her desperate struggle he aimed solely at the welfare of humanity when he retired on a pension in seventeen ninety four he had won and he deserved the gratitude and affection of the whole nation works there are three distinctly marked periods in burke's career and these correspond closely to the years in which he was busied with the affairs of america india and france successively the first period was one of prophecy he had studied the history and temper of the american colonies and he warned england of the disaster which must follow her persistence in ignoring the american demands and especially the american spirit his great speeches on american taxation and on conciliation with america were delivered in seventeen seventy four and seventeen seventy five preceding the declaration of independence in this period burke's labors seemed all in vain he lost his cause and england her greatest colony the second period is one of denunciation rather than of prophecy england had won india but when burke studied the methods of her victory and understood the soulless way in which millions of poor natives were made to serve the interests of an english monopoly his soul rose in revolt and again he was the champion of an oppressed people his two greatest speeches of this period are the nabob of arcot's debts and his tremendous impeachment of warren hastings again he apparently lost his cause though he was still fighting on the side of right hastings was acquitted and the spoliation of india went on but the seeds of reform were sown and grew and bore fruit long after burke's labors were ended the third period is curiously enough one of reaction whether because the horrors of the french revolution had frightened him with the danger of popular liberty or because his own advance in office and power had made him side unconsciously with the upper classes is unknown that he was as sincere and noble now as in all his previous life is not questioned he broke with the liberal whigs and joined forces with the reactionary tories he opposed the romantic writers who were on fire with enthusiasm over the french revolution and thundered against the dangers which the revolutionary spirit must breed forgetting that it was a revolution which had made modern england possible here where we must judge him to have been mistaken in his cause he succeeded for the first time it was due largely to burke's influence that the growing sympathy for the french people was checked in england and war was declared which ended in the frightful victories of trafalgar and waterloo burke's best-known work of this period is his reflections on the french revolution which he polished and revised again and again before it was finally printed this ambitious literary essay though it met with remarkable success is a disappointment to the reader though of celtic blood burke did not understand the french or the principles for which the common people were fighting in their own way Note, a much more interesting work is thomas paine's rights of man which was written in answer to burke's essay and which had enormous influence in england and america End of note. and his denunciations and apostrophes to france suggest a preacher without humor hammering away at sinners who are not present in his congregation the essay has few illuminating ideas but a great deal of johnsonian rhetoric which make its periods tiresome notwithstanding our admiration for the brilliancy of its author 
more significant is one of burke's first essays a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful which is sometimes read in order to show the contrast in style with addison's spectator essays on the pleasures of the imagination burke's orations burke's best-known speeches on conciliation with america american taxation and the impeachment of warren hastings are still much studied in our schools as models of english prose and this fact tends to give them an exaggerated literary importance viewed purely as literature they have faults enough and the first of these so characteristic of the classic age is that they abound in fine rhetoric but lack simplicity Note in the same year seventeen seventy five in which burke's magnificent conciliation oration was delivered patrick henry made a remarkable little speech before a gathering of delegates in virginia both men were pleading the same cause of justice and were actuated by the same high ideals a very interesting contrast however may be drawn between the methods and the effects of henry's speech and of burke's more brilliant oration burke makes us wonder at his learning his brilliancy his eloquence but he does not move us to action patrick henry calls us and we spring to follow him that suggests the essential difference between the two orators End of note in a strict sense these eloquent speeches are not literature to delight the reader and to suggest ideas but studies in rhetoric and in mental concentration all this however is on the surface a careful study of any of these three famous speeches reveals certain admirable qualities which account for the important place they are given in the study of english first as showing the stateliness and the rhetorical power of our language these speeches are almost unrivaled second though burke speaks in prose he is essentially a poet whose imagery like that of milton's prose works is more remarkable than that of many of our writers of verse he speaks in figures images symbols and the musical cadence of his sentences reflects the influence of his wide reading of poetry not only in figurative expression but much more in spirit he belongs with the poets of the revival at times his language is pseudo-classic reflecting the influence of johnson and his school but his thought is always romantic he is governed by ideal rather than by practical interests and a profound sympathy for humanity is perhaps his most marked characteristic third the supreme object of these orations so different from the majority of political speeches is not to win approval or to gain votes but to establish the truth like our own lincoln burke had a superb faith in the compelling power of the truth a faith in men also who if the history of our race means anything will not willingly follow a lie the methods of these two great leaders are strikingly similar in this respect that each repeats his idea in many ways presenting the truth from different viewpoints so that it will appeal to men of widely different experiences otherwise the two men are in marked contrast the uneducated lincoln speaks in simple homely words draws his illustrations from the farm and often adds a humorous story so apt and telling that his hearers can never forget the point of his argument the scholarly burke speaks in ornate majestic periods and searches all history and all literature for his illustrations his wealth of imagery and allusions together with his rare combination of poetic and logical reasoning make these orations remarkable entirely apart from their subject and purpose fourth and perhaps most significant of the man and his work burke takes his stand squarely on the principle of justice he has studied history and he finds that to establish justice between man and man and between nation and nation has been the supreme object of every reformer since the world began no small or merely temporary success attracts him only the truth will suffice for an argument and nothing less than justice will ever settle a question permanently such is his platform simple as the golden rule unshakable as the moral law 
hence though he apparently fails of his immediate desire in each of these three orations the principle for which he contends cannot fail as a modern writer says of lincoln the full rich flood of his life through the nation's pulse is yet beating and his words are still potent in shaping the course of english politics in the way of justice edward gibbon seventeen thirty seven seventeen ninety four to understand burke or johnson one must read a multitude of books and be wary in his judgment but with gibbon the task is comparatively easy for one has only to consider two books his memoirs and the first volume of his history to understand the author in his memoirs we have an interesting reflection of gibbon's own personality a man who looks with satisfaction on the material side of things who seeks always the easiest path for himself and avoids life's difficulties and responsibilities i sighed as a lover but i obeyed as a son he says when to save his inheritance he gave up the woman he loved and came home to enjoy the paternal loaves and fishes that is suggestive of the man's whole life his history on the other hand is a remarkable work it was the first in our language to be written on scientific principles and with a solid base of fact and the style is the very climax of that classicism which had ruled england for an entire century its combination of historical fact and literary style makes the decline and fall of the roman empire the one thing of gibbon's life that is worthy to be remembered gibbon's history for many years gibbon had meditated like milton upon an immortal work and had tried several historical subjects only to give them up idly in his journal he tells us how his vague resolutions were brought to a focus it was at rome on the fifteenth of october seventeen sixty four as i sat musing amidst the ruins of the capital while the barefooted friars were singing vespers in the temple of jupiter that the idea of writing the decline and fall of the city first started to my mind twelve years later in seventeen seventy six gibbon published the first volume of the decline and fall of the roman empire and the enormous success of the work encouraged him to go on with the other five volumes which were published at intervals during the next twelve years the history begins with the reign of trajan in a d ninety eight and builds a straight roman road through the confused histories of thirteen centuries ending with the fall of the byzantine empire in fourteen fifty three the scope of the history is enormous it includes not only the decline of the roman empire but such movements as the descent of the northern barbarians the spread of christianity the reorganization of the european nations the establishment of the great eastern empire the rise of mohammedanism and the splendor of the crusades on the one hand it lacks philosophical insight being satisfied with facts without comprehending the causes and as gibbon seems lacking in ability to understand spiritual and religious movements it is utterly inadequate in its treatment of the tremendous influence of christianity on the other hand gibbon's scholarship leaves little to criticize he read enormously sifted his facts out of multitudes of books and records and then marshalled them in the imposing array with which we have grown familiar moreover he is singularly just and discriminating in the use of all documents and authorities at his command hence he has given us the first history in english that has borne successfully the test of modern research and scholarship the style of the work is as imposing as his great subject indeed with almost any other subject the sonorous roll of his majestic sentences would be out of place while it deserves all the adjectives that have been applied to it by enthusiastic admirers finished elegant splendid rounded massive sonorous copious elaborate ornate exhaustive 
it must be confessed though one whispers the confession that the style sometimes obscures our interest in the narrative as he sifted his facts from a multitude of sources so he often hides them again in endless periods and one must often sift them out again in order to be quite sure of even the simple facts another drawback is that gibbon is hopelessly worldly in his point of view he loves pageants and crowds rather than individuals and he is lacking in enthusiasm and in spiritual insight the result is so frankly material at times that one wonders if he is not reading of forces or machines rather than of human beings a little reading of his history here and there is an excellent thing leaving one impressed with the elegant classical style and the scholarship but a continued reading is very apt to leave us longing for simplicity for naturalness and above all for the glow of enthusiasm which makes the dead heroes live once more in the written pages this judgment however must not obscure the fact that the book had a remarkably large sale and that this of itself is an evidence that multitudes of readers found it not only erudite but readable and interesting End of section thirty three section thirty four of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued part two the revival of romantic poetry the old order changeth yielding place to new and god fulfils himself in many ways lest one good custom should corrupt the world tennyson's the passing of arthur the meaning of romanticism while dryden pope and johnson were successively the dictators of english letters and while under their leadership the heroic couplet became the fashion of poetry and literature in general became satiric or critical in spirit and formal in expression a new romantic movement quietly made its appearance thomson's the seasons seventeen thirty was the first noteworthy poem of the romantic revival and the poems and the poets increased steadily in number and importance till in the age of wordsworth and scott the spirit of romanticism dominated our literature more completely than classicism had ever done this romantic movement which victor hugo calls liberalism in literature is simply the expression of life as seen by imagination rather than by prosaic common sense which was the central doctrine of english philosophy in the eighteenth century it has six prominent characteristics which distinguish it from the so-called classic literature which we have just studied One the romantic movement was marked and is always marked by a strong reaction and protest against the bondage of rule and custom which in science and theology as well as in literature generally tend to fetter the free human spirit Two romanticism returned to nature and to plain humanity for its material and so is in marked contrast to classicism which had confined itself largely to the clubs and drawing-rooms and to the social and political life of london thomson's seasons whatever its defects was a revelation of the natural wealth and beauty which for nearly a century had been hardly noticed by the great writers of england Three, it brought again the dream of a golden age Note, the romantic revival is marked by renewed interest in medieval ideals and literature and to this interest is due the success of walpole's romance the castle of otranto and of chatterton's forgeries known as the rowley papers End of note in which the stern realities of life were forgotten and the ideals of youth were established as the only permanent realities for the dreamer lives for ever but the toiler dies in a day expresses perhaps only the wild fancy of a modern poet but when we think of it seriously the dreams and ideals of a people are cherished possessions long after their stone monuments have crumbled away and their battles are forgotten 
the romantic movement emphasized these eternal ideals of youth and appealed to the human heart as the classic elegance of dryden and pope could never do for romanticism was marked by intense human sympathy and by a consequent understanding of the human heart not to intellect or to science does the heart unlock its treasures but rather to the touch of a sympathetic nature and things that are hidden from the wise and prudent are revealed unto children pope had no appreciable humanity swift's work is a frightful satire addison delighted polite society but had no message for plain people while even johnson with all his kindness had no feeling for men in the mass but supported robert walpole in his policy of letting evils alone until forced by a revolution to take notice of humanity's appeal with the romantic revival all this was changed while howard was working heroically for prison reform and wilberforce for the liberation of the slaves gray wrote his short and simple annals of the poor and goldsmith his deserted village and cowper sang my ear is pained my soul is sick with every day's report of wrong and outrage with which earth is filled there is no flesh in man's obdurate heart it does not feel for man note from the task book two this sympathy for the poor and this cry against oppression grew stronger and stronger till it culminated in bobby burns who more than any other writer in any language is the poet of the unlettered human heart five the romantic movement was the expression of individual genius rather than of established rules in consequence the literature of the revival is as varied as the characters and moods of the different writers when we read pope for instance we have a general impression of sameness as if all his polished poems were made in the same machine but in the work of the best romanticists there is endless variety to read them is like passing through a new village meeting a score of different human types and finding in each one something to love or to remember nature and the heart of man are as new as if we had never studied them hence in reading the romanticists who went to these sources for their material we are seldom wearied but often surprised and the surprise is like that of the sunrise or the sea which always offers some new beauty and stirs us deeply as if we had never seen it before six the romantic movement while it followed its own genius was not altogether unguided strictly speaking there is no new movement either in history or in literature each grows out of some good thing which has preceded it and looks back with reverence to past masters spencer shakespeare and milton were the inspiration of the romantic revival and we can hardly read a poem of the early romanticists without finding a suggestion of the influence of one of these great leaders note see for instance phelps beginning of the romantic movement for a list of spencerian imitators from seventeen hundred to seventeen seventy five end of note there are various other characteristics of romanticism but these six the protest against the bondage of rules the return to nature and the human heart the interest in old sagas and medieval romances as suggestive of a heroic age the sympathy for the toilers of the world the emphasis upon the individual genius and the return to milton and the elizabethans instead of to pope and dryden for literary models are the most noticeable and the most interesting remembering them we shall better appreciate the work of the following writers who in varying degree illustrate the revival of romantic poetry in the eighteenth century thomas gray seventeen sixteen seventeen seventy one the curfew tolls the knell of parting day the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lay the ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me 
now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight and all the air a solemn stillness holds save where the beetle wheels his droning flight and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds so begins the best-known poem in the english language a poem full of the gentle melancholy which marks all early romantic poetry it should be read entire as a perfect model of its kind not even milton's il penseroso which it strongly suggests excels it in beauty and suggestiveness life of gray the author of the famous elegy is the most scholarly and well-balanced of all the early romantic poets in his youth he was a weakling and only one of twelve children who survived infancy and his unhappy childhood the tyranny of his father and the separation from his loved mother gave to his whole life the stamp of melancholy which is noticeable in all his poems at the famous eton school and again at cambridge he seems to have followed his own scholarly tastes rather than the curriculum and was shocked like gibbon at the general idleness and aimlessness of university life one happy result of his school life was his friendship for horace walpole who took him abroad for a three years tour of the continent no better index of the essential difference between the classical and the new romantic school can be imagined than that which is revealed in the letters of gray and addison as they record their impressions of foreign travel thus when addison crossed the alps some twenty-five years before in good weather he wrote a very troublesome journey you cannot imagine how i am pleased with the sight of a plain gray crossed the alps in the beginning of winter wrapped in muffs hoods and masks of beaver fur boots and bearskins but wrote ecstatically not a precipice not a torrent not a cliff but is pregnant with religion and poetry on his return to england gray lived for a short time at stoke pogis where he wrote his ode on eton and probably sketched his elegy which however was not finished till seventeen fifty eight years later during the latter years of his shy and scholarly life he was professor of modern history and languages at cambridge without any troublesome work of lecturing to students here he gave himself up to study and to poetry varying his work by prowlings among the manuscripts of the new british museum and by his lilliputian travels in england and scotland he died in his rooms at pembroke college in seventeen seventy one and was buried in the little churchyard of stoke poges works of gray gray's letters published in seventeen seventy five are excellent reading and his journal is still a model of natural description but it is to a single small volume of poems that he owes his fame and his place in literature these poems divide themselves naturally into three periods in which we may trace the progress of gray's emancipation from the classic rules which had so long governed english literature in the first period he wrote several minor poems of which the best are his hymn to adversity and the odes to spring and on a distant prospect of eton college these early poems reveal two suggestive things first the appearance of that melancholy which characterizes all the poetry of the period and second the study of nature not for its own beauty or truth but rather as a suitable background for the play of human emotions the second period shows the same tendencies more strongly developed the elegy written in a country churchyard seventeen fifty the most perfect poem of the age belongs to this period to read milton's il penseroso and gray's elegy is to see the beginning and the perfection of that literature of melancholy which largely occupied english poets for more than a century two other well-known poems of this second period are the pindaric odes the progress of poesy and the bard the first is strongly suggestive of dryden's alexander's feast but shows milton's influence in a greater melody and variety of expression 
the bard is in every way more romantic and original an old minstrel the last of the welsh singers halts king edward and his army in a wild mountain pass and with fine poetic frenzy prophesizes the terror and desolation which must ever follow the tyrant from its first line ruin seize thee ruthless king to the end when the old bard plunges from his lofty crag and disappears in the river's flood the poem thrills with the fire of an ancient and noble race of men it breaks absolutely with the classical school and proclaims a literary declaration of independence in the third period gray turns momentarily from his welsh material and reveals a new field of romantic interest in two norse poems the fatal sisters and the descent of odin seventeen sixty one gray translated his material from the latin and though these two poems lack much of the elemental strength and grandeur of the norse sagas they are remarkable for calling attention to the unused wealth of literary material that was hidden in northern mythology to gray and to percy who published his northern antiquities in seventeen seventy is due in large measure the profound interest in the old norse sagas which has continued to our own day taken together gray's works form a most interesting commentary on the varied life of the eighteenth century he was a scholar familiar with all the intellectual interests of his age and his work has much of the precision and polish of the classical school but he shares also the reawakened interest in nature in common man and in medieval culture and his work is generally romantic both in style and in spirit the same conflict between the classic and romantic schools and the triumph of romanticism is shown clearly in the most versatile of gray's contemporaries oliver goldsmith End of section thirty four section thirty five of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued oliver goldsmith seventeen twenty eight seventeen seventy four because the deserted village is one of the most familiar poems in our language goldsmith is generally given a high place among the poets of the romantic dawn but the village when we read it carefully turns out to be a rhymed essay in the style of pope's famous essay on man it owes its popularity to the sympathetic memories which it awakens rather than to its poetic excellence it is as a prose writer that goldsmith excels he is an essayist with addison's fine polish but with more sympathy for human life he is a dramatist one of the very few who have ever written a comedy that can keep its popularity unchanged while a century rolls over its head but greater perhaps than the poet and essayist and dramatist is goldsmith the novelist who set himself to the important work of purifying the early novel of its brutal and indecent tendencies and who has given us in the vicar of wakefield one of the most enduring characters in english fiction in his manner especially in his poetry goldsmith was too much influenced by his friend johnson and the classicists but in his matter in his sympathy for nature and human life he belongs unmistakably to the new romantic school altogether he is the most versatile the most charming the most inconsistent and the most lovable genius of all the literary men who made famous the age of johnson life goldsmith's career is that of an irresponsible unbalanced genius which would make one despair if the man himself did not remain so lovable in all his inconsistencies he was born in the village of palace ireland the son of a poor irish curate whose noble character is portrayed in dr primrose of the vicar of wakefield and in the country parson of the deserted village after an unsatisfactory course in various schools where he was regarded as hopelessly stupid goldsmith entered trinity college dublin as a sizer 
i e a student who pays with labor for his tuition by his escapades he was brought into disfavor with the authorities but that troubled him little he was also wretchedly poor which troubled him less for when he earned a few shillings by writing ballads for street singers his money went oftener to idle beggars than to the pain of his honest debts after three years of university life he ran away in dime novel fashion and nearly starved to death before he was found and brought back in disgrace then he worked a little and obtained his degree in seventeen forty nine strange that such an idle and irresponsible youth should have been urged by his family to take holy orders but such was the fact for two years more goldsmith labored with theology only to be rejected when he presented himself as a candidate for the ministry he tried teaching and failed then his fancy turned to america and provided with money and a good horse he started off for cork where he was to embark for the new world he loafed along the pleasant irish ways missed his ship and presently turned up cheerfully amongst his relatives minus all his money and riding a sorry nag called fiddleback for which he had traded his own on the way Note such is goldsmith's version of a somewhat suspicious adventure whose details are unknown End of note. he borrowed fifty pounds more and started for london to study law but speedily lost his money at cards and again appeared amiable and irresponsible as ever among his despairing relatives the next year they sent him to edinburgh to study medicine here for a couple of years he became popular as a singer of songs and a teller of tales to whom medicine was only a troublesome affliction suddenly the wanderlust seized him and he started abroad ostensibly to complete his medical education but in reality to wander like a cheerful beggar over europe singing and playing his flute for food and lodging he may have studied a little at leyden and at padua but that was only incidental after a year or more of vagabondage he returned to london with an alleged medical degree said to have been obtained at louvain or padua the next few years are a pitiful struggle to make a living as tutor apothecary's assistant comedian usher in a country school and finally as a physician in southwark gradually he drifted into literature and lived from hand to mouth by doing hack work for the london booksellers some of his essays and his citizen of the world seventeen sixty seventeen sixty one brought him to the attention of johnson who looked him up was attracted first by his poverty and then by his genius and presently declared him to be one of the first men we now have as an author johnson's friendship proved invaluable and presently goldsmith found himself a member of the exclusive literary club he promptly justified johnson's confidence by publishing the traveller seventeen sixty four which was hailed as one of the finest poems of the century money now came to him liberally with orders from the booksellers he took new quarters in fleet street and furnished them gorgeously but he had an inordinate vanity for bright colored clothes and faster than he earned money he spent it on velvet cloaks and in indiscriminate charity for a time he resumed his practice as a physician but his fine clothes did not bring patience as he expected and presently he turned to writing again to pay his debts to the booksellers he produced several superficial and grossly inaccurate school books like his animated nature and his histories of england greece and rome which brought him bread and more fine clothes and his vicar of wakefield the deserted village and she stoops to conquer which brought him undying fame after meeting with johnson goldsmith became the object of boswell's magpie curiosity and to boswell's life of johnson we are indebted for many of the details of goldsmith's life his homeliness his awkward ways his drolleries and absurdities which made him alternately the butt and the wit of the famous literary club 
boswell disliked goldsmith and so draws an unflattering portrait but even this does not disguise the contagious good humor which made men love him when in his forty-seventh year he fell sick of a fever and with childish confidence turned to a quack medicine to cure himself he died in seventeen seventy four and johnson placed a tablet with a sonorous latin epitaph in westminster abbey though goldsmith was buried elsewhere let not his frailties be remembered he was a very great man said johnson and the literary world which like that old dictator is kind enough at heart though often rough in its methods is glad to accept and record the verdict works of goldsmith of goldsmith's early essays and his later school histories little need be said they have settled into their own place far out of sight of the ordinary reader perhaps the most interesting of these is a series of letters for the public ledger afterwards published as the citizen of the world written from the viewpoint of an alleged chinese traveller and giving the latter's comments on english civilization note goldsmith's idea which was borrowed from walpole reappears in the pseudo letters from a chinese official which recently attracted considerable attention End of note the following five works are those upon which goldsmith's fame chiefly rests the traveller seventeen sixty four made goldsmith's reputation among his contemporaries but is now seldom read except by students who would understand how goldsmith was at one time dominated by johnson and his pseudo-classic ideals it is a long poem in rhymed couplets giving a survey and criticism of the social life of various countries in europe and reflects many of goldsmith's own wanderings and impressions the deserted village the deserted village seventeen seventy though written in the same mechanical style is so permeated with honest human sympathy and voices so perfectly the revolt of the individual man against institutions that a multitude of common people heard it gladly without consulting the critics as to whether they should call it good poetry notwithstanding its faults to which matthew arnold has called sufficient attention it has become one of our best-known poems though we cannot help wishing that the monotony of its couplets had been broken by some of the irish folk-songs and ballads that charmed street audiences in dublin and that brought goldsmith a welcome from the french peasants wherever he stopped to sing in the village parson and the schoolmaster goldsmith has increased chaucer's list by two lovable characters that will endure as long as the english language the criticism that the picture of prosperous sweet auburn never applied to any village in ireland is just no doubt but it is outside the question goldsmith was a hopeless dreamer bound to see everything as he saw his debts and his gay clothes in a purely idealistic way the good-natured man and she stoops to conquer are goldsmith's two comedies the former a comedy of character though it has some laughable scenes and one laughable character croker met with failure on the stage and has never been revived with any success the latter a comedy of intrigue is one of the few plays that has never lost its popularity its lively bustling scenes and its pleasantly absurd characters marlowe the hardcastles and tony lumpkin still hold the attention of modern theatre-goers and nearly every amateur dramatic club sooner or later places she stoops to conquer on its list of attractions the vicar of wakefield the vicar of wakefield is goldsmith's only novel and the first in any language that gives to home life an enduring romantic interest however much we admire the beginnings of the english novel to which we shall presently refer we are nevertheless shocked by its frequent brutalities and indecencies goldsmith like steele had the irish reverence for pure womanhood and this reverence made him shun as a pest the vulgarity and coarseness in which contemporary novelists like smollett and sterne seemed to delight 
he did for the novel what addison and steele had done for the satire and the essay he refined and elevated it making it worthy of the old anglo-saxon ideals which are our best literary heritage briefly the vicar of wakefield is a story of a simple english clergyman dr primrose and his family who pass from happiness through great tribulation misfortunes which are said never to come singly appear in this case in flocks but through poverty sorrow imprisonment and the unspeakable loss of his daughters the vicar's faith in god and man emerges triumphant to the very end he is like one of the old martyrs who sings alleluia while the lions roar about him and his children in the arena goldsmith's optimism it must be confessed is here stretched to the breaking point the reader is sometimes offered fine johnsonian phrases where he would naturally expect homely and vigorous language and he is continually haunted by the suspicion that even in this best of all possible worlds the vicar's clouds of affliction were somewhat too easily converted into showers of blessing yet he is forced to read on and at the end he confesses gladly that goldsmith has succeeded in making a most interesting story out of material that in other hands would have developed either a burlesque or a brutal tragedy laying aside all romantic passion intrigue and adventure upon which other novelists depended goldsmith in this simple story of common life has accomplished three noteworthy results he has made human fatherhood almost a divine thing he has glorified the moral sentiments which cluster about the family life as the center of civilization and he has given us in dr primrose a striking and enduring figure which seems more like a personal acquaintance than a character in a book william cowper seventeen thirty one eighteen hundred in cowper we have another interesting poet who like gray and goldsmith shows the struggle between romantic and classic ideals in his first volume of poems cowper is more hampered by literary fashions than was goldsmith in his traveller and his deserted village in his second period however cowper uses blank verse freely and his delight in nature and in homely characters like the teamster and the mail carrier of the task shows that his classicism is being rapidly thawed out by romantic feeling in his later work especially his immortal john gilpin cowper flings fashions aside gives pegasus the reins takes to the open road and so proves himself a worthy predecessor of burns who is the most spontaneous and the most interesting of all the early romanticists life cowper's life is a pathetic story of a shy and timid genius who found the world of men too rough and who withdrew to nature like a wounded animal he was born at great berkhamsted hertfordshire in seventeen thirty one the son of an english clergyman he was a delicate sensitive child whose early life was saddened by the death of his mother and by his neglect at home at six years he was sent away to a boys school where he was terrified by young barbarians who made his life miserable there was one atrocious bully into whose face cowper would never look he recognized his enemy by his shoe buckles and shivered at his approach the fierce invectives of his tirocinium or a review of schools seventeen eighty four shows how these school experiences had affected his mind and health for twelve years he studied law but at the approach of a public examination for an office he was so terrified that he attempted suicide the experience unsettled his reason and the next twelve months were spent in an asylum at st albans the death of his father in seventeen fifty six had brought the poet a small patrimony which placed him above the necessity of struggling like goldsmith for his daily bread upon his recovery he boarded for years at the house of the unwins cultured people who recognized the genius hidden in this shy and melancholy yet quaintly humorous man 
mrs unwin in particular cared for him as a son and whatever happiness he experienced in his poor life was the result of the devotion of this good woman who is the mary of all his poems a second attack of insanity was brought on by cowper's morbid interest in religion influenced perhaps by the untempered zeal of one john newton a curate with whom cowper worked in a small parish of olney and with whom he compiled the famous olney hymns the rest of his life between intervals of melancholia or insanity was spent in gardening in the care of his numerous pets and in writing his poems his translation of homer and his charming letters his two best-known poems were suggested by a lively and cultivated widow lady austin who told him the story of john gilpin and called for a ballad on the subject she also urged him to write a long poem in blank verse and when he demanded a subject she whimsically suggested the sofa which was a new article of furniture at that time cowper immediately wrote the sofa and influenced by the poetic possibilities that lie in unexpected places he added to this poem from time to time and called his completed work the task this was published in seventeen eighty five and the author was instantly recognized as one of the chief poets of his age the last years of his life were a long battle with insanity until death mercifully ended the struggle in eighteen hundred his last poem the castaway is a cry of despair in which under guise of a man washed overboard in a storm he describes himself perishing in the sight of friends who are powerless to help cowper's works cowper's first volume of poems containing the progress of error truth table talk etc is interesting chiefly as showing how the poet was bound by the classic rules of his age these poems are dreary on the whole but a certain gentleness and especially a vein of pure humor occasionally rewards the reader for cowper was a humorist and only the constant shadow of insanity kept him from becoming famous in that line alone the task the task written in blank verse and published in seventeen eighty five is cowper's longest poem used as we are to the natural poetry of wordsworth and tennyson it is hard for us to appreciate the striking originality of this work much of it is conventional and wooden to be sure like much of wordsworth's poetry but when after reading the rhymed essays and the artificial couplets of johnson's age we turn suddenly to cowper's description of homely scenes of woods and brooks of ploughmen and teamsters and the letter carrier on his rounds we realize that we are at the dawn of a better day in poetry he comes the herald of a noisy world with spattered boots strapped waist and frozen locks news from all nations lumbering at his back true to his charge the close packed load behind yet careless what he brings his one concern is to conduct it to the destined end and having dropped the expected bag pass on he whistles as he goes light-hearted wretch cold and yet cheerful messenger of grief perhaps to thousands and of joy to some to him indifferent whether grief or joy houses in ashes and the fall of stocks births deaths and marriages epistles wet with tears that trickled down the writer's cheeks fast as the periods from his fluent quill or charged with amorous sighs of absent swains or nymphs responsive equally affect his horse and him unconscious of them all miscellaneous works cowper's most laborious work the translation of homer in blank verse was published in seventeen ninety one its stately milton-like movement and its better rendering of the greek make this translation far superior to pope's artificial couplets it is also better in many respects than chapman's more famous and more fanciful rendering but for some reason it was not successful and has never received the recognition which it deserves 
entirely different in spirit are the poet's numerous hymns which were published in the olney collection in seventeen seventy nine and which are still used in our churches it is only necessary to mention a few first lines god moves in a mysterious way oh for a closer walk with god sometimes a light surprises to show how his gentle and devout spirit has left its impress upon thousands who now hardly know his name with cowper's charming letters published in eighteen o three we reach the end of his important works and the student who enjoys reading letters will find that these rank among the best of their kind it is not however for his ambitious works that cowper is remembered but rather for his minor poems which have found their own way into so many homes among these the one that brings quickest response from hearts that understand is his little poem on the receipt of my mother's picture beginning with the striking line oh that those lips had language another called alexander selkirk beginning i am monarch of all i survey suggests how selkirk's experiences as a castaway which gave defoe his inspiration for robinson crusoe affected the poet's timid nature and imagination last and most famous of all is his immortal john gilpin cowper was in a terrible fit of melancholy when lady austin told him the story which proved to be better than medicine for all night long chuckles and suppressed laughter were heard in the poet's bedroom next morning at breakfast he recited the ballad that had afforded its author so much delight in the making the student should read it even if he reads nothing else by cowper and he will be lacking in humor or appreciation if he is not ready to echo heartily the last stanza now let us sing long live the king and gilpin long live he and when he next doth ride abroad may i be there to see End of section 35section thirty six of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued robert burns seventeen fifty nine seventeen ninety six after a century and more of classicism we noted with interest the work of three men gray goldsmith and cowper whose poetry like the chorus of awakening birds suggests the dawn of another day two other poets of the same age suggest the sunrise the first is the ploughman burns who speaks straight from the heart to the primitive emotions of the race the second is the mystic blake who only half understands his own thoughts and whose words stir a sensitive nature as music does or the moon in mid-heaven rousing in the soul those vague desires and aspirations which ordinarily sleep and which can never be expressed because they have no names blake lived his shy mystic spiritual life in the crowded city and his messages to the few who can understand burns lived his sad toilsome erring life in the open air with the sun and the rain and his songs touch all the world the latter's poetry so far as it has a philosophy rests upon two principles which the classic school never understood that common people are at heart romantic and lovers of the ideal and that simple human emotions furnish the elements of true poetry largely because he follows these two principles burns is probably the greatest songwriter of the world his poetic creed may be summed up in one of his own stanzas give me a spark on nature's fire that's of the learning i desire then though i trudge through dub and mire at plow or cart my muse though hamely in attire may touch the heart life note fitz green halleck's poem to a rose from near alloway kirk eighteen twenty two is a good appreciation of burns and his poetry it might be well to read this poem before the sad story of burns life End of note. burns life 
is a life of fragments as carlyle called it and the different fragments are as unlike as the noble cotter's saturday night and the rant and riot of the jolly beggars the details of this sad and disjointed life were better perhaps forgotten we call attention only to the facts which help us to understand the man and his poetry burns was born in a clay cottage at alloway scotland in the bleak winter of seventeen fifty nine his father was an excellent type of the scotch peasant of those days a poor honest god-fearing man who toiled from dawn till dark to wrest a living for his family from the stubborn soil his tall figure was bent with unceasing labor his hair was thin and gray and in his eyes was the careworn hunted look of a peasant driven by poverty and unpaid rents from one poor farm to another the family often fasted of necessity and lived in solitude to avoid the temptation of spending their hard-earned money the children went barefoot and bareheaded in all weathers and shared the parents toil and their anxiety over the rents at thirteen bobby the eldest was doing a peasant's full day's labor at sixteen he was chief laborer on his father's farm and he describes the life as the cheerless gloom of a hermit and the unceasing moil of a galley slave in seventeen eighty four the father after a lifetime of toil was saved from a debtor's prison by consumption and death to rescue something from the wreck of the home and to win a poor chance of bread for the family the two older boys set up a claim for arrears of wages that had never been paid with the small sum allowed them they buried their father took another farm Moskil in Malchlin, and began again the long struggle with poverty such in outline is burns own story of his early life taken mostly from his letters there is another and more pleasing side to the picture of which we have glimpses in his poems and in his commonplace book here we see the boy at school for like most scotch peasants his father gave his boys the best education he possibly could we see him following the plough not like a slave but like a free man crooning over an old scotch song and making a better one to match the melody we see him stop the plough to listen to what the wind is saying or turn aside lest he disturb the birds at their singing and nest-making at supper we see the family about the table happy notwithstanding their scant fare each child with a spoon in one hand and a book in the other we hear betty davidson reciting from her great store some heroic ballad that fired the young hearts to enthusiasm and made them forget the day's toil and in the cotter's saturday night we have a glimpse of scotch peasant life that makes us almost reverence these heroic men and women who kept their faith and their self-respect in the face of poverty and whose hearts under their rough exteriors were tender and true as steel a most unfortunate change in burns life began when he left the farm at seventeen and went to kirkoswald to study surveying the town was the haunt of smugglers rough-living hard-drinking men and burns speedily found his way into those scenes of riot and roaring dissipation which were his bane ever afterwards for a little while he studied diligently but one day while taking the altitude of the sun he saw a pretty girl in the neighboring garden and love put trigonometry to flight soon he gave up his work and wandered back to the farm and poverty again when twenty-seven years of age burns first attracted literary attention and in the same moment sprang to the first place in scottish letters in despair over his poverty and personal habits he resolved to emigrate to jamaica and gathered together a few of his early poems hoping to sell them for enough to pay the expenses of his journey the result was the famous kilmarnock edition of burns published in seventeen eighty six for which he was offered twenty pounds it is said that he even bought his ticket and on the night before the ship sailed wrote his farewell to scotland 
beginning the gloomy night is gathering fast which he intended to be his last song on scottish soil in the morning he changed his mind led partly by some dim foreshadowing of the result of his literary adventure for the little book took all scotland by storm not only scholars and literary men but even ploughboys and maidservants says a contemporary eagerly spent their hard-earned shillings for the new book instead of going to jamaica the young poet hurried to edinburgh to arrange for another edition of his work his journey was a constant ovation and in the capital he was welcomed and feasted by the best of scottish society this unexpected triumph lasted only one winter burns fondness for taverns and riotous living shocked his cultured entertainers and when he returned to edinburgh next winter after a pleasure jaunt through the highlands he received scant attention he left the city in anger and disappointment and went back to the soil where he was more at home the last few years of burns life are a sad tragedy and we pass over them hurriedly he bought the farm ellisland Dumfrieshire, and married the faithful jean armour in seventeen eighty eight that he could write of her i see her in the dewy flowers i see her sweet and fair i hear her in the tuneful birds i hear her charm the air there's not a bonny flower that springs by fountain shaw or green there's not a bonny bird that sings but minds me o' my jean is enough for us to remember the next year he was appointed excise man i e collector of liquor revenues and the small salary with the return from his poems would have been sufficient to keep his family in modest comfort had he but kept away from taverns for a few years his life of alternate toil and dissipation was occasionally illumined by his splendid lyric genius and he produced many songs bonny doon my love's like a red red rose all lang syne highland mary and the soul stirring scots what hae composed while galloping over the moor in a storm which have made the name of burns known wherever the english language is spoken and honored wherever scotchmen gather together he died miserably in seventeen ninety six when only thirty-seven years old his last letter was an appeal to a friend for money to stave off the bailiff and one of his last poems a tribute to jesse lures a kind lassie who helped to care for him in his illness this last exquisite lyric o oh, wert thou in the cauld blast set to mendelssohn's music is one of our best-known songs though its history is seldom suspected by those who sing it the poetry of burns the publication of the kilmarnock burns with the title poems chiefly in the scottish dialect seventeen eighty six marks an epoch in the history of english literature like the publication of spencer's shepherd's calendar after a century of cold and formal poetry relieved only by the romanticism of gray and cowper these fresh inspired songs went straight to the heart like the music of returning birds in springtime it was a little volume but a great book and we think of marlowe's line infinite riches in a little room in connection with it such poems as the cotter's saturday night to a mouse to mountain daisy man was made to mourn the twa dogs addressed to the devil and halloween suggest that the whole spirit of the romantic revival is embodied in this obscure ploughman love humor pathos the response to nature all the poetic qualities that touch the human heart are here and the heart was touched as it had not been since the days of elizabeth if the reader will note again the six characteristics of the romantic movement and then read six poems of burns he will see at once how perfectly this one man expresses the new idea or take a single suggestion a fond kiss and then we sever a farewell and then forever deep in heart-wrung tears i'll pledge thee warring sighs and groans i'll wage thee who shall say that fortune grieves him while the star of hope she leaves him me nay chiff a twinkle lights me dark despair around benights me 
i'll ne'er blame my partial fancy nothing could resist my nancy but to see her was to love her love but her and love for ever had we never loved say kindly had we never loved say blindly never met or never parted we had ne'er been broken-hearted the essence of a thousand love tales is in that one little song because he embodies the new spirit of romanticism critics give him a high place in the history of our literature and because his songs go straight to the heart he is the poet of common men songs for music of burns many songs for music little need be said they have found their way into the hearts of a whole people and there they speak for themselves they range from the exquisite o oh, where thou in the cauld blast to the tremendous appeal to scottish patriotism in scots we he we wallace bled which carlyle said should be sung with the throat of the whirlwind many of these songs were composed in his best days when following the plough or resting after his work while the music of some old scotch song was ringing in his head it is largely because he thought of music while he composed that so many of his poems have the singing quality suggesting a melody as we read them among his poems of nature to a mouse and to a mountain daisy are unquestionably the best suggesting the poetical possibilities that daily pass unnoticed under our feet these two poems are as near as burns ever comes to appreciating nature for its own sake the majority of his poems like winter and ye banks and braes o bonny doon regard nature in the same way that gray regarded it as a background for the play of human emotions of his poems of emotion there is an immense number it is a curious fact that the world is always laughing and crying at the same moment and we can hardly read a page of burns without finding this natural juxtaposition of smiles and tears it is noteworthy also that all strong emotions when expressed naturally lend themselves to poetry and burns more than any other writer has an astonishing faculty of describing his own emotions with vividness and simplicity so that they appeal instantly to our own one cannot read i love my jean for instance without being in love with some idealized woman or to marry in heaven without sharing the personal grief of one who has loved and lost miscellaneous poems besides the songs of nature and of human emotion burns has given us a large number of poems for which no general title can be given noteworthy among these are a man's a man for all that which voices the new romantic estimate of humanity the vision from which we get a strong impression of burns early ideals the epistle to a young friend from which rather than from his satires we learn burns personal views of religion and honor the address to the unco good which is the poet's plea for mercy in judgment and a bard's epitaph which as a summary of his own life might well be written at the end of his poems halloween a picture of rustic merrymaking and the twa dogs a contrast between the rich and poor are generally classed among the poet's best works but one unfamiliar with the scotch dialect will find them rather difficult of burns longer poems the two best worth reading are the cotter's saturday night and tam o shanter the one giving the most perfect picture we possess of a noble poverty the other being the most lively and the least objectionable of his humorous works it would be difficult to find elsewhere such a combination of the gruesome and the ridiculous as is packed up in tam o' shanter with the exception of these two the longer poems add little to the author's fame or to our own enjoyment it is better for the beginner to read burns exquisite songs and gladly to recognize his place in the hearts of a people and forget the rest since they only sadden us and obscure the poet's better nature end of section thirty six
section thirty seven of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued william blake seventeen fifty seven eighteen twenty seven piping down the valleys wild piping songs of pleasant glee on a cloud i saw a child and he laughing said to me pipe a song about a lamb so i piped with merry cheer piper pipe that song again so i piped he wept to hear piper sit thee down and write in a book that all may read so he vanished from my sight and i plucked a hollow reed and i made a rural pin and i stained the water clear and i wrote my happy songs every child may joy to hear note introduction songs of innocence End of note of all the romantic poets of the eighteenth century blake is the most independent and the most original in his earliest work written when he was scarcely more than a child he seems to go back to the elizabethan songwriters for his models but for the greater part of his life he was the poet of inspiration alone following no man's lead and obeying no voice but that which he heard in his own mystic soul though the most extraordinary literary genius of his age he had practically no influence upon it indeed we hardly yet understand this poet of pure fancy this mystic this transcendental madman who remained to the end of his busy life an incomprehensible child life blake the son of a london tradesman was a strange imaginative child whose soul was more at home with brooks and flowers and fairies than with the crowd of the city streets beyond learning to read and write he received education but he began at ten years to copy prints and to write verses he also began a long course of art study which resulted in his publishing his own books adorned with marginal engravings colored by hand an unusual setting worthy of the strong artistic sense that shows itself in many of his early verses as a child he had visions of god and the angels looking in at his window and as a man he thought he received visits from the souls of the great dead moses virgil homer dante milton majestic shadows gray but luminous he calls them he seems never to have asked himself the question how far these visions were pure illusions but believed and trusted them implicitly to him all nature was a vast spiritual symbolism wherein he saw elves fairies devils angels all looking at him in friendship or enmity through the eyes of flowers and stars with the blue sky spread over with wings and the mild sun that mounts and sings with trees and fields full of fairy elves and little devils who fight for themselves with angels planted in hawthorn bowers and god himself in the passing hours and this curious pantheistic conception of nature was not a matter of creed but the very essence of blake's life strangely enough he made no attempt to found a new religious cult but followed his own way singing cheerfully working patiently in the face of discouragement and failure that writers of far less genius were exalted to favor while he remained poor and obscure does not seem to have troubled him in the least for over forty years he labored diligently at book engraving guided in his art by michelangelo but inventing his own curious designs at which we still wonder the illustrations for young's night thoughts for blair's grave and the inventions to the book of job show the peculiarity of blake's mind quite as clearly as his poems while he worked at his trade he flung off for he never seemed to compose disjointed visions and incomprehensible rhapsodies with an occasional little gem that still sets our hearts to singing ah sunflower weary of time who countest the steps of the sun 
seeking after that sweet golden clime where the traveller's journey is done where the youth pined away with desire and the pale virgin shrouded in snow rise from their graves and aspire where my sunflower wishes to go that is a curious flower to find growing in the london street but it suggests blake's own life which was outwardly busy and quiet but inwardly full of adventure and excitement his last huge prophetic works like jerusalem and milton 1804 were dictated to him he declares by supernatural means and even against his own will they are only half intelligible but here and there one sees flashes of the same poetic beauty that marks his little poems critics generally dismiss blake with the word madman but that is only an evasion at best he is the writer of exquisite lyrics at worst he is mad only north northwest like hamlet and the puzzle is to find the method in his madness the most amazing thing about him is the perfectly sane and cheerful way in which he moved through poverty and obscurity flinging out exquisite poems or senseless rhapsodies as a child might play with gems or straws or sunbeams indifferently he was a gentle kindly most unworldly little man with extraordinary eyes which seem even in the lifeless portraits to reflect some unusual hypnotic power he died obscurely smiling at a vision of paradise in eighteen twenty seven that was nearly a century ago yet he still remains one of the most incomprehensible figures in our literature works of blake the poetical sketches published in seventeen eighty three is a collection of blake's earliest poetry much of it written in boyhood it contains much crude and incoherent work but also a few lyrics of striking originality two later and better known volumes are songs of innocence and songs of experience reflecting two widely different views of the human soul as in all his works there is an abundance of apparently worthless stuff in these songs but in the language of miners it is all pay dirt it shows gleams of golden grains that await our sifting and now and then we find a nugget unexpectedly my lord was like a flower upon the brows of lusty may ah life as frail as flower my lord was like a star in highest heaven drawn down to earth by spells and wickedness my lord was like the opening eye of day but he is darkened like the summer moon clouded fallen like the stately tree cut down the breath of heaven dwelt among his leaves on account of the chaotic character of most of blake's work it is well to begin our reading with a short book of selections containing the best songs of these three little volumes swinburne calls blake the only poet of supreme and simple poetic genius of the eighteenth century the one man of that age fit on all accounts to rank with the old great masters note swinburne's william blake end of note the praise is doubtless extravagant and the criticism somewhat intemperate but when we have read the evening star memory night love to the muses spring summer the tiger the lamb the clod and the pebble we may possibly share swinburne's enthusiasm certainly in these three volumes we have some of the most perfect and the most original songs in our language of blake's longer poems his titanic prophecies and apocalyptic splendors it is impossible to write justly in such a brief work as this outwardly they suggest a huge chaff pile and the scattered grains of wheat hardly warrant the labor of winnowing the curious reader will get an idea of blake's amazing mysticism by dipping into any of the works of his middle life Urizen gates of paradise marriage of heaven and hell america 
the french revolution or the vision of the daughters of albion his latest works like jerusalem and milton are too obscure to have any literary value to read any of these works casually is to call the author a madman to study them remembering blake's songs and his genius is to quote softly his own answer to the child who asked about the land of dreams oh what land is the land of dreams what are its mountains and what are its streams oh father i saw my mother there among the lilies by waters fair dear child i also by pleasant streams have wandered all night in the land of dreams but though calm and warm the waters wide i could not get to the other side minor poets of the revival we have chosen the five preceding poets gray goldsmith cowper burns and blake as the most typical and the most interesting of the writers who proclaimed the dawn of romanticism in the eighteenth century with them we associate a group of minor writers whose works were immensely popular in their own day the ordinary reader will pass them by but to the student they are all significant as expressions of very different phases of the romantic revival james thompson seventeen hundred seventeen forty eight thompson belongs among the pioneers of romanticism like gray and goldsmith he wavered between pseudo-classic and the new romantic ideals and for this reason if for no other his early work is interesting like the uncertainty of a child who hesitates whether to creep safely on all fours or risk a fall by walking he is worthy to be remembered for three poems rule britannia which is still one of the national songs of england the castle of indolence and the seasons the dreamy and romantic castle seventeen forty eight occupied by enchanter indolence and his willing captives in the land of drowsy head is purely spenserian in its imagery and is written in the spenserian stanza the seasons seventeen twenty six seventeen thirty written in blank verse describes the sights and sounds of the changing year and the poet's own feelings in the presence of nature these two poems though rather dull to a modern reader were significant of the early romantic revival in three ways they abandoned the prevailing heroic couplet they went back to the elizabethans instead of to pope for their models and they called attention to the long neglected life of nature as a subject for poetry william collins seventeen twenty one seventeen fifty nine collins the friend and disciple of thompson was of a delicate nervous temperament like cowper and over him also brooded the awful shadow of insanity his first work oriental eclogues seventeen forty two is romantic in feeling but is written in the prevailing mechanical couplets all his later work is romantic in both thought and expression his ode on the popular superstitions of the highlands seventeen fifty is an interesting event in the romantic revival for it introduced a new world of witches pygmies fairies and medieval kings for the imagination to play in collins best-known poems are the odes to simplicity to fear to the passions the little unnamed lyric beginning how sleep the brave and the exquisite ode to evening in reading the latter one is scarcely aware that the lines are so delicately balanced that they have no need of rhyme to accentuate their melody End of section thirty seven section thirty eight of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued george crabbe seventeen fifty four eighteen thirty two crabbe is an interesting combination of realism and romanticism his work of depicting common life being at times vaguely suggestive of fielding's novels 
the village seventeen eighty three a poem without a rival as a picture of the working men of his age is sometimes like fielding in its coarse vigor and again like dryden in its precise versification the poem was not successful at first and crabbe abandoned his literary dreams for over twenty years he settled down as a clergyman in a county parish observing keenly the common life around him then he published more poems exactly like the village which immediately brought him fame and money they brought him also the friendship of walter scott who like others regarded crabbe as one of the first poets of the age these later poems the parish register eighteen o seven the borough eighteen ten tales in verse eighteen twelve and tales of the hall eighteen nineteen are in the same strain they are written in couplets they are reflections of nature and of country life they contain much that is sordid and dull but are nevertheless real pictures of real men and women just as crabbe saw them and as such they are still interesting goldsmith and burns had idealized the poor and we admire them for their sympathy and insight it remained for crabbe to show that in wretched fishing villages in the lives of hard-working men and women children laborers smugglers paupers all sorts and conditions of common men there is abundant romantic without exaggerating or idealizing their vices and virtues james macpherson seventeen thirty six seventeen ninety six in macpherson we have an unusual figure who catered to the new romantic interest in the old epic heroes and won immense though momentary fame by a series of literary forgeries macpherson was a scotch schoolmaster an educated man but evidently not over tender of conscience whose imagination had been stirred by certain old poems which he may have heard in gaelic among the highlanders in seventeen sixty he published his fragments of ancient poetry collected in the highlands and alleged that his work was but a translation of gaelic manuscripts whether the work of itself would have attracted attention is doubtful but the fact that an abundance of literary material might be awaiting discovery led to an interest such as now attends the opening of an egyptian tomb and a subscription was promptly raised in edinburgh to send macpherson through the highlands to collect more manuscripts the result was the epic fingal seventeen sixty two that lank and lamentable counterfeit of poetry as swinburne calls it which the author professed to have translated from the gaelic of the poet ossian its success was astonishing and macpherson followed it up with temora seventeen sixty three another epic in the same strain in both these works macpherson succeeds in giving an air of primal grandeur to his heroes the characters are big and shadowy the imagery is at times magnificent the language is a kind of chanting bombastic prose now fingal arose in his might and thrice he reared his voice cromla answered around and the sons of the desert stood still they bent their red faces to earth ashamed at the presence of fingal he came like a cloud of rain in the days of the sun when slow it rolls on the hill and fields expect the shower swaran beheld the terrible king of morven and stopped in the midst of his course dark he leaned on his spear rolling his red eyes around silent and tall he seemed as an oak on the banks of lubar which had its branches blasted of old by the lightning of heaven his thousands pour around the hero and the darkness of battle gathers on the hill note there are several omissions from the text in this fragment from fingal End of note. the publication of this gloomy imaginative work produced a literary storm a few critics led by dr johnson demanded to see the original manuscripts and when macpherson refused to produce them note 
several fragments of gaelic poetry attributed to ossian or oisin are now known to have existed at that time in the highlands macpherson used these as a basis for his epic but most of the details were furnished by his own imagination the alleged text of ossian was published in eighteen o seven some eleven years after macpherson's death it only added another mystery to the forgery for while it embodied a few old and probably genuine fragments the bulk of it seems to be macpherson's work translated back into gaelic End of note. the ossianic poems were branded as a forgery nevertheless they had enormous success macpherson was honored as a literary explorer he was given an official position carrying a salary for life and at his death in seventeen ninety six he was buried in westminster abbey blake burns and indeed most of the poets of the age were influenced by this sham poetry even the scholarly gray was deceived and delighted with ossian and men as far apart as goethe and napoleon praised it immoderately thomas chatterton seventeen fifty two seventeen seventy this marvellous boy to whom keats dedicated his endymion and who is celebrated in shelley's adonais is one of the saddest and most interesting figures of the romantic revival during his childhood he haunted the old church of st mary redcliffe in bristol where he was fascinated by the medieval air of the place and especially by one old chest known as caninga's coffer containing musty documents which had been preserved for three hundred years with strange uncanny intentness the child pored over these relics of the past copying them instead of his writing-book until he could imitate not only the spelling and language but even the handwriting of the original soon after the ossian forgeries appeared chatterton began to produce documents apparently very old containing medieval poems legends and family histories centering around two characters thomas rowley priest and poet and william canninger merchant of bristol in the days of henry the sixth it seems incredible that the whole design of these medieval romances should have been worked out by a child of eleven and that he could reproduce the style and the writing of caxton's day so well that the printers were deceived but such is the fact more and more rowley papers as they were called were produced by chatterton apparently from the archives of the old church in reality from his own imagination delighting a large circle of readers and deceiving all but gray and a few scholars who recognized the occasional misuse of fifteenth-century english words all this work was carefully finished and bore the unmistakable stamp of literary genius reading now his aella or the ballad of carita or the long poem in ballad style called bristol tragedy it is hard to realize that it is a boy's work at seventeen years of age chatterton went for a literary career to london where he soon afterwards took poison and killed himself in a fit of childish despondency brought on by poverty and hunger thomas percy seventeen twenty nine eighteen eleven to percy bishop of the irish church in dromore we are indebted for the first attempt at a systematic collection of the folk songs and ballads which are counted among the treasures of a nation's literature note for various other collections of songs and ballads antedating percy's see phelps beginnings of the english romantic movement chapter seven End of note in seventeen sixty five he published in three volumes his famous relics of ancient english poetry the most valuable part of this work is the remarkable collection of old english and scottish ballads such as chevy chase the nut brown maid children of the wood battle of otterburn and many more which but for his labor might easily have perished we have now much better and more reliable editions of these same ballads 
for percy garbled his materials adding and subtracting freely and even inventing a few ballads of his own two motives probably influenced him in this first the different versions of the same ballad varied greatly and percy in changing them to suit himself took the same liberty as had many other writers in dealing with the same material second percy was under the influence of johnson and his school and thought it necessary to add a few elegant ballads to atone for the rudeness of the most obsolete poems that sounds queer now used as we are to exactness in dealing with historical and literary material but it expresses the general spirit of the age in which he lived notwithstanding these drawbacks percy's relics marks an epoch in the history of romanticism and it is difficult to measure its influence on the whole romantic movement scott says of it the first time i could scrape a few shillings together i bought myself a copy of these beloved volumes nor do i believe i ever read a book half so frequently or with half the enthusiasm scott's own poetry is strongly modeled upon these early ballads and his minstrelsy of the scottish border is due chiefly to the influence of percy's work besides the relics percy has given us another good work in his northern antiquities seventeen seventy translated from the french of malay's history of denmark this also was of immense influence since it introduced to english readers a new and fascinating mythology more rugged and primitive than that of the greeks and we are still in music as in letters under the spell of thor and odin of freya and the valkyr maidens and of that stupendous drama of passion and tragedy which ended in the twilight of the gods the literary world owes a debt of gratitude to percy who wrote nothing of importance himself but who by collecting and translating the works of other men did much to hasten the triumph of romanticism in the nineteenth century part three the first english novelists the chief literary phenomena of the complex eighteenth century are the reign of so-called classicism the revival of romantic poetry and the discovery of the modern novel of these three the last is probably the most important aside from the fact that the novel is the most modern and at present the most widely read and influential type of literature we have a certain pride in regarding it as england's original contribution to the world of letters other great types of literature like the epic the romance and the drama were first produced by other nations but the idea of the modern novel seems to have been worked out largely on english soil note the first books to which the term novel in the modern sense may be applied appeared almost simultaneously in england france and germany the rapid development of the english novel had an immense influence in all european nations End of note and in the number and the fine quality of her novelists england has hardly been rivaled by any other nation before we study the writers who developed this new type of literature it is well to consider briefly its meaning and history the story element meaning of the novel probably the most significant remark made by the ordinary reader concerning a work of fiction takes the form of a question is it a good story for the reader of to-day is much like the child and the primitive man in this respect that he must be attracted and held by the story element of a narrative before he learns to appreciate its style or moral significance the story element is therefore essential to the novel but where the story originates is impossible to say as well might we seek for the origin of the race for wherever primitive men are found there we see them gathering eagerly about the story-teller in the halls of our saxon ancestors the scop and the tale-bringer were ever the most welcome guests 
and in the bark wigwams of the american indians the man who told the legends of hiawatha had an audience quite as attentive as that which gathered at the greek festivals to hear the story of ulysses wanderings to man's instinct or innate love for a story we are indebted for all our literature and the novel must in some degree satisfy this instinct or fail of appreciation the romance the second question which we ask concerning a work of fiction is how far does the element of imagination enter into it for upon the element of imagination depends largely our classification of works of fiction into novels romances and mere adventure stories the divisions here are as indefinite as the borderland between childhood and youth between instinct and reason but there are certain principles to guide us we note in the development of any normal child that there comes a time when for his stories he desires knights giants elves fairies witches magic and marvelous adventures which have no basis in experience he tells extraordinary tales about himself which may be only the vague remembrances of a dream or the creations of a dawning imagination both of which are as real to him as any other part of life when we say that such a child romances we give exactly the right name to it for this sudden interest in extraordinary beings and events marks the development of the human imagination running riot at first because it is not guided by reason which is a later development and to satisfy this new interest the romance note the name romance was given at first to any story in one of the romance languages like the french metrical romances which we have considered because these stories were brought to england at a time when the childish mind of the middle ages delighted in the most impossible stories the name romance was retained to cover any work of the unbridled imagination End of note was invented the romance is originally a work of fiction in which the imagination is given full play without being limited by facts or probabilities it deals with extraordinary events with heroes whose powers are exaggerated and often adds the element of superhuman or supernatural characters it is impossible to draw the line where romance ends but this element of excessive imagination and of impossible heroes and incidents is its distinguishing mark in every literature the novel where the novel begins it is likewise impossible to say but again we have a suggestion in the experience of every reader there comes a time naturally and inevitably in the life of every youth when the romance no longer enthralls him he lives in a world of facts gets acquainted with men and women some good some bad but all human and he demands that literature shall express life as he knows it by experience this is the stage of the awakened intellect and in our stories the intellect as well as the imagination must now be satisfied at the beginning of this stage we delight in robinson crusoe we read eagerly a multitude of adventure narratives and a few so-called historical novels but in each case we must be lured by a story must find heroes and moving accidents by flood and field to appeal to our imagination and though the hero and the adventure may be exaggerated they must both be natural and within the bounds of probability gradually the element of adventure or surprising incident grows less and less important as we learn that true life is not adventurous but a plain heroic matter of work and duty and the daily choice between good and evil life is the most real thing in the world now not the life of kings or heroes or superhuman creatures but the individual life with its struggles and temptations and triumphs or failures like our own and any work that faithfully represents life becomes interesting so we drop the adventure story and turn to the novel 
for the novel is a work of fiction in which the imagination and the intellect combine to express life in the form of a story and the imagination is always directed and controlled by the intellect it is interested chiefly not in romance or adventure but in men and women as they are it aims to show the motives and influences which govern human life and the effects of personal choice upon character and destiny such is the true novel note this division of works of fiction into romances and novels is a somewhat arbitrary one but it seems on the whole the most natural and the most satisfactory many writers use the generic term novel to include all prose fiction they divide novels into two classes stories and romances the story being a form of the novel which relates certain incidents of life with as little complexity as possible and the romance being a form of novel which describes life as led by strong emotions into complex and unusual circumstances novels are otherwise divided into novels of personality like vicar of wakefield and silas marner historical novels ivanhoe novels of romance like lorna doon and novels of purpose like oliver twist and uncle tom's cabin all such classifications are imperfect and the best of them is open to objections End of note and as such it opens a wider and more interesting field than any other type of literature end of section thirty eight section thirty nine of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued precursors of the novel before the novel could reach its modern stage of a more or less sincere attempt to express human life and character it had to pass through several centuries of almost imperceptible development among the early precursors of the novel we must place a collection of tales known as the greek romances dating from the second to the sixth centuries these are imaginative and delightful stories of ideal love and marvelous adventure note one of these tales was called the wonderful things beyond tuli it is the story of a youth dinius who for love of a girl dercillus did heroic things and undertook many adventures including a journey to the frozen north and another to the moon a second tale ephesiaca is the story of a man and a maid each of whom scoffs at love they meet and fall desperately in love but the course of true love does not run smooth and they separate and suffer and go through many perils before they live happily ever after this tale is the source of the medieval story apollonius of tyre which is used in gower's confessio amantis and in shakespeare's pericles the third tale is the pastoral love story daphnis and chloe which reappeared in many forms in subsequent literature End of note which profoundly affected romance writing for the next thousand years a second group of predecessors is found in the italian and spanish pastoral romances which were inspired by the eclogues of virgil these were extremely popular in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries and their influence is seen later in sydney's arcadia which is the best of this type in english the third and most influential group of predecessors of the novel is made up of the romances of chivalry such as are found in mallory's morte d'arthur it is noticeable in reading these beautiful old romances in different languages that each nation changes them somewhat so as to make them more expressive of national traits and ideals in a word the old romance tends inevitably towards realism especially in england where the excessive imagination is curbed and the heroes become more human 
in mallory in the unknown author of sir gawain and the green knight and especially in chaucer we see the effect of the practical english mind in giving these old romances a more natural setting and in making the heroes suggest though faintly the men and women of their own day the canterbury tales with their story interest and their characters delightfully true to nature have in them the suggestion at least of a connected story whose chief aim is to reflect life as it is in the elizabethan age the idea of the novel grows more definite in sydney's arcadia fifteen eighty a romance of chivalry the pastoral setting at least is generally true to nature our credulity is not taxed as in the old romances by the continual appearance of magic or miracles and the characters though idealized till they become tiresome occasionally give the impression of being real men and women in bacon's the new atlantis sixteen twenty seven we have the story of the discovery by mariners of an unknown country inhabited by a superior race of men more civilized than ourselves an idea which had been used by moore in his utopia in fifteen sixteen these two books are neither romances nor novels in the strict sense but studies of social institutions they use the connected story as a means of teaching moral lessons and of bringing about needed reforms and this valuable suggestion has been adopted by many of our modern writers in the so-called problem novels and novels of purpose nearer to the true novel is lodge's romantic story of rosalinda which was used by shakespeare in as you like it this was modeled upon the italian novella or short story which became very popular in england during the elizabethan age in the same age we have introduced into england the spanish picaresque novel from picaro a knave or rascal which at first was a kind of burlesque on the medieval romance and which took for its hero some low scoundrel or outcast instead of a knight and followed him through a long career of scandals and villainies one of the earliest types of this picaresque novel in english is nash's the unfortunate traveller or the life of jack wilton fifteen ninety four which is also a forerunner of the historical novel since its action takes place during that gorgeous interview between henry the eighth and the king of france on the field of the cloth of gold in all these short stories and picaresque novels the emphasis was laid not so much on life and character as on the adventures of the hero and the interest consisted largely in wondering what would happen next and how the plot would end the same method is employed in all trashy novels and it is especially the bane of many modern story writers this excessive interest in adventures or incidents for their own sake and not for their effect on character is what distinguishes the modern adventure story from the true novel in the puritan age we approach still nearer to the modern novel especially in the work of bunyan and as the puritan always laid emphasis on character stories appeared having a definite moral purpose bunyan's the pilgrim's progress sixteen seventy eight differs from the fairy queen and from all other medieval allegories in this important respect that the characters far from being bloodless abstractions are but thinly disguised men and women indeed many a modern man reading the story of the christian has found in it the reflection of his own life and experience in the life and death of mr badman sixteen eighty two we have another and even more realistic study of a man as he was in bunyan's day these two striking figures christian and mr badman belong among the great characters of english fiction bunyan's good work his keen insight his delineation of character and his emphasis upon the moral effects of individual action was carried on by addison and steele some thirty years later 
the character of sir roger de coverley is a real reflection of english country life in the eighteenth century and with steele's domestic sketches in the tatler the spectator and the guardian 1709 1713 we definitely cross the borderland that lies outside of romance and enter the region of character study where the novel has its beginning the discovery of the modern novel notwithstanding this long history of fiction to which we have called attention it is safe to say that until the publication of richardson's pamela in 1740 no true novel had appeared in any literature by a true novel we mean simply a work of fiction which relates the story of a plain human life under stress of emotion which depends for its interest not on incident or adventure but on its truth to nature a number of english novelists goldsmith richardson fielding smollett stern all seem to have seized upon the idea of reflecting life as it is in the form of a story and to have developed it simultaneously the result was an extraordinary awakening of interest especially among people who had never before been greatly concerned with literature we are to remember that in previous periods the number of readers was comparatively small and that with the exception of a few writers like langland and bunyan authors wrote largely for the upper classes in the eighteenth century the spread of education and the appearance of newspapers and magazines led to an immense increase in the number of readers and at the same time the middle-class people assumed a foremost place in english life and history these new readers and this new powerful middle class had no classic tradition to hamper them they cared little for the opinions of dr johnson and the famous literary club and so far as they read fiction at all they apparently took little interest in the exaggerated romances of impossible heroes and the picaresque stories of intrigue and villainy which had interested the upper classes some new type of literature was demanded this new type must express the new ideal of the eighteenth century namely the value and the importance of the individual life so the novel was born expressing though in a different way exactly the same ideals of personality and the dignity of common life which were later proclaimed in the american and in the french revolution and were welcomed with rejoicing by the poets of the romantic revival to tell men not about knights or kings or types of heroes but about themselves in the guise of plain men and women about their own thoughts and motives and struggles and the results of actions upon their own characters this was the purpose of our first novelists the eagerness with which their chapters were read in england and the rapidity with which their work was copied abroad show how powerfully the new discovery appealed to readers everywhere before we consider the work of these writers who first developed the modern novel we must glance at the work of a pioneer daniel defoe whom we place among the early novelists for the simple reason that we do not know how else to classify him daniel defoe sixteen sixty one question mark seventeen thirty one to defoe is often given the credit for the discovery of the modern novel but whether or not he deserves that honor is an open question even a casual reading of robinson crusoe seventeen nineteen which generally heads the list of modern fiction shows that this exciting tale is largely an adventure story rather than the study of human character which defoe probably intended it to be young people still read it as they might a dime novel skipping its moralizing passages and hurrying on to more adventures but they seldom appreciate the excellent mature reasons which banish the dime novel to a secret place in the haymow while crusoe hangs proudly on the christmas tree and holds an honored place on the family bookshelf 
defoe's apparition of mrs veal memoirs of a cavalier and journal of the plague year are such mixtures of fact fiction and credulity that they defy classification while other so-called novels like captain singleton moll flanders and roxana are but little better than picaresque stories with a deal of unnatural moralizing and repentance added for puritanical effect in crusoe defoe brought the realistic adventure story to a very high stage of its development but his works hardly deserve to be classified as true novels which must subordinate incident to the faithful portrayal of human life and character life defoe was the son of a london butcher named foe and kept his family name until he was forty years of age when he added the aristocratic prefix with which we have grown familiar the events of his busy seventy years of life in which he passed through all extremes from poverty to wealth from prosperous brickmaker to starveling journalist from newgate prison to immense popularity and royal favor are obscure enough in details but four facts stand out clearly which help the reader to understand the character of his work first defoe was a jack at all trades as well as a writer his interest was largely with the working classes and notwithstanding many questionable practices he seems to have had some continued purpose of educating and uplifting the common people this partially accounts for the enormous popularity of his works and for the fact that they were criticized by literary men as being fit only for the kitchen second he was a radical nonconformist in religion and was intended by his father for the independent ministry the puritan zeal for reform possessed him and he tried to do by his pen what wesley was doing by his preaching without however having any great measure of the latter's sincerity or singleness of purpose this zeal for reform marks all his numerous works and accounts for the moralizing to be found everywhere third defoe was a journalist and pamphleteer with a reporter's eye for the picturesque and a newspaper man's instinct for making a good story he wrote an immense number of pamphlets poems and magazine articles conducted several papers one of the most popular the review being issued from prison and the fact that they often blew hot and cold upon the same question was hardly noticed indeed so extraordinarily interesting and plausible were defoe's articles that he generally managed to keep employed by the party in power whether whig or tory this long journalistic career lasting half a century accounts for his direct simple narrative style which holds us even now by its intense reality to defoe's genius we are also indebted for two discoveries the interview and the leading editorial both of which are still in daily use in our best newspapers the fourth fact to remember is that defoe knew prison life and thereby hangs a tale in seventeen o two defoe published a remarkable pamphlet called the shortest way with the dissenters supporting the claims of the free churches against the high flyers i e tories and anglicans in a vein of grim humor which recalls swift's modest proposal defoe advocated hanging all dissenting ministers and sending all members of the free churches into exile and so ferociously realistic was the satire that both dissenters and tories took the author literally defoe was tried found guilty of seditious libel and sentenced to be fined to stand three days in the pillory and to be imprisoned hardly had the sentence been pronounced when defoe wrote his hymn to the pillory hail hieroglyphic state machine contrived to punish fancy in a set of doggerel verses ridiculing his prosecutors which defoe with a keen eye for advertising scattered all over london crowds flocked to cheer him in the pillory and seeing that defoe was making popularity out of persecution his enemies bundled him off to newgate prison 
he turned this experience also to account by publishing a popular newspaper and by getting acquainted with rogues pirates smugglers and miscellaneous outcasts each one with a good story to be used later after his release from prison in seventeen o four he turned his knowledge of criminals to further account and entered the government employ as a kind of spy or secret service agent his prison experience and the further knowledge of criminals gained in over twenty years as a spy accounts for his numerous stories of thieves and pirates jonathan wilde and captain avery and also for his later novels which deal almost exclusively with villains and outcasts when defoe was nearly sixty years of age he turned to fiction and wrote the great work by which he is remembered robinson crusoe was an instant success and the author became famous all over europe other stories followed rapidly and defoe earned money enough to retire to newington and live in comfort but not idly for his activity in producing fiction is rivaled only by that of walter scott thus in seventeen twenty appeared captain singleton duncan campbell and memoirs of a cavalier in seventeen twenty two colonel jack moll flanders and the amazingly realistic journal of the plague year so the list grows with astonishing rapidity ending with the history of the devil in seventeen twenty six in the latter year defoe's secret connection with the government became known and a great howl of indignation rose against him in the public print destroying in an hour the popularity which he had gained by a lifetime of intrigue and labor he fled from his home to london where he died obscurely in seventeen thirty one while hiding from real or imaginary enemies works of defoe at the head of the list stands robinson crusoe seventeen nineteen seventeen twenty one of the few books in any literature which has held its popularity undiminished for nearly two centuries the story is based upon the experiences of alexander selkirk or selcraig who had been marooned in the island of juan fernandez off the coast of chile and who had lived there in solitude for five years on his return to england in seventeen o nine selkirk's experiences became known and steele published an account of them in the englishman without however attracting any wide attention that defoe used selkirk's story is practically certain but with his usual duplicity he claimed to have written crusoe in seventeen o eight a year before selkirk's return however that may be the story itself is real enough to have come straight from a sailor's logbook defoe as shown in his journal of the plague year and his memoirs of a cavalier had the art of describing things he had never seen with the accuracy of an eye-witness robinson crusoe the charm of the story is its intense reality in the succession of thoughts feelings incidents which every reader recognizes to be absolutely true to life at first glance it would seem that one man on a desert island could not possibly furnish the material for a long story but as we read we realize with amazement that every slightest thought and action the saving of the cargo of the shipwrecked vessel the preparation for defense against imaginary foes the intense agitation over the discovery of a footprint in the sand is a record of what the reader himself would do and feel if he were alone in such a place defoe's long and varied experience now stood him in good stead in fact he was the only man of letters in his time who might have been thrown on a desert island without finding himself at a loss what to do note mentos life of defoe end of note and he puts himself so perfectly in his hero's place that he repeats his blunders as well as his triumphs thus what reader ever followed defoe's hero through weary feverish months of building a huge boat which was too big to be launched by one man without recalling some boy who spent many stormy days in shed or cellar building a boat or dog-house 
and who when the thing was painted and finished found it a foot wider than the door and had to knock it to pieces this absolute naturalness characterizes the whole story it is a study of the human will also of patience fortitude and the indomitable saxon spirit overcoming all obstacles and it was this element which made rousseau recommend robinson crusoe as a better treatise on education than anything which aristotle or the moderns had ever written and this suggests the most significant thing about defoe's masterpiece namely that the hero represents the whole of human society doing with his own hands all the things which by the division of labor and the demands of modern civilization are now done by many different workers he is therefore the type of the whole civilized race of men in the remaining works of defoe more than two hundred in number there is an astonishing variety but all are marked by the same simple narrative style and the same intense realism the best known of these are the journal of the plague year in which the horrors of a frightful plague are minutely recorded the memoirs of a cavalier so realistic that chatham quoted it as history in parliament and several picaresque novels like captain singleton colonel jack moll flanders and roxana the last work is by some critics given a very high place in realistic fiction but like the other three and like defoe's minor narratives of jack shepherd and cartouche it is a disagreeable study of vice ending with a forced and unnatural repentance End of section thirty nine section forty of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine continued samuel richardson sixteen eighty nine seventeen sixty one to richardson belongs the credit of writing the first modern novel he was the son of a london joiner who for economy's sake resided in some unknown town in derbyshire where samuel was born in sixteen eighty nine the boy received very little education but he had a natural talent for writing letters and even as a boy we find him frequently employed by working girls to write their love letters for them this early experience together with his fondness for the society of his dearest ladies rather than of men gave him that intimate knowledge of the hearts of sentimental and uneducated women which is manifest in all his works moreover he was a keen observer of manners and his surprisingly accurate descriptions often compel us to listen even when he is most tedious at seventeen years of age he went to london and learned the printer's trade which he followed to the end of his life when fifty years of age he had a small reputation as a writer of elegant epistles and this reputation led certain publishers to approach him with a proposal that he write a series of familiar letters which could be used as models by people unused to writing richardson gladly accepted the proposal and had the happy inspiration to make these letters tell the connected story of a girl's life defoe had told an adventure story of human life on a desert island but richardson would tell the story of a girl's inner life in the midst of english neighbors that sounds simple enough now but it marked an epoch in the history of literature like every other great and simple discovery it makes us wonder why someone had not thought of it before richardson's novels the result of richardson's inspiration was pamela or virtue rewarded an endless series of letters note these were not what the booksellers expected they wanted a handy letter writer something like a book of etiquette and it was published in seventeen forty one a few months after pamela End of note telling of the trials tribulations and the final happy marriage of a too sweet young maiden published in four volumes extending over the years seventeen forty 1740 and seventeen forty one 
its chief fame lies in the fact that it is our first novel in the modern sense aside from this important fact and viewed solely as a novel it is sentimental grandiloquent and wearisome its success at the time was enormous and richardson began another series of letters he could tell a story in no other way which occupied his leisure hours for the next six years the result was clarissa or the history of a young lady published in eight volumes in seventeen forty seven to seventeen forty eight this was another and somewhat better sentimental novel and it was received with immense enthusiasm of all richardson's heroines clarissa is the most human in her doubts and scruples of conscience and especially in her bitter grief and humiliation she is a real woman in marked contrast with the mechanical hero loveless who simply illustrates the author's inability to portray a man's character the dramatic element in this novel is strong and is increased by means of the letters which enable the reader to keep close to the characters of the story and to see life from their different viewpoints macaulay who was deeply impressed by clarissa is said to have made the remark that were the novel lost he could restore almost the whole of it from memory richardson now turned from his middle-class heroines and in five or six years completed another series of letters in which he attempted to tell the story of a man and an aristocrat the result was sir charles grandison seventeen fifty four a novel in seven volumes whose hero was intended to be a model of aristocratic manners and virtues for the middle-class people who largely constituted the novelist's readers for richardson who began in pamela with the purpose of teaching his hearers how to write ended with the deliberate purpose of teaching them how to live and in most of his work his chief object was in his own words to inculcate virtue and good deportment his novels therefore suffer as much from his purpose as from his own limitations notwithstanding his tedious moralizing and his other defects richardson in these three books gave something entirely new to the literary world and the world appreciated the gift this was the story of human life told from within and depending for its interest not on incident or adventure but on its truth to human nature reading his work is on the whole like examining the antiquated model of a stern-wheel steamer it is interesting for its undeveloped possibilities rather than for its achievement henry fielding seventeen o seven seventeen fifty four life judged by his ability alone fielding was the greatest of this new group of novel writers and one of the most artistic that our literature has produced he was born in east Stour, dorsetshire in seventeen o seven in contrast with richardson he was well educated having spent several years at the famous eton school and taken a degree in letters at the university of leyden in seventeen twenty eight moreover he had a deeper knowledge of life gained from his own varied and sometimes riotous experience for several years after returning from leyden he gained a precarious living by writing plays farces and buffoneries for the stage in seventeen thirty five he married an admirable woman of whom we have glimpses in two of his characters amelia and sophia western and lived extravagantly on her little fortune at east Stour. having used up all his money he returned to london and studied law gaining his living by occasional plays and by newspaper work for ten years or more little is definitely known of him save that he published his first novel joseph andrews in seventeen forty two and that he was made justice of the peace for westminster in seventeen forty eight the remaining years of his life in which his best novels were written were not given to literature but rather to his duties as magistrate and especially to breaking up the gangs of thieves and cutthroats 
which infested the streets of london after nightfall he died in lisbon whither he had gone for his health in seventeen fifty four and lies buried there in the english cemetery the pathetic account of his last journey together with an inkling of the generosity and kind-heartedness of the man notwithstanding the scandals and irregularities of his life are found in his last work the journal of a voyage to lisbon fielding's work fielding's first novel joseph andrews seventeen forty two was inspired by the success of pamela and began as a burlesque of the false sentimentality and the conventional virtues of richardson's heroine he took for his hero the alleged brother of pamela who was exposed to the same kind of temptations but who instead of being rewarded for his virtue was unceremoniously turned out of doors by his mistress there the burlesque ends the hero takes to the open road and fielding forgets all about pamela in telling the adventures of joseph and his companion parson adams unlike richardson who has no humor who minces words and moralizes and dotes on the sentimental woes of his heroines fielding is direct vigorous hilarious and coarse to the point of vulgarity he is full of animal spirits and he tells the story of a vagabond life not for the sake of moralizing like richardson or for emphasizing a forced repentance like defoe but simply because it interests him and his only concern is to laugh men out of their follies so his story though it abounds in unpleasant incidents generally leaves the reader with the strong impression of reality fielding's later novels are jonathan wilde the story of a rogue which suggests defoe's narrative the history of tom jones a foundling seventeen forty nine his best work and amelia seventeen fifty one the story of a good wife in contrast with an unworthy husband his strength in all these works is in the vigorous but coarse figures like those of jan steen's pictures which fill most of his pages his weakness is in lack of taste and in barrenness of imagination or invention which leads him to repeat his plots and incidents with slight variations in all his work sincerity is perhaps the most marked characteristic fielding likes virile men just as they are good and bad but detests shams of every sort his satire has none of swift's bitterness but is subtle as that of chaucer and good-natured as that of steele he never moralizes though some of his powerfully drawn scenes suggest a deeper moral lesson than anything in defoe or richardson he never judges even the worst of his characters without remembering his own frailty and tempering justice with mercy on the whole though much of his work is perhaps in bad taste and is too coarse for pleasant or profitable reading fielding must be regarded as an artist a very great artist in realistic fiction and the advanced student who reads him will probably concur in the judgment of a modern critic that by giving us genuine pictures of men and women of his own age without moralizing over their vices and virtues he became the real founder of the modern novel smollett and stern tobias smollett seventeen twenty one seventeen seventy one apparently tried to carry on fielding's work but he lacked fielding's genius as well as his humor and inherent kindness and so crowded his pages with the horrors and brutalities which are sometimes mistaken for realism smollett was a physician of eccentric manners and ferocious instincts who developed his unnatural peculiarities by going as a surgeon on a battleship where he seems to have picked up all the evils of the navy and of the medical profession to use later in his novels smollett's novels his three best-known works are roderick random seventeen forty eight a series of adventures related by the hero peregrine pickle seventeen fifty one in which he reflects with brutal directness the worst of his experiences at sea 
and humphrey clinker seventeen seventy one his last work recounting the mild adventures of a welsh family in a journey through england and scotland this last alone can be generally read without arousing the reader's profound disgust without any particular ability he models his novels on don quixote and the result is simply a series of coarse adventures which are characteristic of the picaresque novel of his age were it not for the fact that he unconsciously imitates johnson's every man in his humor he would hardly be named among our writers of fiction but in seizing upon some grotesque habit or peculiarity and making a character out of it such as commodore trunnion in peregrine pickle matthew bramble in humphrey clinker and bowling in roderick random he laid the foundation for that exaggeration in portraying human eccentricities which finds a climax in dickens caricatures lawrence stern seventeen thirteen seventeen sixty eight has been compared to a little bronze satyr of antiquity in whose hollow body exquisite odors were stored that is true so far as the satyr is concerned for a more weazened unlovely personality would be hard to find the only question in the comparison is in regard to the character of the odors and that is a matter of taste in his work he is the reverse of smollett the latter being given over to coarse vulgarities which are often mistaken for realism the former to whims and vagaries and sentimental tears which frequently only disguise a sneer at human grief and pity stern's work the two books by which sterne is remembered are tristram shandy and a sentimental journey through france and italy these are termed novels for the simple reason that we know not what else to call them the former was begun in his own words with no real idea of how it was to turn out its nine volumes published at intervals from seventeen sixty to seventeen sixty seven proceed in the most aimless way recording the experiences of the eccentric shandy family and the book was never finished its strength lies chiefly in its brilliant style the most remarkable of the age and in its odd characters like uncle toby and corporal trim which with all their eccentricities are so humanized by the author's genius that they belong among the great creations of our literature the sentimental journey is a curious combination of fiction sketches of travel miscellaneous essays on odd subjects all marked by the same brilliancy of style and all stamped with sterne's false attitudes towards everything in life many of his best passages were either adapted or taken bodily from burton rabelais and a score of other writers so that in reading sterne one is never quite sure how much is his own work though the mark of his grotesque genius is on every page the first novelists and their work with the publication of goldsmith's vicar of wakefield in seventeen sixty six the first series of english novels came to a suitable close of this work with its abundance of homely sentiment clustering about the family life as the most sacred of anglo-saxon institutions we have already spoken if we accept robinson crusoe as an adventure story the vicar of wakefield is the only novel of the period which can be freely recommended to all readers as giving an excellent idea of the new literary type which was perhaps more remarkable for its promise than for its achievement in the short space of twenty-five years there suddenly appeared and flourished a new form of literature which influenced all europe for nearly a century and which still furnishes the largest part of our literary enjoyment each successive novelist brought some new element to the work as when fielding supplied animal vigor and humor to richardson's analysis of a human heart and stern added brilliancy and goldsmith emphasized purity and the honest domestic sentiments which are still the greatest ruling force among men 
so these early workers were like men engaged in carving a perfect cameo from the reverse side one works the profile another the eyes a third the mouth and the fine lines of character and not till the work is finished and the cameo turned do we see the complete human face and read its meaning such in a parable is the story of the english novel summary of the eighteenth century the period we are studying is included between the english revolution of sixteen eighty eight and the beginning of the french revolution of seventeen eighty nine historically the period begins in a remarkable way by the adoption of the bill of rights in sixteen eighty nine this famous bill was the third and final step in the establishment of constitutional government the first step being the great charter twelve fifteen and the second the petition of right sixteen twenty eight the modern form of cabinet government was established in the reign of george i seventeen fourteen seventeen twenty seven the foreign prestige of england was strengthened by the victories of marlborough on the continent in the war of the spanish succession and the bounds of empire were enormously increased by clive in india by cook in australia and the islands of the pacific and by english victories over the french in canada and the mississippi valley during the seven years or french and indian wars politically the country was divided into whigs and tories the former seeking greater liberty for the people the latter upholding the king against popular government the continued strife between these two political parties had a direct and generally a harmful influence on literature as many of the great writers were used by the whig or tory party to advance its own interests and to satirize its enemies notwithstanding this perpetual strife of parties the age is remarkable for the rapid social development which soon expressed itself in literature clubs and coffee-houses multiplied and the social life of these clubs resulted in better manners in a general feeling of toleration and especially in a kind of superficial elegance which showed itself in most of the prose and poetry of the period on the other hand the moral standard of the nation was very low bands of rowdies infested the city streets after nightfall bribery and corruption were the rule in politics and drunkenness was frightfully prevalent among all classes swift's degraded race of yahoos is a reflection of the degradation to be seen in multitudes of london saloons this low standard of morals emphasizes the importance of the great methodist revival under whitefield and wesley which began in the second quarter of the eighteenth century the literature of the century is remarkably complex but we may classify it all under three general heads the reign of so-called classicism the revival of romantic poetry and the beginning of the modern novel the first half of the century especially is an age of prose owing largely to the fact that the practical and social interests of the age demanded expression modern newspapers like the chronicle post and times and literary magazines like the tatler and spectator which began in this age greatly influenced the development of a serviceable prose style the poetry of the first half of the century as typified in pope was polished unimaginative formal and the closed couplet was in general use supplanting all other forms of verse both prose and poetry were too frequently satiric and satire does not tend to produce a high type of literature these tendencies in poetry were modified in the latter part of the century by the revival of romantic poetry in our study we have noted one the augustan or classic age the meaning of classicism the life and work of alexander pope the greatest poet of the age of jonathan swift the satirist of joseph addison the essayist of richard steele who was the original genius of the tatler and the spectator of samuel johnson who for nearly half a century was the dictator of english letters of james boswell who gave us the immortal life of johnson 
of edmund burke the greatest of english orators and of edward gibbon the historian famous for his decline and fall of the roman empire two the revival of romantic poetry the meaning of romanticism the life and work of thomas gray of oliver goldsmith famous as poet dramatist and novelist of william cowper of robert burns the greatest of scottish poets of william blake the mystic and the minor poets of the early romantic movement james thompson william collins george crabb james mcpherson author of the ossian poems thomas chatterton the boy who originated the rowley papers and thomas percy whose work for literature was to collect the old ballads which he called the relics of ancient english poetry and to translate the stories of norse mythology in his northern antiquities three the first english novelists the meaning and history of the modern novel the life and work of daniel defoe author of robinson crusoe who is hardly to be called a novelist but whom we placed among the pioneers and the novels of richardson fielding smollett stern and goldsmith suggestive questions one describe briefly the social development of the eighteenth century what effect did this have on literature what accounts for the prevalence of prose what influence did the first newspapers exert on life and literature how do the readers of this age compare with those of the age of elizabeth two how do you explain the fact that satire was largely used in both prose and poetry name the principal satires of the age what is the chief object of satire of literature how do the two objects conflict three what is the meaning of the term classicism as applied to the literature of this age did the classicism of johnson for instance have any relation to classic literature in its true sense why is this period called the augustan age why was shakespeare not regarded by this age as a classical writer four pope in what respect is pope a unique writer tell briefly the story of his life what are his principal works how does he reflect the critical spirit of his age what are the chief characteristics of his poetry what do you find to copy in his style what is lacking in his poetry compare his subjects with those of burns of tennyson or milton for instance how would chaucer or burns tell the story of the rape of the lock what similarity do you find between pope's poetry and addison's prose five swift what is the general character of swift's work name his chief satires what is there to copy in his style does he ever strive for ornament or effect in writing compare swift's gulliver's travels with defoe's robinson crusoe in style purpose of writing and interest what resemblances do you find in these two contemporary writers can you explain the continued popularity of gulliver's travels six addison and steele what great work did addison and steele do for literature make a brief comparison between these two men having in mind their purpose humor knowledge of life and human sympathy as shown for instance in number one twelve and number two of the spectator essays compare their humor with that of swift how is their work a preparation for the novel seven johnson for what is dr johnson famous in literature can you explain his great influence compare his style with that of swift or defoe what are the remarkable elements in boswell's life of johnson write a description of an imaginary meeting of johnson goldsmith and boswell in a coffee-house eight burke for what is burke remarkable what great objects influenced him in the three periods of his life why has he been called a romantic poet who speaks in prose compare his use of imagery with that of other writers of the period what is there to copy and what is there to avoid in his style can you trace the influence of burke's american speeches on later english politics 
what similarities do you find between burke and milton as revealed in their prose works nine gibbon for what is gibbon worthy to be remembered why does he mark an epoch in historical writing what is meant by the scientific method of writing history compare gibbon's style with that of johnson contrast it with that of swift and also with that of some modern historian parkman for example ten what is meant by the term romanticism what are its chief characteristics how does it differ from classicism illustrate the meaning from the work of gray cowper or burns can you explain the prevalence of melancholy in romanticism eleven gray what are the chief works of gray can you explain the continued popularity of his elegy what romantic elements are found in his poetry what resemblances and what differences do you find in the works of gray and of goldsmith twelve goldsmith tell the story of goldsmith's life what are his chief works show from the deserted village the romantic and the so-called classic elements in his work what great work did he do for the early novel in the vicar of wakefield can you explain the popularity of she stoops to conquer name some of goldsmith's characters who have found a permanent place in our literature what personal reminiscences have you noted in the traveller the deserted village and she stoops to conquer thirteen cowper describe cowper's the task how does it show the romantic spirit give passages from john gilpin to illustrate cowper's humour fourteen burns tell the story of burns life some one has said the measure of a man's sin is the difference between what he is and what he might be comment upon this with reference to burns what is the general character of his poetry why is he called the poet of common men what subjects does he choose for his poetry compare him in this respect with pope what elements in the poet's character are revealed in such poems as to a mouse and to a mountain daisy how do burns and gray regard nature what poems show his sympathy with the french revolution and with democracy read the cotter's saturday night and explain its enduring interest can you explain the secret of burns great popularity fifteen blake what are the characteristics of blake's poetry can you explain why blake though the greatest poetic genius of the age is so little appreciated sixteen percy in what respect did percy's relics influence the romantic movement what are the defects in his collection of ballads can you explain why such a crude poem as chevy chase should be popular with an age that delighted in pope's essay on man seventeen macpherson what is meant by macpherson's ocean can you account for the remarkable success of the oceanic forgeries eighteen chatterton tell the story of chatterton and the rowley poems read chatterton's bristow tragedy and compare it in style and interest with the old ballads like the battle of otterburn or the hunting of the cheviot all in manley's english poetry nineteen the first novelists what is meant by the modern novel how does it differ from the early romance and from the adventure story what are some of the precursors of the novel what was the purpose of stories modeled after don quixote what is the significance of pamela what elements did fielding add to the novel what good work did goldsmith's vicar of wakefield accomplish compare goldsmith in this respect with steele and addison chronology end of seventeenth and the eighteenth century history sixteen eighty nine william and mary seventeen hundred question mark beginning of london clubs seventeen o two anne death seventeen fourteen seventeen o four battle of blenheim seventeen o seven union of england and scotland seventeen fourteen george the first death seventeen twenty seven
1721 cabinet government walpole first prime minister 1727 george ii death 1760 1738 rise of methodism 1740 war of austrian succession 1746 jacobite rebellion 1750 1757 conquest of india 1756 war with france 1759 wolf at quebec 1760 george the third death 1820 1765 stamp act 1773 boston tea party 1774 howard's prison reforms 1775 american revolution 1776 declaration of independence 1783 treaty of paris 1786 trial of warren hastings 1789 1799 french revolution 1793 war with france literature 1683 1719 defoe's early writings bill of rights toleration act 1695 press made free war of spanish succession 1702 first daily newspaper 1704 addison's the campaign swift's tale of a tub 1709 the tatler johnson born died 1784 1710 1713 swift in london journal to stella 1711 the spectator 1712 pope's rape of the lock 1719 robinson crusoe 1726 gulliver's travels 1726 1730 thompson's the seasons 1732 1734 essay on man 1740 richardson's pamela 1742 fielding's joseph andrews 1749 fielding's tom jones 1750 1752 johnson's the rambler 1751 gray's elegy 1755 johnson's dictionary 1760 1767 sterne's tristram shandy 1764 johnson's literary club 1765 percy's relics 1766 goldsmith's vicar of wakefield 1770 goldsmith's deserted village 1771 beginning of great newspapers 1774 1775 burke's american speeches 1776 1788 gibbons rome 1779 cowper's only hymns 1779 81 johnson's lives of the poets 1783 blake's poetical sketches 1785 cowper's the task the london times 1786 burns first poems the kilmarnock burns burke's warren hastings 1790 burke's french revolution 1791 boswell's life of johnson end of section forty end of chapter nine